Lake Champlain, located in the northeastern part of the United States. Bordered by New York State on the west, Vermont on the east, and the province of Quebec on the north, it is the sixth largest freshwater lake in the country, 125 miles long and 15 miles at its widest point. Lake Champlain's crystal clear surface covers 500 square miles and can drop to depths of over 400 feet in some spots. Portions of the shoreline are occupied by seasonal homes, but the main residents are concentrated in several towns and cities, like Plattsburgh on the New York side and Burlington across the lake in Vermont. Lake Champlain is a go-to destination for relaxation and vacations, but there is one drawback. Some believe the lake harbors a monster. The monster of Lake Champlain has been called one of the continent's great unsolved mysteries of science. A giant prehistoric beast lurking in the depths of the lake. Hundreds of eyewitnesses over four centuries claim to have seen it. Don't know for sure what it is, uh, but something came up along the side of the boat. I don't know what I saw, but it was eerie and it was unsettling. Something caught the corner of my eye, but it definitely uh, something was there. We turned around, we were looking at it, and it was a black neck and head. This is totally, I, I, this is probably the closest rendition of anything I've ever seen that has been put together that fills the bill of what I saw. Their testimonials all describe a creature weighing several tons and measuring over 30 feet. There are three large humps protruding from this calm lake surface, motionless. And they just very slowly sunk beneath the surface of the lake. What I saw was sort of greenish brown, brownish green and um, it didn't have any features other than this sort of roundish, pulse-looking thing. What we saw was a black neck and head of something. These are the size of the, of the fins that came out of the water. This size, that size, four, jobbies that were purple, and this was all this pink color. Journalists, explorers, scientists, residents, and tourists, more than 300 in all, are convinced they've seen a monster in the lake. The first person to claim they'd seen it was none other than explorer Samuel de Champlain. Lake Champlain features dozens of bays and over 70 islands. According to witnesses, the lake monster has some favorite spots in this immense body of water. Bulwaga Bay, at the southern end of the lake, is where sightings occur most frequently. This small bay is only about 30 feet deep and considered an angler's paradise. With its school of brown and rainbow trout, carp, and catfish, Bulwaga Bay is a hotspot for everyone hoping to lure a trophy fish. Although people claim to have spotted something monstrous lurking beneath the surface of the bay, the big one always seems to get away. Ah. 
After first revealing itself to Samuel de Champlain in 1609, the mysterious creature made several later appearances in Bulwaga Bay, including one in 1887 to a group of railway workers. After that, for whatever reason, the lake monster seems to have shied away and remained hidden for over 100 years. In the 20th century, the monster finally rose to fame. In 1930, with the upgrading of Highway 22 that runs alongside the bay, an increase in travelers coming into the area led to an increase in reported sightings. That's when the creature earned its official name, Champ, and it soon became a star attraction from Port Henry to Burlington. In the 1990s, there was a flurry of Champ sightings. Uh, there several books on Champ came out, a lot of newspaper stories, some of which I was writing, and people came forward all the time with Champ sighting. Uh, this board was put in back in the 1980s. Uh, it was originally designed to be sort of an evolving board that would catalog everyone who's ever seen Champ. It was in early December. We were coming back uh, from the Lake George area along the lake shore um, below Port Henry to South Port Henry on a Sunday afternoon. And so I was looking out the window and all of a sudden I see this post-like thing. So I turn to Bob and I say, what's that post-like thing out there? And when I look back, it was gone. There was no post, but there were concentric circles of water, you know, like big round ripples going out. And posts just don't disappear like that. We couldn't see anything. The lake was flat, nothing was there, but it wasn't my imagination. I believe in Champ. Because Route 22 runs straight through Port Henry, the village is considered to be Champ's official residence. At first glance, Port Henry has all the traditional charm of small town America. A courthouse, a Liberty Bell, fine dining in heritage buildings, two well-attended churches, but the town also worships two local VIPs, Johnny Padres, a Major League Baseball legend, and Champ. Why should you come to Port Henry? Well, I mean, all you need to do is look at the area. It looks like a European village on a hillside. It's uh, just absolutely spectacular. And of course, we have our world famous um, resident, a champ who, you know, uh, to this day, even myself, you know, you can't look out on the Lake Champlain without looking for something out there that may be different. The city is so attached to its monster that authorities have declared the lake a protected sanctuary for champ. A formal public decree forbids anyone to harm, abuse, harass, or otherwise attempt to destroy it. It can be approached, observed, and even caressed, but under no circumstances can anyone hurt it. Port Henry has about 1,200 full-time residents. During the summer season, that number grows tenfold. Its two marinas are huge draws for boaters, anglers, and because of champ, lovers of strange phenomena. But if anyone were to declare a national sport in the village of Port Henry, the search for the lake monster would be the unanimous choice, hands down. Residents with waterfront properties have a front row seat for observing their lake 
We bought our summer house from an old merchant marine who had traveled uh, the world on freighters. And one of my first days here, I'll never forget this, we were out fishing in a, in a very small boat off uh, Port Henry here. And he looked at me and he said, Ron, there are some very strange things in this lake. That sentence hung in my mind and, and really uh, mesmerized me and stayed with me from the ages of 13 to uh, my late 20s when that sentence came back into play. And I'll tell you what happened to that. In 1981, there were a flurry of champ sightings in the Port Henry area. And I was working as a newspaper reporter for the Albany and New York Times Union, which is the major daily paper in Albany, New York, the capital city. And my editors uh, were interested in seeing all these news reports about Champ being sighted just two hours north of Albany, this major lake, Lake Champlain. And uh, I wrote a six-part series chronicling the flurry of activity uh, in the Port Henry area. It was a good story. My paper played it big. Um, so at the time when I was writing the piece and when the pieces were published, I didn't care whether there was a monster in the lake or not. But two years later, almost to the day, my perspective changed dramatically. July 4th weekend, 1983. I am fishing with my girlfriend. Lake Champlain is like glass. And my girlfriend is in the front of the boat. She says, Ron, what's that? I don't pay a whole lot of attention. We're being quiet, we're fishing, trying to catch fish. She says again, Ron, what's that? And she points, and I look to where she's pointing. We watched for probably 10 seconds, three large humps that looked like large tires sticking maybe a foot, foot and a half out of the water, motionless. After seeing these three large humps out of the water, uh, looking back, I have to conclude, uh, although I haven't seen anything since and I've been on the lake most every day in the last uh, five or six years in the summer, you have to come to the conclusion that there's something unexplained in the lake. And it could very well be, in my mind, uh, a plesiosaur. It could be something that uh, escapes all of our imagination and may be there yet to be discovered. People who live along the shore of Lake Champlain aren't the only ones interested in Champ. Scientists are also getting caught up in the mystery. I think he looks like a big fish, kind of like a dinosaur from prehistoric times. We are now on the other side of Lake Champlain, in the town of Burlington, Vermont. If Port Henry offers the best places to spot Champ, then Burlington qualifies as the nerve center for local marine research. The scientific body known as the Leahy Center for Lake Champlain organized a gathering to help unravel the mystery of its local monster. My name is Linda Bowden. I am the science education specialist. And we have an exciting program today. It's called CHAMP, the unsolved mystery. Dozens of theories have been put forward about the monster. Then, in 1977, a photo appears that grabs the attention of the scientific community. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence that we have is the photograph that Sandra Mancy took in 1977. So the photograph looks a lot like what you were saying, a plesiosaur. When she first took that photograph, she wasn't certain what she saw, but it was something that was very dangerous in her mind. She needed to get the kids out of the lake. They were swimming there when this creature came up behind. That is the only photograph, the only clear photograph of Champ that's out there right now. The Mansi photograph displays the unmistakable profile of a monster. Champ appears to be a species of aquatic dinosaur known as a plesiosaurus.
She took the photo to the New York Times, and the New York Times took it to an analyst who determined that it wasn't a fraud, it wasn't a fake, and the New York Times ran the photo. Uh, it's since been reproduced in numerous magazines, uh, newspapers, it's been in specials about Champ. Uh, the, the Mansi photo is regarded as the most definitive proof that Champ exists. Some in the scientific community needed proof the image wasn't an optical illusion before they would accept Champ as the real thing. In-depth analysis determined the photo was not a fraud and concluded the creature in the photo actually was Champ. I have seen the Mansi photograph, and I've read some of the uh, various analyses of that photograph, and it's a, um, a little bit of a mystery still, uh, which is part of what makes it all exciting. It shows what looks to be uh, a, a creature's head. It just looks like one of those toy dinosaurs from when I was a small child. Uh, and so if uh, you imagine the head of a brontosaurus or something like that, gosh, this would look a lot like that. When I first saw the Sandra Mansi photograph, I thought she'd taken a photo of a plesiosaur. I thought that this was absolute proof that Champ exists. Uh, the Mansi photograph was reported to be taken in the area of Missisquoi Bay, in the northern part of the lake. However, uh, in the area that uh, Sandra Mansi reported taking the photograph, the water of the lake is uh, about 14, 15 feet deep. It's not very deep. So a large creature would have a very hard time, quite a challenge, hiding in that shallow depth of water. Even though Lake Champlain reaches depths of up to 410 feet, skeptical scientists believe it's highly unlikely such a massive animal could thrive here, let alone reproduce in such a restricted habitat. In order to maintain a population over a long time, there probably would need to be 40 or 50 champ-like creatures here to breed uh, and to withstand the uh, rigors of time. Uh, a very small population of, of one couple or one pair uh, would really not be sufficient. Another argument that challenges Champ's existence concerns the chronological order in which dinosaur species became extinct. The plesiosaur hypothesis is an interesting idea. Uh, it has a lot of appeal to, to some people, and they can imagine what it might look like. Uh, however, uh, the environment here has not been very good uh, for a persistent population of plesiosaurs. Uh, for one thing, uh, the rest of the world uh, saw the extinction of the plesiosaurs about 65 million years ago. So when we talk about the history of Lake Champlain, it's 10,000 years. So we have to remember that's, that the plesiosaurs went extinct 65,000 thousand years ago. Lake Champlain was formed after the disappearance of Ice Age glaciers and the vast sea around it. This dramatic transformation of the geography in the region had a major impact. Salt water gave way to fresh water. Desalination made it highly unlikely that any sea creature could survive in such an environment. Science hasn't explained all of life's mysteries. Champ may be one of them. Let's take a look at some of the crypto or cryptids, as they're called, animals that have been out there. One of the first ones was Kraken. As you may know, the giant sea serpent, right? Now, the giant squid, as they're called, have eyes the size of dinner plates. They have a very shark beak. And it wasn't until 2006 that Japanese scientists actually got on film this giant squid. So what was a cryptid became, yes, in fact, this animal is real. And it was in water over 2,900 feet. So what do you think now about Champ? 
Could he be a cryptid? Could he be something out in the water we're not so sure? So I think we're constantly finding things that are in our seas, in our lakes, in our oceans that we didn't know were there before. And I think people are, are relating to that information saying, oh, well, if folks are discovering new things, then why cannot they discover a lake monster too? Seeing Champ, I, I just think that there are things in my worldview that I believe we don't know everything. There's room for things um, that we don't know. And so I find myself gazing out at the lake at times if I'm reading or walking. I know people that say they don't believe in Champ and they, you can catch them looking, crossing the ferry. At one time, geologically, when the sea was connected to the lake, why wouldn't it be possible for sea creatures that we haven't, we don't know about to have come in to Lake Champlain and then adapted their existence in Lake Champlain? We don't know. And, and it's interesting not to know. Somebody said it was a duck later on. You know, like, ah, you saw a duck, don't worry about it. It looked like a post, except it certainly wasn't. My buddy was saying, hey, um, it's ducks, something swimming. All like, right, ducks. Dude, no, um, ducks don't oh, swim wait. at night, and uh, they quack. Objects floating or moving across a lake surface can sometimes fool the eye. Because our eyes, brains, and emotional states aren't always on the same wavelength, we can't be sure that what we're seeing is actually there. Spotted from a distance, a duck or a tree trunk can have multiple interpretations. In a split second, we might think we see something that, frankly, doesn't exist. So turn around, what do you see? A rabbit. A rabbit, okay, turn back around. I'm gonna change the photo. All right, now turn, what do you see? Tell me. A duck, a rabbit? Okay. Ah, okay. So by turning the rabbit, our perceptions changed. It's still a rabbit. You're a little confused as to what it could possibly be. It's fun to watch how folks sit there and change their mind during the presentation and are beginning to believe that people may be seeing something out on the lake. Not sure exactly what it could be, but they do believe that there is something happening out on the lake. Uh, I was uh, working on the ferry boat Champlain coming back from Port Kent, New York on a hot August afternoon and uh, we were sitting up on the deck. And I was reading and happened to look up and came upon the sighting of these two fins that came out of the water. The folks that were with me sitting on the benches on the boat all ran up, pointed out, and asked what it is. And I was a crew member. And as a crew member, I had to, after the second one came out of the water, I had to explain that it definitely is champ. 
everybody ran to the rail, and now everyone's jumping up down. Kids are picking up popcorn, throwing it in, feeding champ. Everybody is quite excited. And this was my first physical sighting, and I do believe that there is something here that is part of the, the lake's heritage. Three ferry boats service Lake Champlain between New York State and Vermont. Dozens of daily crossings with hundreds of passengers means thousands of pairs of eyes scanning the horizon at any time. I came to work for Lake Champlain Ferries in uh, 1980, in the spring of 1980. And I kayak a lot too out here. I house sit around here a lot. So um, plus my career here, I, um, I'm here a lot. And uh, uh, it's a pretty amazing place. Um, not a bad office. I do recall one spring where we had some high water and some wind, and I was actually working on deck, and uh, the captain I was working with, Cindy, um, we both saw this long chunk of something with a little thing coming up like this, and it was clearly a log. I said, you, you, just wait, somebody's gonna come and ask us. And sure enough, maybe the following week, a woman came aboard with an eight, eight by 10 size photo of this chunk of log and she asked us did you see this at all and we said yes it's over there on that on that shoreline <laughs> and it's a big chunk so that's probably for me the closest you know that i can say there was something out there that looked like champ um or looked like something unusual What they do see is a wonderful, uh, fertile uh, grounds for speculation. Uh, there are many uh, large animals in Lake Champlain, but large means five or six feet long, two meters perhaps. Uh, uh, we have uh, the sturgeon, the lake sturgeon. It's quite an impressive thing. There's a channel catfish that can be very large, uh, and uh, there also could be two or three uh, otters swimming uh, in succession, one behind another, behind another, playing and looking like it's a single animal. Now, there are some other possible explanations for what people have seen that look dynamic, they look alive, and that can happen when uh, the wake of a boat, a wave train that uh, is called the bow wake from the prow of a boat that is moving uh, uh, through the lake, that is a chain of our train of waves that will pass right across the lake and be, be seen by people uh, far removed from the boat itself. The public is split into opposite camps where Champ is concerned. There are the believers and those who believe the lake monster is a far-fetched legend. The fact remains, more than 300 eyewitnesses are convinced about what they saw. Could all 300 individuals be mistaken? For the answer, it might be helpful to trace the monster's movements beginning in Bulwaga Bay. Jim Carroll is one of the few people who claim to have had two close encounters with Champ, experiences that he believes have taught him something about the creature's habits. Oh, I've been on the lake for 40 years. Uh, we're out there all the time. Um, we go out a lot. We take a lot of people out. And uh, you're always looking. Every time you're on the water, you're always looking for Champ. At some point, somebody's going to capture something on film, and we're going to have proof. 
Jim's boat has all the equipment necessary to locate Champ, and he's set his compass heading for the specific locations where it's likely to be found. Passing tourists are a regular part of his expeditions. According to Jim, Champ only appears when the lake surface is relatively calm and the winds blowing from light to gentle. Jim bases his measurements on the Beaufort wind force scale. The scale allows him to calculate the strength of the wind by correlating its effects both on water and land. The Beaufort scale grades wind force from zero to 10. The higher the number, the lower the chances of spotting Champ. Most sightings occur when the wind strength falls between zero and three. Today, Jim and his passengers get lucky. Conditions are ideal. So here we are, and uh, this is where we started. And when I was a kid, we were water skiing right here in the bay, just, uh, just off. Oh, that way? Yeah. It's time to get going at a water skier, we check, make sure he's okay. And then I turned around and looked off to the side of the boat. Make sure, you, know, you look ahead, make sure you're not gonna run anything over. And right next to the boat, there was something that was alive. It's like that wide. Uh, this big long hump that was as long as the boat. It was this little 16 foot ski boat. It was a little disconcerting. Whatever it was was alive and just kind of disappeared into the water up front and uh, and off to the back of the boat. So my buddy was driving. <clears throat> Did he, uh, it, we grabbed the wheel, spun around, went to the, the other yeah, yeah, I'm like get in the boat. It's like, but it's my turn to ski. Get in the boat. You can see where the farmland, the, the right hand yeah. one of those two, that's Arnold Bay. Were you afraid? You thought? Yeah, I mean, didn't know what it was. Um, what, you know, how often do you see a fish that's bigger than the boat you're in? You know, it's kind of like right out of Jaws. Did you no see it again? When, I yeah. did, as an adult. Um, we were actually, it was in this bay. Twice? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my kids were little, and uh, we were out to dinner. And it was a nice night, and uh, we were just putting back because we had babysitters. And it was over here, on, uh, actually in this shore. We were just putting along, enjoying the warm weather and the flat calm. And uh, my wife says, what's that now? And because uh, I'd read up on Champ uh, a bit and gotten over the, that initial fear from way too long ago, yeah. instead of turning the wheel and, and pulling away, we spun the wheel and we headed over towards it. And whatever it was, was, it was moving away from us. We moved after it um, and we watched it and it disappeared. And all of a sudden, it's on the other side of the boat. And uh, the couple that was with us, uh, fella, was saying, um, well, you know, it's not champ. Like, yes, it is. Um, whatever it is, is alive. It was swimming and it moved away from us over here and it came back. Now it's on this side of the boat. Conditions are ideal. The chance for a monster meetup is as good as it gets. But Jim won't get his third encounter with it today. Champ is nowhere in sight. So with all of that, in the evenings, on a summer night, when you're looking out over the lake and you see something you're not quite sure about, think about the fact that you might be seeing Champ. Anytime you have a conversation about Champ, you'll find people turn around and want to talk to you about this amazing creature. So uh, it's a very popular program that we do here at ECHO. From the time Samuel de Champlain first spotted Champ, the monster has never strayed very far from Port Henry. It's why Champ occupies a central place in the region's cultural heritage and tourism. Everyone has a story to tell, a monster to celebrate. Today, the storytelling is happening here in Port Henry's old library at a gathering of Champ's newest fans. 
This book is called Champ and Me by the Maple Tree by Ed Shankman. In the valley of Vermont, near a lake called Champlain, if you cut through the woods on the old country lane, you'll come to a meadow with one maple tree that's as high as a person can see. Do you believe the champ is out there? Yes. Think he is? Yeah. Have you ever seen him? No. no. Have you known anybody who thought they saw him? Yes. Tell us a babysitter's husband. He thought he saw a champ because they have a nice view of the lake. And the story of Champ goes back not just into the 70s or the 80s, but you know, you talk to um, people that were, um, that grew up with my dad, you know, that fished on Lake Champlain, you know, they've seen something out there that, uh, that was different. Um, they, you know, even during the ice fishing season, they would see these shadows, you know, as they're sitting in their fish shanties and you, you know, you're looking down your hole and you're fishing, you, all of a sudden you just see this dark shadow, you know, fill the holes up and then bang, you can see down in there again. So I absolutely, I believe that um, definitely something out there. And, and again, you know, while you're visiting Port Henry, you know, I'm certain that, you know, most areas in the village of Port Henry, you can see Lake Champlain. So you're gonna be looking east and um, you're gonna be looking for our most famous resident, Champ. Port Henry is the hub for several annual Champ celebrations that draw scores of tourists to the area. Since the early 1990s, the first Saturday of August is declared Champ Day with activities for the whole family. Amidst street parades and sidewalk sales, Champ is honored as the local hero of the day. Later in the year on Labor Day, organizers invite Champ to be their guest of honor at the annual celebration. Alongside explorer Samuel de Champlain, Champ gets a chance to stroll down Main Street before submerging back into his watery home. This once feared monster has become one of the main attractions for visitors to the region. Campgrounds, festivals, and commercial promotions all feature Champ in some tasty way or another. Celebrity sea monster now appears more often out of water than it does in the lake itself. Champ's star power has been a windfall for the tourism industry. We started Champ's Trading Post because we found there was not really anyone out there who was doing Champ paraphernalia for sale for souvenirs. So we developed our own line that includes t-shirts and hats and shot glasses and mugs that have Champ on them. They've done really, really well for us. Um, we find that it's really helped our business having the name Champs and drawing people in. People come in, they say, oh, we've looked everywhere for Champ things, we're having a hard time finding them. Um, they're thrilled to be able to find what they're looking for, to take something home for their kids, or just a souvenir of, of being here looking for Champ. After you've been spending all this time looking for Champ, there's a couple interesting historical spots you may be interested in. One of them is at Crown Point, which is just to the south of here. Uh, and there's an old ruins of the old fort there, and you can just wander through. Something a little more structured is Fort Ticonderoga, which is a historic site. They do reenactments of the different battles that, that Fort Ticonderoga was involved in. The kind of people that come into our store are people that are know about the Champ legend, are intrigued by it, have their own stories. Some have a lot of questions. They've never heard of him. Um, and it's just fun to hear the different stories and to, you know, talk to people about what they think Champ is. And at the end of the day, sit out with a glass of wine on the deck and then just enjoy the, the sun uh, on the lake and maybe you'll, in those last moments, you'll see Champ off in the distance. 
Fort Henry is a magnificent place. It is among the most beautiful places on earth. Lake Champlain is an incredible lake to behold and to enjoy. And I think the residents of Port Henry are incredibly lucky to have such beauty and such majesty in their backyard. If you come to Vermont near a lake called Champlain and you cut through the woods on the old country lane, there's a chance you will see my friend Champ and me playing happy and free by the old maple tree. And that's the end. When it comes to monsters, eyewitnesses, skeptics, researchers, and explorers all seem to agree. Champ is a full citizen of the communities around Lake Champlain. Now, Champ is part of who we are, Champy in New York, and also up in Quebec, very revered as uh, an iconic uh, sort of symbol for our area. There are potato chips also that are called Champ. There's different car washes, Champ. And of course, there are many different kinds of monuments. The lake monster for um, the baseball team here is Champ. Lake Champlain is a lake that is powerful, dynamic, full of surprises. There's something mysterious and wild about Lake Champlain. Every single time I'm near the lake, whether I'm fishing, whether I'm sailing, uh, my fishing tackle box, I carry a camera with me. I may be the next person who claims to have the definitive picture of the Lake Champlain monster. Well, you're always looking for that, um, for Champ. And uh, chances are that um, when you're here visiting, you're gonna spot him. I'm one of the people who actually saw Champ. I'm not afraid of it. <laughs> if you truly believe or you want to, just chant, just chip, and then just chip, you know, just, you know, you never know. I'm serious. I'm, I'm not ready to close the book on Champ ever. I do believe everything I've seen, everything I've heard, and especially with this personal sighting of something physical that I could actually say, yes, that's why, you know, I'm here sharing this to let you know that it works, champ's good, and more, we need more champs, <laughs> certainly. So many people have such a great affection to the idea of a Champlain creature. And so I think the best habitat for champ uh, where Champ really lives is in the hearts and the minds of many, many people. Welcome to Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Its 4,500 residents think of their little mountain village as a paradise. John Denver thought so too. He immortalized the region in his famous song, Take Me Home Country Roads. Point Pleasant is located where the Ohio and Kanawha rivers meet in a quiet setting that blends touches of history with still affordable family homes. Today, Point Pleasant is as peaceful a place as its name suggests. But it wasn't always so. 
In the 1960s, a series of frightening events occur. At first bizarre and disturbing, then suddenly tragic. The story begins when several villagers have close encounters with a semi-human flying creature. Eyewitness accounts put Point Pleasant on the map. It becomes one of the most visited spots in the United States for seekers of paranormal phenomena. It's been over 45 years since the first sighting, but it remains one of the great unexplained mysteries. We kept the kids in at night. We didn't allow them out. Six to seven feet tall, gray in color, a large wingspan, 10 to 12 foot wingspan. Seven foot tall with a wingspan of 50 feet with glowing red eyes. Six feet tall with the big wings and the red eyes, because everybody says there's red eyes. Like, you can't miss that detail. Those eyes, that's, that's what Hera did. It was just a red. A lot of people says it glowed. I don't know about that. I just know it was a red like you never seen red. Uh, one person thought it was a helicopter. It was so big. Another local guy here, he thought it was an airplane. Other people described it as looking like a giant moth because it didn't have a head like a human. It was more in and it had moth-like wings and so forth. Other people described it as, uh, you know, being very quick as far as flight. You know, it would it would appear and then it would be it would disappear. My papa always said it was just a bird because he used to go out there all the time. But he said he saw something out there, so I'll believe him. It had a heel like we do, a heel and a long foot out with claw, uh, toes and claws on the end of the toes. It had a neck like we do that holds a round type head. It had a nose like we do, and I saw two holes that you breathe out of. In the mid-1960s, 100 people claimed to have seen the half-man, half-moth, with huge glowing red eyes flying around the area. For two years, more and more eyewitnesses come forward. Peaceful Point Pleasant is never the same again. Well, Point, Point Pleasant, as it is today, is a very simple, it's a, it's a simple place. And back in the 60s, it was even more so. You had hardworking Americans, farmers, and people like that. They really didn't take stock into monsters or UFOs or anything like that. They worked long days and hard days and there were down-to-earth practical people that went to church on Sundays. This isn't, this isn't something that they plotted or planned. It's just something that happened and they couldn't explain it. And even today, all these years later, it's still a mystery. Some of those, those uh, Mothman witnesses, uh, um, you know, became very, uh, you know, they su suffered nervous breakdowns and, and uh, mental issues and things. And totally different people as to what they were beforehand. Over the years, you know, they just, they never could come up with a, a viable answer as to what, what happened or what they experienced. Now, a lot of people in the town getting thought messages, so they said, uh, saying that something was going to happen. Some people were even having physical effects, like their eyes getting swelled up and red and so forth for no particular reason. In fact, I think a lot of people that had up-close encounters of this Mothman creature. Uh, said that their eyes got inflamed and what have you. It could have been like a, an angel of death or an omen. Like the personification of an omen of coming to warn people that something terrible is going to happen. Fear begins to grip the people of Point Pleasant. Some believe the creature is an omen, a premonition of catastrophe about to fall on their village and its inhabitants. And soon enough, that's precisely what happens. When the bridge fell, it actually tilted to the right, came back up, and then just went down. That is, instead of a collapse like sometimes we see on TV or uh, in pictures, the eyewitnesses said that it actually went to the side, then came back up and went down. It's late evening, November 15th, 1966. 
What happens on this night gives birth to one of the most horrific legends ever recorded in American history. There were two young couples uh, up near the North Power Plant in the TNT area. That was a vacated, desolate area at one time during World War II. That was a uh, ammunition factory. That's how it got us named the TNT area. They were driving around up there about 11 o'clock at night. Um, they came across what they thought was a man standing in the road in, in front of their car. They noticed something standing next to the plant, uh, which looked like a very large man in dark clothing or uh, a cloak and what have you, and they noticed these two glaring red eyes. And the Scarberry was one of the witnesses said that uh, they were about uh, size of baseballs, about two inches apart, and then she noticed wings flapped around on its back and she said they reminded her of angel, angel's wings. As the car got closer, she said the wings came out and this creature or, or being or whatever ran into one of the, the uh, vacant power plant buildings there called the North Power Plant. And kind of spooked the ladies and they picked up speed and they noticed as they looked behind them uh, that this thing was actually chasing them. That's when this thing came over top of their car. Uh, they were doing 90, 95 miles an hour in, the, in this car coming back to town. And intermittently, this thing would come over the car, then disappear, come over the car. And it chased them back into the city limits, and then it disappeared. And they were thoroughly terrified, but they got home uh, and told their story. And during this time that started the, the ball rolling on the whole Mothman legend, as it is, one of America's creepiest urban legends. Immediately after the, the two couples saw this thing in the TNT area, they went to the sheriff's department. Now, the sheriff's deputy saw how upset they were. They knew that they, you know, they weren't making this story up. Uh, they sat down and wrote down everything that they encountered. And then the police went up there to investigate. They started running regular patrols. This was on the 15th of November. On the 16th of November, uh, Marcella Bennett and her family actually encountered this thing at, at a house up in the TNT area. Marcella's corroborating evidence makes the community take notice, including her family. I asked my sister what it looked like one day. I said, Marcella, I need to ask you, what does it really look like? Because I was there time after time, but never really got to experience it. And she said, you know what, Carolyn? She said, we were just getting out of the car. We were talking back and forth over top of the car, not paying a lot of attention, not thinking about anything. And I heard something like, shh, shh, shh. And she said, we turned around and looked and it was trying to come through the doors, which they drove trucks and tanks and stuff through them doors, and said that they it wasn't the doors weren't big enough. And I said, well, then how did he get out? And she said he went sideways and came through and flew over top of him. She said, when I looked up and seen them big red eyes, he said, we were out of there. I can't tell you what the rest of it looked like. You can go right down the line through November. You know, there was all kinds of sightings after that. Then the police department started taking it a little more serious. The official record of so many sightings marks a turning point. The residents of Point Pleasant start taking the reports seriously. Many believe something is living near the abandoned munitions plant, something beyond curious, a creature that might actually harm them, and it has a name. The name Mothman was actually given by a, a news reporter during some of those press conferences in the early days of the Mothman uh, sightings. People always ask, well, how did that, how the name Mothman come about? At the time, in the mid-60s, as a little kid, I used to watch the Batman TV series, but there was also the Batman comic book series. There was a character in that comic book series called Mothman. And because people were describing moth-like wings and red eyes, that name Mothman stuck. Now, a lot of local people still to this day refer to it as the Big Bird. Whenever the Mothman was first spotted, uh, it practically covered all of our news areas. It was, it was in the newspaper, big write-ups, and uh, it was on the radio, TV, uh, word of mouth, everybody was talking about it. I mean, it was, it was different. It was a piece of something that they had never experienced before. You kept your kids in at night, your little ones, you didn't let them out. There's Newspaper account came out of uh, a big, large, six-foot bird with a large wings, wingspan and red eyes were chasing cars in the TNT area, which caused a mass uh, amount of people to head for the TNT area to see this this massive bird that was out there chasing cars. That's how the story grew. Even some of the news channels picked up on it. That's when everybody came to started coming to Point Pleasant, including John Keel. 
the late author John Keel uh, really spent a lot of time on this whole thing. He's, he stayed there for several months, I believe, or years, doing research for his work. Uh, he took it as premonitions. And I believe that it was 2002 they came out with a film uh, well, based on his book, The Mothman Prophecies. John Keel specialized in writing about extraterrestrials and UFOs. The Mothman Prophecies was published in 1975 and chronicles Keel's extensive research and theories about the Mothman. He believed it was a creature from outer space. When the Mothman was here, things that happened, and it was a little different, and people were scared because, you know, you're a little scared of what you don't know. And they didn't communicate with him, didn't know if he was going to hurt anybody. He didn't hurt anybody, but uh, there was an animal killed, but it could have been a coyote. But you didn't know what was going to come up. And people was a little nervous. During the Mothman sightings here in Point Pleasant, they would not let some of the children out for recess because the people didn't know what this thing was. They thought if it was a big bird, it could come down and pick up a little kid and take off with them. So that's how, how paranoid some people were when all this was going on. It was called The Bird, where a, a location where a lot of people were, were seeing the Mothman, uh, known as The Bird, uh, was the North Paraplan, and it was generally known as The Birdhouse. I think it was tore down in the early 90s. It was uh, deemed a health hazard, and, and they did tear it down, which is kind of a shame, because it would be like a great landmark. We went up there looking for the Mothman all the time. Don't know what we'd have done if we'd have found him. Uh, I wish I could have said, yes, this is what it looks like. But, you know, it was something to do, and you're curious. And, uh, and we went, but we had carloads. He wasn't going to come out when we were there. Everybody wants a glimpse of the Mothman, be it human, animal, or alien. There are as many local skeptics as believers, but the urban legend grows. And so do the questions. Where did it come from? And why did it choose the munitions depot? What happens next raises even more serious questions. The people of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, are used to seeing peculiar apparitions, but nothing like the mysterious and fearsome Mothman. Soon after it appears, other weird things begin to happen. During this whole period, 1966 to 67, uh, people were reporting strange lights in the sky, so we have the UFO connection. That makes it even more stranger than it already is. There was a lot of UFOs in the area at that time. Did I believe it? No. But we would be, my sister and I would be going to Buffalo and we'd get, come out and look and there'd be beautiful lights in the sky and we'd say, well, the UFOs are out tonight. But did I believe it? No, I didn't. And one landed in my brother's backyard. So then I believed it. He said it was the brightest thing he ever seen. And it couldn't, you couldn't even look at it, it was so bright. And it just picked back up and soared back off just like it come in, no sound. UFOs, Mothman, and strange lights in the night skies over Point Pleasant begin to worry the villagers. Then, events take a bizarre twist. This time, it happens in broad daylight. As soon as people started reporting these uh, uh, Mothman and UFO sightings, people started seeing uh, these so-called men in black. Just like in the movies, you know, the black hats and sunglasses, and they were going around intimidating people, saying, don't talk about this. They didn't know if they were government agents, if they were law enforcement people, or if they were from another realm. We would see the men in black standing around on the street in the daytime. I mean, if I go to the bank and get change up the street, they'd be standing there, staring, just staring. Some of those witnesses started saying, hey, you know, these people are coming to our door and asking us questions and, and telling us not to talk about it to anybody. Uh, the local newspaper reporter, Mary Heyer, said they would come into her office and she didn't know them. They didn't identify themselves, but they were adamant about her not reporting these details to the newspaper and to the media. So that started to worry a few people because they didn't know what agenda these, these so-called men in black had, but they weren't real happy about people discussing the UFOs or the Mothman sightings. The men in black hang around Point Pleasant throughout the whole time these strange phenomena are occurring. But who are they? And why are they here? 
To this day, those questions have never been answered. My brother wanted to come up to the TNT area to look for the Mothman, because we'd heard about it that day in school. And we weren't within, I'd say, probably two, three blocks when my brother looked and saw something beside the car on my side of the driver's window. So my brother slammed on the brakes, and when he did, the car kind of turned sideways a little bit in the road. And when we did, that thing just stopped and jumped right onto the hood of the car. And it's just like we were just frozen in time for about, I don't know, five seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes, I don't know. While it looked through the windshield at us, and we looked at it through the windshield. After it left, my brother turned the car around and we went straight to the Sheriff's Department in Point Pleasant. The very next day, soldiers cordoned off all public access to the former munitions plant. So we went back up to the TNT area. There was two or three people standing over there on the side there talking to other military personnel, but they were in suits. So one of them come over here to the car, and he just put his hands on the wind. He said, you were told to leave, now leave. Residents are now really concerned about what's going on. They realize these military operations mean serious business. What are they looking for? Once again, more unanswered questions as the mystery deepens. One of John Keel's books, he talks about, it may have been actually more of a multiple prophecies. He talks about window areas which are like um, parts, like areas of, of uh, land or some, like in various places around the earth and the globe, that uh, they're more akin to like paranormal activity. And I think that's what uh, Point Pleasant is. There were several people, including John Keel, that was receiving uh, prophecies for future events, some of which came through, some of which didn't. Uh, there were strange phone calls and some of these calls involved voices that were giving these prophecies. The Mothman is something that scared a lot of people. I believe personally that there was such a creature. I don't think, however, it was a UFO. I don't think it was an occupant from a, another planet. That is partially the belief system for a lot of people. Small town in the 60s, they didn't have all the lights and the glitz and the technology, so they simply would have enjoyed these stories, and it would have excited them and scared them. And fear can generate all kinds of responses. The people of this once quiet village turned to local Native American history and legends for an explanation as to what may be happening. Some people felt that that went back years ago to an to a Indian curse that w uh, was bestowed on the town of Point Pleasant by an Indian Chief Cornstalk. Uh, what happened was is Chief Cornstalk and his son both were murdered over a land dispute over, you know, with some settlers. And the story went that up, up on his dying breath, he cursed the town of Point Pleasant for the next 200 years. Uh, some people do believe that. But Chief Cornstalk did exist, uh, his son, and they, and they both were killed. Now, whether or not he did put that curse on the town of Point Pleasant remains a mystery. Of course, everything that happened, if we had uh, a wreck happen, it was either Cornstalk or Mothman. Uh, if we had uh, a FAR or a power outage, or uh, mainly their power outages and stuff like that, they contributed to, to Mothman. As far as the Mothman goes, I, I believe it's just something we haven't discovered yet, or something that did exist and may have died. It's something natural, is what the bottom line is. And the supernatural element is as romantic and uh, as elegant as it is, will be very, very hard to prove.
While the residents of Point Pleasant try to connect all the dots and make sense of the strange things going on around them, no one could have predicted what happens next. In November of 1966, you know, the Mothman sightings began, the UFO activity, the men in black. Uh, all this was, was going on at the same time. Apparently, people were getting thought patterns, like something bad is going to happen, something really terrible. People were having dreams, um, seeing presents floating in the water and so forth. Really weird, bizarre dreams, but they didn't take it to heart, really, because they just figured it was just a weird dream. In December of 1967, uh, December 15th, the Silver Bridge, which was a 40-year-old bridge right here in downtown Point Pleasant, collapsed uh, on a Friday evening during rush hour, uh, killed 46 people. This event brought more attention to Point Pleasant, besides the, the Mothman sightings. Some people felt that it was just a very odd timing to the Mothman activity and the UFO activity. They felt that there may have been some sort of a connection. Obviously, the, it was a terrible tragedy. The, the, we knew most of the people that went down on the bridge. In fact, the, the parents of the mayor at that time was, was, were on the bridge. Uh, a little girl that was in my classroom was on the bridge with, with her parents. Some people claimed to have seen a large bird flying back and forth across the river days before that bridge fell. There were other people that reported seeing men dressed in black clothing climbing up and down on that bridge. Now, whether those sightings or reports can be validated is, is another story, but people did come forth and say that. A controlled group conscious, if you will, is something where a group of people can see something, or one person will see it, and then another person will see it, and then it will go down in that group, in that community, whatever it is. It's definitely real. We saw it, I saw it too. Then it becomes hysteria. So in a small community, sure, I saw it, you saw it, it's real. And they're gonna stick by that. It almost becomes a religious experience. Now another aspect to that is the belief system. Once you believe in something so, so strongly, it will stay with you over years and years and years. And even something that didn't really occur or something that was mis misunderstood will still be just as strong 40, 50 years later. Because they're gonna remember it exactly the way they experienced it. They saw something that was very frightening to them and fascinating. A lot of those people were not real thrilled about seeing it. Uh, they didn't, uh, some of them would not even go out at nighttime. You know, they, they became reclusive. Um, they felt that something was always looking over their shoulder or in their area of, of where they were, very paranoid. They didn't really like the attention they were getting from, from the townspeople because people th thought they were crazy or, you know, loony or whatever. And that's why a lot of those witnesses, even to this day, will not discuss it. They won't admit that it didn't happen. They, they will tell me it did happen. They saw it with their own eyes, but that's, that's all they want to say about it. Jeff has always been interested in strange phenomena. His obsession with the mysterious Mothman took root in childhood. He's spent years accumulating enough evidence to fill his Mothman museum. That makes him a leading authority on the creature and where it's likely to be seen. Okay, hey, these, these structures have been here for well over 60 years. They're relatively untouched. As you can see all the detail on these, you, you can actually walk underneath, you know, look underneath, and, and they're very eerie, especially at night, especially when the fog starts setting out here. They're basically the same as they were back during World War II. When the war ended, uh, they just left everything. They never tore anything down. And uh, during the Mothman sightings, you know, a lot of people thought that whatever this thing was, was either roosting or staying in this, this general area up here in the TNT area.
The collapse of the Silver Bridge a year after the first Mothman sightings shocks the residents of Point Pleasant. Engineers offer plausible explanations about why the 40-year-old bridge collapsed, but some people aren't so sure. They link the tragedy to unnatural causes. Some people say that the uh, Mothman had something to do with the Silver Bridge falling. My answer to that is the Silver Bridge fell because of a cracked eye bar. There was one eye bar that was uh, prior to the uh, Ohio uh, Tower on the bridge. It cracked, and that is what caused the bridge to fall. Now, the 13th pin, strangely enough, that held the bridge together, and scientifically speaking, or engineer from an engineer's point of view, when they did test on the bridge after the accident, after it collapsed, they said that it was no wonder it didn't collapse earlier. It was old bridge, it was out of date, it needed to be changing. That's a matter of record. The fact that it was the 13th pin that went added, you know, another supernatural element to it. And it's great for the urban legend. It, it adds to it, makes it, it adds to the mystery. There are other people who say that the uh, Mothman was a, sort of a, an omen of the bridge falling. I don't know where they got that idea. Well, in the 60s, they had very bad, very poor, or it was just neglect in their uh, disposal of some of the byproducts of that uh, TNT factory. So it got into the aquifer. And the aquifer is the main water source, and they would have used it. And even though they may have had purification processes, which I'm sure got, gets out a lot of the uh, pollutants and carcinogens and what have you, some of it may have gotten through and may have caused a hallucinogenic effect. If, possibly, if the ground was saturated with some kind of unknown pollutant that caused a hallucinogenic effect, and you saw a true life cryptozoological cryptid creature, you're going to start seeing all kinds of different things. And what looked, what is going to be totally natural to uh, a biologist or an ornithologist or something like that, even with their amazement to people like you and me who's never seen these things before, it's going to be frightening. I believe there's a lot of things that I just don't understand. And with that, I take it with a grain of salt, but I don't discredit what people are saying they're seeing. Many theories have been presented to justify or debunk the existence of Mothman. One comes from an unofficial branch of science known as cryptozoology. What do I think it is? I think uh, it does belong, the, the creature itself belong in the realm of cryptozoology. I think that uh, crypto meaning it's something different, something out of place, not natural to be found. And every once in a while, nature spits out something that shouldn't be there. And I think this is one such case. There were uh, several eyewitness descriptions and accounts of some of these Mothman sightings that pointed towards the possibility of, of it being maybe a thunderbird or a prehistoric bird. Um, I had actually talked to one lady who saw it in, in daylight in the TNT area, and she described it as a prehistoric bird. Some people felt that, that the Mothman may have actually been a thunderbird or something extinct. It's like any other crypto-type monster, like the Bigfoot legend, or in, or in the state of Florida, the skunk ape, or something like that. Many people say, yes, absolutely exist. We've seen it. We don't know what it is. Why aren't we catching these things? You'd think they would leave some kind of evidence. Uh, you know, well, what about a body? You know, anthropologists and, and archaeologists, they need these things, empirical data, to, to believe in it. And without that, it's going to remain in the realm of folklore or, or myth. Another theory suggests Mothman might be the result of some radical mutation of a life form exposed to radiation. I wish there were a lot more supernatural creatures that would make life more interesting. But I think in this case, it was just something that existed, uh, does exist still, and occasionally came out of there. He could have been mutated. It could have been mutated by that particular area, which was the grounds are poisoned. They still are even to this day. The EPA is trying to clean that up. 
sometimes. Uh, like if you remember the old B monster movies, you know, they, they got radiation or something that gets gigantic and what have you. In those cases, radiation just kills, pure and simple. But every once in a while, it alters DNA, it alters growth patterns and so forth in plants and in people. You know, after uh, uh, World War II, you can find all kinds of different effects from radiation for those who survived. Uh, frightening effects that make humans look non-human. So this could happen in nature too. And I think that's also a credible possibility. I think after the Silver Bridge collapsed, the, the whole town was in a state of shock. I mean, they'd never seen a disaster, you know, on that, that scale of, you know, 46 people, uh, you know, perishing in a, in a bridge disaster. It was the worst, worst bridge disaster in, in American history, still, still is. But I think it, it you know, it, it's, there was so much going on. People had a hard time um, absorbing all of the, the activity and the attention. But, you know, people still, you know, we're in the TNT area, you know, years and years, even to this day. It's, it's really difficult to, to say that, that that book will ever be closed on, you know, what this Mothman or large bird actually was. That's the whole beauty of the, the Mothman stories. People are always looking for answers. Mothman will probably always be around. I think the idea of this creature will always be around. It may indeed be something from the realms of complete supernatural, and it may blow our socks off someday by presenting itself. Maybe it is an alien life. I can't discount that. My personal belief system is that it's just a misidentification. It's a great story, though. I think if, if 20 years ago, somebody would have came forth and said, this is what it was, here's the proof, here's the documentation, book closed. You know, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. We just don't know until it dies in the woods and the forestry department picks it up and it becomes news and it goes in the classroom school books. It's gonna remain the monster that we know it is today. Whether Mothman is fact or fiction, horror or hoax, the creature towers over the daily life of Point Pleasant. Instead of ridicule, the Mothman book and movie has brought fame and fortune to this little village on the Ohio River. The movie changed things by putting us out there, putting Point Pleasant on the map. A big part of the climatic part of the movie is the bridge falling. Then now everyone wants to ask you about the Mothman, and, and anywhere you travel, if you're from Point Pleasant, always the first thing someone asks you about is, is the Mothman. But people had a hard time seeing that movie in town. Uh, it, it's hard to watch that bridge fall, and it's hard to watch the, the Mothman parts about it. When that movie came out, the floodgates just opened, and you know the, the town was just overrun. You know, people coming here. You know, they wanted to go where the, uh, you know, the, this actually happened. I knew right then that it, it, would, it would change the town. But you know, uh, whether you believe in the Mothman or not, it's done a lot for Point Pleasant. Mothman Festival is the single biggest attractor from throughout the country and the world than we have in, here in Point Pleasant. You can't drive down Main Street because it's full of people. And they come from all over the world. Now, we've had people from China, Australia, Japan, England. They come from every place to come to this Mothman Festival. After the movie, The Mothman Prophecies came out, Jeff and Carolyn Harris came up with this idea that we should have a festival each year to bring all of the people that would be interested in something like that. 
I was talking to Carolyn one day and I said, you know, um, we ought to try maybe a Mothman festival or a convention, something like that. That's, this was in November of 2002. This was just months after the movie came out. And we, we decided to give it a go. We decided like in October of that year to have it. So we only had a month. We didn't advertise. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't really get it out to the media much, but we had four or 500 people just show up by word of mouth. And that was the catalyst for what now is the 12th year of the Mothman Festival. And we have speakers at the State Theater. We have entertainment on the Riverfront Park. And sometimes we have karaoke contests. We've had a weightlifting contest there. Uh, we have a lot of vendors out here, a lot of souvenirs. We have a witness panel that we pay to sit there and answer questions. People want to ask them in direct, for sure. You know, what did you see? They want to ask them. They like that uh, out there. And we try to add something every year. We have a 5K race. We have a big uh, Mothman beauty pageant. From the Mothman, glowing red eyes, 10 feet tall, baby, that's no lie. In the Mothman Festival pageant, we have moth wear, which is where contestants wear jeans, and then they are to incorporate the color green into their outfit. And we get wings sometimes. Contestants have wings. Sometimes uh, contestants just they want to show their personality so they're real stylish and upbeat. Um, they also compete in evening gown and onstage question. And what the judges usually try to look for is just a natural girl who is just wanting to really promote the Mothman Festival pageant and not just be after the crown and sash, but actually to promote the festival. I won in 2010. It was really actually quite surprising because I'd never done a pageant before, so I was really nervous. And I'd always liked the Mothman and all that stuff. So I thought, hey, why not? Let's try it. And then lo and behold, I won, which was absolutely insane. But the uh, pageant was actually really cool. Like we got to learn the Mothman dance, which was really fun. Mothman, he's not from Japan. He's genuine American. <laughs> People come from all over the world, literally, and that's why we call it the world's only Mothman Museum. But we have props, we have very rare archives, we had a lot of John Keel memorabilia, we carry merchandise, and we started, uh, you know, just opening two or three days a week. Now we're open seven days a week. And we're knowledgeable, people want to come in and, and ask us questions. We show documentaries and things like that. I really enjoy being a tour guide. I meet people from all over the world. It's really cool. We can take them up to the T area, let them see everything as far as different sites of Point Pleasant, um, tell them different stories um, that I've been told throughout the years about the Mothman and all the different encounters with him. Stories I've actually heard from the eyewitnesses themselves. Then we get out and we check out the igloos and look at the first uh, where the first sighting was. Um, it's really, really entertaining. I enjoy it. Igloos are storage bunkers made of cement where ammunition was stored during the Second World War. Although there were never really actually any Mothman sightings reported in, in the igloos, it's still a fascinating part, a fascinating part of the history of the TNT area. Uh, as you can see, the four foot thick walls. A lot of paranormal groups frequent the, the igloos because they, you know, they want to try to catch the orbs and different pictures and, and things like that. So it's, uh, it's a vital part of the Mothman history and uh, I think it needs to be researched a, a little more. It's been nearly 50 years since the Mothman and the Men in Black spooked a little village in West Virginia. But how things have changed. From the town's worst nightmare, Mothman has become a dream come true and a symbol of pride and joy for everyone. The Mothman is, is, is such a creature that uh, it's hard not to look at. He's, he sort of takes after Loch Ness Monster and, and Bigfoot, but 
I think ours is a little more exciting because he, uh, he just shows up everywhere and there's so much, uh, so many stories behind him that it's changed our town. One of the main attractions here in downtown Point Pleasant is the world famous uh, Mothman statue. That statue came about uh, two or three years after the movie was released and a local artist who works in stainless steel uh, named Bob Roach created that uh, statue after sitting down with some of the, Mo the Mothman witnesses and uh, eyewitnesses and things like that. And he came, his, came to his own you know, version of that Mothman. But people all over the world come to get their picture taken with that uh, that statue. We unveiled the statue in a, in a ceremony that attracted national news. Uh, CBS Sunday morning came and it shocked all of us. We thought it would just be a few people from around town and maybe a couple local stations, but uh, we immediately went on national TV when, when the statue was unveiled. It's a really uh, nice piece of, of artwork, you know, and a lot of detail and things like that, but it's, it's a nice centerpiece to, to to let people know, you know, what all happened here. Mothman is a big part of the history of Point Pleasant. There's other pieces of history, too. We have a Mothman tram that run, goes around through town. You can board it out here, and it'll take you to all of our entities that we have, uh, River Museum, behind the flood wall for the murals, uh, the Silver Bridge Memorial, uh, anything, anything we have, the Fort Randolph, going on, but the tram will take you to show you that we have more than just Mothman. We have the history and the mystery. Families come from all over. Groups come, bus tours come, governors come and get their picture taken with the Mothman. It's not a true uh, visit to Point Pleasant unless you get your picture taken with the Mothman. I don't know how to explain it, but they're here every day, just about all year long. I don't care if it's raining, snowing, or what, there's people getting their picture taken with the Mothman. It's, it's really been a phenomenon that uh, you would never think about, but it's here. I can't say for sure whether it's real or not. Uh, I just know that there's a tremendous amount of evidence uh, that it is. We invite everybody to come here. We we'll take them and, and show them all, all the different uh, attractions that are geared, geared towards it and we'll let them make up their mind for themselves. The Mothman is a big thing with a lot of people. Uh, it's kind of put Point Pleasant on the map in most recent years. And people come just because they've heard of it and it's sort of mysterious and they want to see what it looks like. Uh, we have the statue in, in town, and um, so that's something that's visible to them, you know. We have so much American history here. We have a lot of agricultural history. Obviously, we have paranormal history. Plus, we just like having visitors. It, we, we really enjoy the people that come. Uh, everyone in town gets out and speaks to everyone, and. Uh, they get out on Main Street and sit in their rocking chairs and, and talk to all the folks that come in. It's, it's a perfect way to get people to come to Point Pleasant and, and then have a look around and they may find something else they didn't know about. The people with the Mothman, um, they're never going to stop coming, we know that, and, and uh, we, we enjoy all the different ones that come. Welcome to Tennessee in the southeastern United States. Day or night, the state is home to all genres of music. From bluegrass to country, delta blues to rock and roll. The legendary clubs along Beale Street in Memphis were among the first to feature Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash. Nashville, the state capital, is also the capital of country music recording but something that's frequently overlooked by visitors who come for the entertainment are the mountains and fertile plains of rural Tennessee. 
About 40 miles or 60 kilometers north of Nashville lies this quaint little town of Adams. Population 628. Visitors can expect to be treated to legendary southern hospitality. But this peaceful setting is better known for something sinister. 200 years ago, apparitions and horrific events tormented a local family. Even today, some descendants feel they're still being shadowed by an evil spirit. Beginning 196 years ago, bells were tormented by what they called a spirit, the neighbors called a witch, some people called a demon. In the legend, John Bell was poisoned by the spirit who calls herself Kate. Many things have been seen inside the local caves. Folks believe that spirits, orbs, even ghosts sometimes can be heard talking. I have friends who have gone out there. They can feel the presence of the witch. And when I went downstairs, I saw a ghost behind the stove. I'm convinced something very, very bad was in that house. And some believe it was trapped between two worlds, between the Earth and the spirit world. What it was, we really don't know. The, the spirit was asked, where, where, where did you come from? Who are you and where did you come from? And he said, I am a spirit and I have been disturbed. I've been around for millions of years. It had to be something very powerful to do what it did, but it never, it never led on to what it actually was. They didn't understand why it was coming after our family. And when it was asked about why it was coming after the Bell family, or after John, and the spirit said he just needs killing. People in the area continue to claim to see sightings of the Bell Witch. They claim to hear her in the middle of the night. They hear the sounds of um, things in the house or maybe in the woods, and they will attribute that to the Bell Witch. But it's, it's supposed to be an etern eternal spirit. And, uh, you know, most people look at it as some kind of witch riding around a broom, but that's not how it's ever described by the bells. They always describe it as a voice or an entity, and they claim they could see from time to time. Some, it, it exhibited itself as either an animal or a, a human being. Now, the neighbors always heard the voices, but many of them said they did not see the form that it sometimes manifested according to legend. Well, you have your believers and you have your non-believers, and with that comes ex the extent of in uh, both areas. You have some that are very hardcore. Um, I, I don't believe in ghosts. I will not ever admit that there's a bell witch. And then you have the people who really believe that she existed and that she tormented this bell family for years and that she continues to torment people in Robertson County as they visit Adams. Supposedly one of the sons of, uh, of John Bell had served with Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson came back and had a confrontation with this entity. Andrew Jackson had a pleasant encounter with it, but it abused people that he was with. And he, he was quoted as saying he'd rather face the whole of the British Army as to face the Bell Witch again. Well, now, it showed up as several different things in the story. It was a, like a, a, a turkey, a wolf, a little girl in a swing that when Betsy tried to talk to her, she disappeared. The details of these hauntings aren't for the faint of heart. For nearly two centuries, the Bell Witch has fascinated and puzzled followers of the paranormal. Fear is constantly being evoked by fireside storytellers, books, a play, and even a Hollywood movie. According to history, John Bell's death was attributed to a spirit, and it's the only person I know in, in the history of the United States whose death was attributed to, to a spirit. The legend of the Bell Witch has been passed down from generation to generation in the town of Adams, Tennessee. And it's gone viral. It has all the elements of a classic ghost story an old haunted house, furniture moving on its own, eerie sounds and strange voices that come from nowhere. 
it's more than enough to convince anyone their home is possessed. Let me tell you a little bit about the Bell House. In 1817, according to legend, the Bells began to experience a phenomenon they called the spirit. The neighbors called it a witch, and it began to torment the family, in particular, John Bell and his youngest daughter, Betsy. John Bell had a lot of health problems, and they blamed that on the spirit. He lost his shoes at times. They just literally fly off his feet, and they'd have to retrieve them. Betsy was slapped, uh, had her covers removed at various times, had her hair tied in knots around the bedpost. Betsy seemed to be targeted more than the other children and would have experiences during the night of being slapped, being pinched, her hair being torn. She would scream out in the middle of the night and the family would see to her. When visitors would come and spend the night to see if these stories were actually true, they too would experience this. John at times could not talk. It was as if he had a stick crossways of his mouth and then he would get better. This went on for about two or three years until finally on the 19th of December, 1820, John Bell became extremely sick. Uh, the doctor was called and it was determined that he had been poisoned. They were beginning to wonder who did this. Did uh, somebody in the family poison John Bell? Uh, did Betsy do this? Did a neighbor do this? And all of a sudden they hear the voice that they've heard so often in the house and the spirit, as they call it, said, I killed old John. I fixed his medicine last night, gave him a big dose of it, and he'll never get up out of that bed. And John Bell died. I've come to the conclusion that something definitely did happen. I've, I've seen a letter, a handwritten letter from 1820, the year John died, of two boys uh, riding home to their mother on their trip to see the angel at the Bell House. And they were able to get to the house in the first night they said nothing happened, and the second night it happened, and said, Mom, it's not an angel, it's the devil. And this is part of the legend that continues on through the years. The Bell family is still here in Robertson County, and it has a bloodline that exists till t to today. And because of that, the story just keeps getting passed generation to generation and is kept alive. Bob Bell is one of those descendants. He has no doubt his family's stories are true. Like his fifth great-grandfather, John, Bob has also been a target inside his own home. I had just gotten ready to get in the bed and everything was qu really quiet then. And then I heard at the end of that hall, the double door slammed shut, both doors. And one of them latches, so they had to be unlatched and they had to slam them shut. And there was footsteps came down the hall and stopped at my door and the hair on my neck stood up. And me not being superstitious, I, I thought somebody was in the house. You know, I thought we had an intruder, and I was, I was truly scared. Probably, that's probably the most scared I've ever been. So I went downstairs, I went to our gun cabinet, and I found a 45. I loaded it, put a round in the chamber, and I had it cocked. I was gonna shoot somebody. <laughs> Cause, and I went room to room, SWAT team style, and, and it took me about a half hour to go through the whole house, because there's two sets of stairs. And I went back and forwards and looked everywhere in that house. There was nobody there. And I slept with the door locked, pistol by the bed, and my light on. Many people believe the Bell Witch that stalked John Bell and his family isn't just an old legend. It's still around. Other people in Adams and Robertson County also have had close encounters with the spirit. Most happen inside a network of caves once used for cold storage by farmers in the region. These dark, out-of-the-way caves can be dangerous places, but are perfect locations for paranormal activity. Cave explorers and casual visitors are warned not to enter unprepared. The most popular cave in the area is the one on the old Bell family farm. Most visitors who go there won't cross paths with the Bell Witch or any other spirit, but they could end up even worse off, cornering a wild animal in its lair. Many of our local ghost stories have begun in caves. Voices, orbs, just about anything you can name have been supposedly heard. And a few years ago, in the last 15 or 20 years, somebody captured a picture outside the mouth of a cave here, and uh, it looked to be a woman dressed in a white dress. It showed up in the film, but it wasn't in the picture when they took it. Betsy Bell and the Bell children often played in the cave that was on their farm. They claimed at times to 
have had something chasing them. And so the story of a giant fish just below the cave that stirred up the water and caused the Bell children to be greatly alarmed. Uh, on a trip from the river and from the cave one day, Betsy saw a little girl hanging from the tree, and she talked to Betsy and uh, told her that she shouldn't marry her boyfriend, Joshua Gardner. So caves are so important to the legend and the story of the Bell Witch in Robinson County. Uh, I was teaching a local history class for Volunteer State Community College. And the guy that owned the cave, he asked me if I had ever been to the cave, which I had not. And so we go down to the cave, and we go about 250 feet back, and I got up on this ledge with this gentleman to see some Indian drawings or whatever, and the lights go out. And this is 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and I have 10 or 11 history students in there. So we grope ourselves back out of the cave, and we get to the entrance of the cave. The lights come back on. Now, my son, who was Let's say 79, so say about six or seven years old. I wouldn't let him go. So I made him stay with the lady upstairs. So I assumed that he, she had done something with the light. He said she didn't move. Pioneer and farmer John Bell is buried here in the Bellwood Cemetery, along with many of his descendants. The place is popular with tourists who come to find out more about the family tormented over nearly two centuries by the Bell Witch. But John Bell's tombstone seen here isn't original. Following an old custom at the time of his death, he would have been buried in the forest. Eventually, many of those early grave sites disappeared. I was going to try to document where people lived at the time because so much of it is, is it's, it's destroyed. I was trying to find one person, the grave. His name was Frank Miles, and in, in the story, he plays a part uh, as being a, a neighbor, and he and John Bell Jr. were close personal friends. I walked the countryside trying to find the grave site couldn't do it. One morning, about 3 o'clock, it was in July, I woke up, I'd had a dream. And I dreamed about a small grove of trees. And I couldn't get that away from my mind. It just, I kept going right back to it. And about the middle of the morning, I thought, I know where that is. So I was, I went in this place and it's grown over with poison ivy and honeysuckle. So I cut all the uh, vegetation away and scraped the dirt off of it, and I had on a glove, and so I rubbed it off, and it said Frank R. Miles. I gently put it back down, covered it back over, and left. I thought, this is, this is not normal. At that point, I thought, you know, some things are better left alone, so just leave it alone. So I stopped my pursuit of locating where all anyone else was buried. Just, I was coming home one night and me and my kids and there was this, I don't know what it was, I can't tell you, it wasn't a cat, it wasn't a panther, it wasn't a dog, but I was driving and this animal come toward my car and it was pure black and had red eyes. That's all I can tell you. Don't know what it was. I'd never seen anything like it before. And it just kind of come toward me and then darted off and I never saw nothing of it. Our phone rang and it was my grandmother who was really distraught, and she talked to my father, and she wanted him to come down as soon as possible. We went into the house, and I remember grandmother still holding the phone and seeing how scared she was. She said, well, I was upstairs taking a nap, and I heard this crash, this loud noise, and I came downstairs, and then came into the kitchen, and I looked in, on the floor, and all my china was on the kitchen floor. Well, the odd part about it was there was a butler's pantry between the kitchen and the dining room that had the china cabinet built into the wall with latching doors. And the doors came open, and all the china, every single piece, came out and crashed on the floor, not in the butler's pantry, but in the kitchen. And it was, I just remember seeing it spread just evenly, like it was just thrown out on the floor. And not one piece was broken, and it was, and it was bone china. So it was, I have no explanation of how that happened or why it happened, but it, it, it was uh, still unexplained by anybody today.
Captain, anybody who goes up there looking for the Bell Witch will find the Bell Witch. In the final chapters of Pat Fitzhugh's book, he talks about his visit out to the graveyard where, where uh, the family, some of the family had been buried. And he talks about ha having this feeling of a presence out there, out at the graveyard. He's not the only one. There is also some kids that had gone out there and had, had found the gravestone of John Bell, and they were bringing the dang on thing back in their car, and they had an accident out on the main road, and they, they died in that accident. Again, the story is it was the witch that, was, uh, that, that went after them. <laughs> The legend of the Bell Witch has been detailed in some 20 books. It's the most extensively studied case of a haunted house in American history. One of the better known works was written in 1894 by Martin Ingram, a Tennessee journalist. And about three years before he wrote the book, in the Nashville Banner, he did write a letter that anybody that knew anything on the subject of the Bell family or the Bell Witch to write him letters and testimonies. And he went around the, the, the entire countryside in, in Montgomery and Robertson and Adams, all through that area, and got a lot of information and testimonies on people that had, had heard about the legend or actually even knew the Bells. The story that Ingram tells is he got the, he got a copy of the diary that was written by Richard Bell which was, who is Elizabeth Bell's younger brother at the time that this event had occurred in Adams Tennessee Richard was about 6 to 7 years old Richard then 20 years later sits down and decides he wrote, he wants to write a diary so he writes a diary and he titled it, My, Fam My Family's Troubles. He gives his diary to his son. His son then, about 20 years later, brings this diary to uh, Marvin Ingram with the stipulation that they could do nothing with the diary until all the family had died off. All the first generation family had died off. The closest to the legend is in Ingram's book because he interviewed people within the same um, era who were related to people who used to live in the time when the actual legend took place. A lot of folks really kind of consider the first book by Ingram kind of the Bell Witch Bible, if you will. And uh, I don't know why. I, I know the Ingram book is older. Perhaps that's why. Ingram was a very good writer. He was a newspaper publisher and he wrote in the style of his day, which was the 1890s. Sometimes a little bit prejudiced, but uh, in general, he's a very good writer. Okay, and the, and the book is basically filled on stories that happened to the Bell family, that they started hearing strange noises, and they started seeing strange animals, and John Bell would shoot at them, and nothing would happen, or they would run off. And it talks about John Bell later on being killed by the witch, Several other books follow and help feed the growing legend. Newer reports of alleged witch sightings and other eyewitness accounts win over more believers. Then, a few members of the Bell family come up with a new theory about the hauntings. In a book published in 1934, Dr. Charles Bailey Bell, John's grandson, says that his grandfather came to Tennessee from North Carolina under a cloud of suspicion. People like the Bell family who who were, my, uh, who were farmers, they began to move into this area because of the land and the fertilization of the land. Uh, we're almost certain that they did raise tobacco. There was a church that was established in North Carolina and it moved here and primarily all the people that was in that church came here with the church. And John Bell was a member of Red River Baptist Church, and he was excommunicated, which I didn't know the Baptists did, but he was. And uh, he was kicked out of the church for a term called usury. John Bell is a wealthy man. 
But how he comes by his fortune and conducts his business affairs raises a lot of eyebrows in Robertson County. They were a prominent family in North Carolina when they moved in here. Uh, I've often wondered why did John Bell, I think at the age of 56, if he was successful back there and had a going farm or plantation, why would you leave and move in here and start fresh again? And there's several stories on basically what he did or what he was accused of is that some say it was for sell of a horse, sell of land, sell of a slave or something like this. He bought it from the Batts family and Kate felt she was cheated in, in the purchase. Kate felt cheated by the Bells and that she played a role in uh, the actual um, experience of the Bell Witch. Um, the Bell Witch actually uses a voice, which not all ghosts do. Uh, and she refers to herself as Kate. And so that takes you back to Kate Batts. And we're not really for certain if Kate Batts was the witch or not. You know, that, uh, you know she's, the witch says that she was. And basically, the, you know, this book right here was, was written by Ingram. And, um, but we don't know if he ever got to interview any of the Batts family or any of that. The ghost could be Kate. It could be Kate because this is, the person that had an antagonistic relationship with John Bell. Um, a lot of people think that it, it is Kate because the ghost would use the voice and whenever she would speak, she would refer to herself as Kate. Although there is nothing to indicate that that happened. In fact, the, oftentimes they say that Kate Batts was the witch. The only trouble is Kate Batts was alive at the time. So it's not likely that uh, she had anything to do with it. And the, also, the other thing I found in research is she didn't really hold a grudge anyway. That's a, it's, it's a good question. How, the, how Kate fit into it all, since as you pointed out, she wasn't dead when these manifestations started happening. There's no evidence that she cursed him, that she felt cheated by him, that was at best a distant relative of hers. So I think this is just uh, probably pretty typical for the way legends develop. Back then, I think superstition probably played a very important role, is that in the early escorts of man or escapades of man, is that if you can't explain it, it must be something we've done to upset God, so therefore we won't do that anymore if we can find out what it was we didn't do to begin with. So therefore this is how they explain many of the actions was through superstition. The dramatic story of the Bell Witch is made to order for actors. Every year in the fall, some of Tennessee's best performers come together to recount the horrific legend of the most famous haunted house in America. Thrills and chills guaranteed. And for the play, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, we have local artists there. We have a lot of talent is in this neighborhood, a lot of talent. I hear in 2006, there was about a thousand in attendance to that play, which runs two or three weekends in a row. And this past year, in 2012, there was 1,600 who visited. So it's really increased. They changed the story up from year to year. They have different characters in it, um, different cast members, and they'll try to focus on different aspects of the legend. And usually involves at least some of the Bell family, and occasionally they'll have a Bats family related to the Bats in, in the play. But it's so good. They are so professional. Uh, uh, we've had people come there from, like, maybe New York, and they say, you know, the plays there are not any better than our plays here. Well, curiosity seekers will come, and they will experience the Bell Witch by going to the play's spirit. And whenever they go out there to Adams and watch the play, sometimes they'll have things happen to them that they will attribute to the Bell Witch. 
And that's why they come here in the first place a lot of times, because people are fascinated with this story. And the fact that it has gone through the years and lasted as long as it has, is just fascinating to people. And when they do come and they do experience the play and then maybe visit some of the sites, they might have some things happen to them that they might think is from the paranormal. And uh, whether it's the paranormal, who's to say? The Bell Witch legend keeps the town of Adams on the map. Recent phenomena still have people believing, and so the legend lives on. When I came being an outsider, I was a non-believer. There are little vaporous orbs that can be seen. They couldn't see it was a person. They just could see some movement and a little light. But I've only been in the cave one time that night that the lights went out. And there's this lady that came, and she was going to do a seance. I have no desire to go back in it. And yes, true, I am a believer. We have not seen them, but we have been told by two different people. Uh, one who was up here, uh, who had never been here before, and said, well, I saw this little cloud going from the cemetery to the, the uh, second floor of your house. And we also ran into another man who grew up on this road as a child and said he was never so scared in his life and saw the same thing. What should one make of those wispy clouds often spotted in this part of Tennessee? Fog is relatively common in the region. Great Smoky Mountains National Park is just a five-hour drive from Adams. The park gets its name from the fog that often drifts down from the high mountains. It's home to bears and deer, but no recorded sightings of a ghost or even the bell witch. So why do people claim strange things are still happening in Tennessee? Like many legends and ghost stories, they tend to morph over time, uh, especially if people have an incentive. And I'm not going to talk about any, I'm not going to make any allegations, but there's money to be made here. Marvin Ingram started a newspaper in Springfield, Tennessee, and then moved his newspaper up to, get to Clarksville. And uh, the two of them ran the paper. Thomas was the, uh, the reporter, and Ingram was the promoter. Uh, they had gotten into, at that time, a kind of the liars group. And the whole thing was a, who could tell the most fantastic story. Well, you can never discount lying. People lie for a lot of reasons. And, and some people like attention. Some people want to believe. So there's always that. When Marvin Ingram wrote his book, on the back part of his book, he's got a list of all the people he talked to and interviewed for this book. You have to go back to where do we even know about the story? We know about the story from Ingram. He talked to nobody who had ever been involved directly with the Bell Witches. He talked only to people who knew people who were involved. In my opinion, it could have been nothing. In my opinion, that story could have totally been made up. He never talked with uh, Elizabeth. He never talked with any of the family and never even talked with the, uh, the boy, uh, Richard Bell, who wrote the, the diary. They refused to part with the diary until Betsy was dead. And I thought to myself, that's really slick because now, with Betsy out of the picture and they give the diary, she's not there to interview, to verify, not verify. So, but again, we go back to this assumes the diary even existed. Nobody has even seen the diaries. There's no reason to believe Ingram couldn't have made everything up other than the fact that these people did exist, the Bell family did exist. It is reported by uh, Marvin Ingram that Andrew Jackson visited the site. Now, Andrew Jackson visited after he had just done the New Orleans, you know, the conquest down there. He defeated the, the uh, British in New Orleans. Well, the, thing, the story about him coming into town and his wagon not moving and on and on, whenever that was reported to have happened, I mean, he was president. People knew where he was, and he wasn't there. Anything that man would have done would have been written down in great detail. Okay, I have searched his journals. Everybody, others have searched his journals. There is absolutely no mention whatsoever in his journals of ever having been 
to Adams, Tennessee, not without alone having, uh, having confronted the witch. I mean, the, the way this legend has developed, it's got a little bit of everything. You know, they've thrown in poltergeist stuff, they've thrown in witch stuff, ghost stuff, bad witch, good witch. There's religion thrown in, you know, so that's a good way to get people to believe. You know, put something in there that they can relate to, and they might ignore the rest, but they'll believe the legend if it has something that speaks to them. Kids all around Robertson County and Middle Tennessee hear about the Bell Witch as they grow up. And not only do they hear it from family and friends when they're younger, but when they do enter the school system, sometimes it will be interjected into their curriculum. What I would do is I would write something on a piece of paper, as inane as it is or something like this, and the rule of the game was is that the first person in this class row read it and tried to memorize it. And then I took the piece of paper and then the rules of the game is you turn around and you tell the person behind you exactly what you read. And that went all the way around the room until the last person. Now that last person's job was to come up and write on the board exactly what they heard. It never, ever started out or ended up the same. So therefore, I said, okay, now we have established the rules for telling the Bell Witch stories. Well, found footage is a well-known technique in fiction. It's used in literature. It's used a lot in sci-fi. But the way it, things are set up is someone stumbles upon a relic, photos, diary, film, whatever, that depicts something that supposedly happened. We all know about the Blair Witch Project. You know, they found these uh, videos of allegedly what happened in the woods. We know the Blair Witch Project is fiction, but what we've got here is the diary is kind of the found footage. Of course, they didn't have videos back then. So we've got Ingram, who allegedly has this source that isn't even that good, but that's another topic. But we, unlike the Blair Witch Project, he doesn't even have the diary. Everyone has heard of a ghost, a haunted house, or a paranormal event at least once in their lives. Most of us either accept or reject the reports based on the evidence. In the case of the Bell Witch, no one can say for sure what actually happened 200 years ago near the quiet village in Tennessee. Or why sightings continue to this day. A few people have theories. Bo was in the, uh, was in the um, um, Bell Witch cave, which sometimes is open to the public and sometimes it isn't. And uh, sometimes around Halloween, they used to say that they would have people to come and they'd, uh, they'd have things happening, you know, to excite people. So one time, Bo was there. He's a friend of the owner, and he was there taking some pictures back in the cave. And there's this lady that came, and she was going to do a seance with a couple of photographers and everything. And she saw Bo in the background, but she didn't see he was a person. She thought that was a bell witch coming there while they were in there. And Bo stood back and laughed and laughed because he, he knew that he didn't want to tell him that it was just him. He didn't want to burst her bubble. One night I was staying with my grandmother. I was very young, four at most. And in my mind, I woke up and just felt like I had to go downstairs in the middle of the night. And when I went downstairs, I saw a ghost behind the stove. And even as a young child, I didn't think it was a ghost. It, it just didn't even make sense to me. I thought, well, that's the boy across the street. He snuck into the house and he's trying to scare me. So I started crying and ran up and got my grandmother and she came down and of course the ghost wasn't there anymore. And I remember having my head in her lap, crying and her soothing me and telling me it was just a nightmare. 
And then the way I remember it, we went back upstairs and I laid in bed and I couldn't help but keep thinking about it. And I went down again and it was there again. Now, why did that happen? I think it was a nightmare, maybe sleepwalking, um, lucid dreaming. But my grandmother and I would talk about it over the years and I'd say, remember when I saw the ghost? And she said, Karen, it was just a nightmare. But in my mind and today, even today, it was so real. Um, and, and that's why people believe in these things. Visitors come to Adams, Tennessee from all over the world to learn about the Bell Witch. Even if they never spot an evil specter lurking in every corner of this quaint frontier town, they're bound to fall under the spell of its charm. When you come to Adams, there's a lot to see and do for a small town. Our motto is year-round country fun, and there are good places to eat. There's Adam Station Barbecue, which has excellent barbecue and home cooking. And the uh, Moss's Restaurant has great steaks and burgers. And It used to be the Schoolhouse Cafeteria, is what it was. It was also known as the Bell Witch Cafeteria at one time. Now, we've had a few little incidents happen out here, knocks and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, we got a little thing up there we stub our tickets on. It come flying across the room. And nobody was near it, but, you know, we just told her, you know, Kate, go away, we're busy, we don't have time to food with you, so, you know. And then Red River Canoe is um, a little bit further down the road on Highway 41, and that provides camping experience and canoeing, and they have a lot of festivals throughout the year. But the Bell School Grounds has a lot of festivals year-round as well. We have the Thresherman Show in July, and, uh, that's been going on for about 43 years now, every year. And they have gentlemen that um, have an old-fashioned wheat thresher and uh, a sawmill, um, a blacksmith shop, and other antique tractors that actually uh, perform the craft there. They also have tractor pulls and other activities, but um, it's neat to see the way these these craftsmen operate, you know, uh, back then. We also have the Bell Witch um, Bluegrass Competition in September. Square dancing and bluegrass music and picking and grinning all over the grounds and um, we end the year with the uh, spirit play in October during Halloween, which tells the story of the Bell family and the Bell Witch. It is a very much attended tourist attraction, and I sold tickets to people from Australia, Sweden, Germany, the Ukraine, and they came. And how they heard about it, I not, did not know. I knew it was a local phenomenon, maybe even a national, but an international. I had no idea. The legend is very popular. It's been around for 196 years, and people come from thousands of miles, even fly from overseas, to learn about the bells. In Robertson County in Adams, we have the Bell Witch Cave, and we have the old farmland of John Bell Sr., and we have a Bell Cemetery and an old Bell School. We're going to visit the Bell Willet City of Adams Museum. We're going to visit the Bell Cabin, which is owned by the museum itself, at least part of the original Bell House. The building behind me is the last standing structure from the original Bell Farm. It was a cabin that was some dated to be built around 1820, and this was the time of the haunting that was going on, and this cabin was moved here on the grounds of Bell School in the early 1980s, and this cabin basically was used by sharecroppers up until the 1970s. So uh, it has quite a history unto itself.
This is the place you would come to find out more about the Bell family and their spirit. On the wall, we have items that related to Adams, and especially back here in the corner, we have a picture of John Bell Jr. up high and some of the documents associated with his life. We have at least one document here uh, telling us what he had given his oldest daughter when she got married. $110 for a horse and saddle, $500 for a slave named Mary. The slaves, of course, uh, at the Civil War the, were freed, but uh, as they became adults, they were probably worth anywhere from $1,200 to $2,000. We have some stuff in the middle that related to his father and, of course, the drawing of his sister, Betsy. Uh, she seemed to be even nervous in her older age. One of her great-great-granddaughters stated that she would never sleep alone. Always had a grandchild or somebody with her, and she would always sleep against the wall and let the child or whoever was with her sleep on the outside of the bed. Adams, Tennessee takes its name from the local train station built in 1859. Ever since, the town has been a popular stop for anyone with a taste for adventure. Signs of its colonial past can still be found everywhere. The riches of the cotton plantations is what attracted families like John Bell's. But it's the infamous Bell Witch who continues to draw the crowds. Well, even before the movie came, became famous, it was the stories, the folklore stories. Any time a folklore booklet comes out or a new production comes out, whether it's a movie or a TV show, people will flock to Adams. They'll come to Robertson County to see if they can be a part of the Bell Witch experience. A lot of them are curious if she actually exists, and they will roam around the town and visit City Hall and find directions to some of the places that are prominent in the legend and they will try to experience it for themselves. I moved here in 1969, and basically I love the rural setting. That's where I basically came from. And that although the area has grown, we try to keep our rural setting. And, uh, you know, we will fight, I will fight basically any attempts to modernize it any more than it is. Well, we have a, a great little town here, and and it's a lot like Mayberry. Uh, it's a small town feel, and the people that are in leadership in the past were had a lot of foresight in the way they planned things and tried to bring people here. And so now it's one of the biggest tourism draws in the county. You know, I think there are things that happened. And I think it's at one time, something happened a long time ago that caused the spirit to be written. It, it became a legend and it was told more and more and more. And as, as the legend grows, it gets bigger and better. You know, more people wants to know about it. And it's something that did happen, but uh, of course it was so long ago, we can't explain it. Weird things happen in Adams all the time, but especially during the play in Spirit Week, the last two weekends of October. Come on down, you never know what you might encounter. Whenever people experience the Bell Witch and they come here, they want to be a part of it. And so they'll either drive by the cave or they'll drive by the school or the cemetery, and they may have car problems afterwards. Now, whether those car problems are from neglect or from the Bell Witch is you know, to be seen, but a lot of them like to attribute things happening to them and experiences happening to them because of the Bell Witch presence in Robertson County. Rhinelander is a small, picturesque town in Wisconsin, a state that's famous for its museums and national parks. In the 19th century, Wisconsin's lumber industry was a leading producer of pulp and paper. Today, it's a prime destination for visitors to the northern United States. Its forests and lakes are a huge draw for tourists, but one place, Rhinelander, is a star attraction. The city is located in Oneida County, where rivers, lakes, and swamps make up about 10% of the region. Summer or winter, there's always something here to satisfy every vacationer's needs. But that's not the only reason people come to Rhinelander. 
According to local legend, a terrifying creature stalks these swamps and forests. Not only has it been spotted by eyewitnesses for over a hundred years, but one has even been captured. I think it's out there. It's in the woods. On one of my evening strolls nearby here, as I was walking past the swampy area, I was stopped dead in my tracks. Then it dawned on me that I'm looking at a creature that is very, very unique, if not the only one of its kind. And there are even rumors early on that he ate human flesh. And as a little girl, I'll tell you, I, I seen him. I truly believe that I've seen the whole egg. It's black. It has horns up its back, big, big claws, a horn on its wrist. We do on occasion receive complaints, concerned citizens calling in about the mysterious creature. This object was coming closer, and here's these red eyes. Claws ripped the belly from any beast. It was so scary. Horns running down its back. I mean, this was just this beast coming out of this woodshed. I've been actually searching for the hodag for 40 years. And the hodag came barreling out from the bushes, bit him in half, just like that. According to eyewitnesses, the hodag lives and hunts in deep, dense swamps. The habitat is so impenetrable and difficult to access, the creature has managed to avoid being captured. There are a lot of books written about the hodag. Most of them are somewhat historical about you know, the hodag and the first discovery of the hodag, but all of them are going to have a chapter about modern sightings of the hodag. Uh, and the hodag has been showing up in the media in various places. There's a kids show that had a, a whole episode based upon the hodag. Eyewitness and newspaper reports describe a hideous creature with the head of a frog, the grinning face of an elephant, thick short legs set off by razor sharp claws, dinosaur-like horns running down its back, and a long tail with spears at the end. According to people who have seen the beast, they also say its skin is either black or green. In the late 1800s, a lumberman named Gene Shepard claims to have captured one of the beasts and taken this photograph. But some say the black and white picture isn't very convincing. In 1896, supposedly, it's been said that Gene Shepard captured the hodag. And how did he capture it? He had a 10-foot bamboo pole. He had a huge sponge soaked in chloroform. And he managed to find out when the hodag was in its cave and worked his way up there with that sponge and that chloroform and got the hodag to go to sleep. Then he brought the townspeople out there, brought it back to his house and showed it for years and years, brought it around to county fairs and made money showing the hodag. Gene Shepard lived in Rhinelander. The climactic area, the geography, the geology of the area all lends itself to a creature such as the hodag thriving and existing here. Uh, he is seven feet long. Seven and a half feet long, we're reported about 12 to 1,500 pounds. So it's it's not something you could hide in the woods. But his camouflage has been, they, they say, very well. What exactly did Gene Shepard find in the Wisconsin woods that day? No other animal has been captured since, and no one has produced any evidence of a sighting. In spite of that, a legend is born. A legend confirmed everywhere one looks in Rhinelander, on postcards, in books, even in the local museum. There have been people who have come forward with tales that can only, in my opinion, be interpreted as sightings of the Hodag. So yes, we've had young people and we've had older people who will swear that what they heard and saw in the woods was absolutely had to be a Hodag.
every tourist who visits Rhinelander is encouraged to take a cruise on the Wisconsin River. Former Mayor Jerry Scheidel now captains the Wilderness Queen. From a dock in Rhinelander, he takes passengers on excursions up and down the scenic Wisconsin River. Captain Jerry recounts the natural and economic history of the region, but he also uses this opportunity to inject a bit of local intrigue, like Hodag, the legendary creature documented near the turn of the century by lumberman Gene Shepard. Gene Shepard was a man who discovered a hodag, and he found that in the Great McNaught Swamp, just north of Rhinelander. Now, the hodag was uh, something that had never been found before. According to Gene Shepard, he first encounters the beast in 1893 in the McNaughton Swamp, just north of Rhinelander. When he gets home, he sketches the creature, and his story is immediately picked up by the local newspaper. Three years later, he returns to the swamp with several men to try to capture the elusive creature. It was a unique creature, and Gene Shepard decided he needed to make some money off of this creature he found. And so he started to show it at the county fairs right around the turn of the century from 1800s to the 1900s. And he showed it there very successfully and actually made himself a quite a few dollars doing it. However, Gene Shepard was a braggart, a drunkard, a womanizer, and he died broke and divorced. And he just didn't know how to handle his money. Right up until his death in 1923, Shepard maintains he did encounter and capture a hodag. Jerry carries on the hodag tradition with today's paying customers, but he adds his own personal touch to the legend. Matthew, pretty fast. And Matthew, are you from the area? Are you from here? No? Stevens Point. Stevens Point, huh? Do you know about the hoed egg? Yeah. Oh, do you like the hoed egg? Yeah. Do you... <laughs> yeah. Jerry isn't just fooling around when he tells his audience that the creature exists. He really believes it. Because one day, just like Gene Shepard, Jerry came face to face with the monstrous creature. Now, I mentioned back at that island that this could be the area where a hodag would be sighted. Well, it's possible. It has water, and a hodag does enjoy some clams and mud turtles and a few water snakes. But it likes a nice swampy area. And I have to tell you, one day I was out walking in an area that was fairly swampy. And as I'm walking through the woods, I'm enjoying the beautiful evening. It's gonna be an evening just like today. And I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the peace and quiet of the walk. And all of a sudden, I am stopped short in my tracks, like dead in my tracks, because a smell assaulted my nose. A stink that could only be described as so strong it would drive a skunk off a gut pile. I mean, it was bad. I stopped. I moved forward quietly and carefully. And upon rounding a bend, I could see this, this aberration coming through the woods as it was a little bit foggy that night. And here it comes walking down the pathway. And as it gets closer, I notice that its eyes were glowing green, that its nose was flaring red. And as it appeared closer and closer, all of a sudden, with cat-like agility, it sprung upon a log right in front of me. And that's when I saw the huge, huge claws. Claws so big it could rip the belly out of the biggest beast. That's when I saw the horns running down its back, ending in a fistful of those needle-sharp points at the end of its tail. And that's when I very carefully, trying not to move at all for fear of what might happen, I reached into my top pocket and I took out my iPhone and I commenced to take as quiet a picture as I possibly could and then without making any sudden movements, I very carefully backed away from that critter and hightailed it out of there. Jerry Scheidel and Gene Shepard aren't the only ones claiming to have encountered the hodag. One day, a young girl named Desiree French 
has a similar experience in the forest near Rhinelander. I enjoy walking in the woods. It's a sense of quietness, I don't know. I, I like to see what all can pop out when you're just sitting there. Well, it was uh, nice and sunny out. Uh, it was around dusky though. Well, I got done with supper and I didn't have any homework, so I decided to go down there and sat up in my favorite tree like I do any other time. And I saw him. He was black, very black. Uh, lots of spikes going. He had two on his head and then at least 15 going down to his back and uh, quite a few on his tail. The claws were, I don't know, about probably about that big on each paw. He had about three of them and then one like on his back there. Uh, it was scary. So, like I kind of froze up and then I'm like, I gotta get out of here. I know that there were have been a few bears down there. So when I hopped out of the tree, I I wanted to make sure that what I saw was correct, and when I went down there, it, it was definitely a hot egg, flaring red nostrils, the stench was horrendous, and uh, it I, I knew what I saw and I ran. At night, I I don't go out, I know that's when he likes to go out to hunt, so I, I just keep away from the swamps at night. I wrote about the Hodag because I'm from here, because it was a way of incorporating stories that I know. I am a Hodag. My family goes back to 1890 census in Rhinelander. And a Hodag's been part of my life all my life. My parents were Hodags. They went to high school here. My grandparents. I use everything. I take the bare bones of the Hodag story and add things that could be true. We have a story about the uh, funeral of Shorty Matusak. There's not too many stories known, true stories, about uh, what happened to some of the victims of the Hodag, but Shorty Matusak was a victim of the Hodag. He was a fireman on the train, and the train used to stop at a little town called Roosevelt on the north side of the Moon's Chain. So the red light was out, the train stopped, Shorty Matusak was the fireman. There was nobody at the station. It was a dark and foggy night. He left the train, which was his mistake. He looked to see what was going on up and down the tracks, and the hodag came barreling out from the bushes, bit him in half, just like that. Now, the only thing about this is he had to be buried. And of course, Father Himmelsbach had to come and say, okay, we can have an open casket, but it's not often that you have the bottom of the casket open. Of course, that's all that was left to a shorty was the bottom. So they put a, they tacked a little uh, satin curtain at the top so you couldn't lump in there. And he wore new shoes and everybody came to the funeral of Shorty Matusek, bitten in half by the hodag. It's, it's a family secret. We can't really tell much um, that, um, you know, where to see the hot eggs. So, you know, some people think maybe it's a hoax, but it's a family secret. It would be like telling where your favorite blueberry patch was. You just never, never talk about that. Rod Umloff is a nature artist who has spent years painting the Rhinelander hodag but they aren't just products of his creative imagination. Rod has actually seen the strange creature that inspires some of his canvases. Our family would come up to northern Wisconsin. We'd have campfires at night. We'd be camping or um, staying in the cabin. And my uncle, he loved to tell ghost stories. I mean, he was the type that'd tell us a really scary story and then take us to a cemetery and make us walk walk through the cemetery. So there's this noise in, in the woods and this object was coming closer and here's these red eyes. And as it got closer, it's making these noises and it, it smelled bad, not like a skunk, but, and there's these horns 
out of its back and it's making these really strange noises and we got really scared. But we thought kind of, I was like, I mean, Uncle Dick's always playing these jokes, um, but we could tell he was not expecting this. And uh, he picked up a rock and threw it at this creature. And, you know, I th thinking back, I think those red eyes were just a reflection from the, the campfire. But that image in my mind, you know, I was, you know, pretty young, six, seven, but that was my first experience with the whole day. About 10 years ago, I was snowshoeing, and in the evening, I saw a group of of hoed eggs, not, not close, but they were, were there's there a lot of dead trees, and I was up on a hill, so I was just like, unbelievable. Because, you know, I'd heard stories about the hoed egg, but people would, you know, just talk about one. But here, there's, you know, a, a group of them. And I wasn't sure whether to call it a herd of hoed eggs or a, a pack of hoed eggs, um, but that was about 10 years ago. So of course, I had to, had to paint that. Following that early experience, Rod has childhood nightmares about the hodag. At first, he suspects his mind is playing tricks on him or that his uncle staged the creature's appearance to frighten him. But his later sighting of a group of the creatures turns him into a firm believer. Most of the time, Rod illustrates the beast with green skin, but that's mainly for artistic effect. Rod says the animals he actually saw in the forest were darker more like the creature Gene Shepard and other witnesses claim to have observed. So what exactly did Rod see in the Rhinelander forest that winter? Being an artist, he would rather show than tell. everything revolves around the hodag. Skeptics write it off as a hoax perpetrated over a hundred years ago by lumberman Gene Shepard. But that doesn't explain why the townspeople and tourists are so willing to believe the creature is real. Well, what I found in all my time up here is uh, there's really two types of people when it comes to believing in the hodag. Uh, there are those that just want to believe. Uh, and there's absolutely no harm in that. It's fun. It's 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 a it's a wonderful creature to you know <laughs> share stories about. Uh, and then the second type are the people that are just trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Well, I'm a skeptic, so I don't think there's any proof that's out there. It's all anecdotes. If you start looking at proof, if you start looking at the scientific possibility of a hodag being there, uh, you're you're not going to have that much to stand on. If you think about it, the kind of one of the big mistakes with the hodag, the story as far as like the reality of it, is that the story is that there was always just one hodag. And so now for there to still be a hodag running around out there today, there would have to be an animal that is about 170 years old that is still out there running around. If you were to look at just simply the scientific evidence of what it takes for a species to survive and the fact that we don't have any photos of them, uh, you can add up things like uh, it's a large creature, it would consume an incredible amount of calories to survive. Probably one of the most famous stories that Gene Shepard came up with when he first was talking about the Hodag was the stench of the creature. Well, in the fall, uh, we have hunters that are just completely filling all of the land of, of around Rhinelander that are hunting. And although, you know, maybe a hodag can hide under a bush uh, to be concealed, but if it stinks so much that you can smell it within 100 yards, you'd think sooner or later somebody would say, hmm, I smelled a hodag. I'm going to track it down. I'm going to take a picture of it. And yet I don't see any pictures or what there are. They're stage shots. And those same skeptics ask another question. Now that everyone owns a cell phone capable of shooting photos and video, why isn't there visual evidence of a hodag? That's precisely what Jerry Shadell has with him when he sees the creature. So where is his proof? Alas, upon getting home, my battery was dead. 
While I'm searching for the charger, my cats decided to use the phone as a kickball, and they shattered it beyond belief. But I did see it. It is real. And I only had one cocktail. You'll find some pictures that Gene Shepard uh, himself took of the Hodag, of townspeople standing around attacking the Hodag and so on. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty stiff looking creature. It seems to be uh, taxidermically perfectly sitting there. So I, I'm not sure how much you really want to take this seriously. He was the prankster. He was the father of this great prank. And so I doubt whether he would have admitted exactly that it was a hoax. But certainly there have been a number of stories that have uncovered it, you know. The more you look into Gene Shepard, the more you're going to find that this guy loved to play pranks. He was a jokester. He, he was, you know, a remarkable man. He was a, a very good surveyor of timber, uh, a, a great talker and a great uh, storyteller. But he's also one of these people, and we all know one of these people, where you can't tell if half the stories that they're telling are really true. Gene Shepard was a prankster, a jokester, and he liked to brag, but he also liked to promote the area he was in. Forestry has been the main source of income for the area. Perhaps lumberman Gene Shepard invents his story to revitalize local industries as the forests are being overharvested. Or perhaps Shepard sees the hodag as an opportunity to line his own pockets with a lucrative sideshow at the county fair. Whatever his motives, today he is hailed as a crafty visionary who replaced a failing economy with a tourist boom. Shepard could never have imagined that the legend of the monster he likely invented would transform his hometown in ways that no one could have predicted. He came upon the idea of trying to pull a great joke, a big joke. He would always dabble in little ones, but he wanted to pull a giant one. And so he came up with this creature and he designed this creature in his head. Then he had somebody actually build a creature for him out of cow horns and cow hides. And he got a very strong smelling uh, liquid from the rendering plant in the area. And he ended up creating this monster and then showing it to people, telling them it was the real thing, that he had found it out in the woods, that it harkens back to prehistoric times. And it's been on the planet for many, many, many years and is very ferocious. The Smithsonian Institute actually sent people up here, and that is when Gene Shepard had to fess up that the whole thing was indeed a joke. I think that absolutely Gene Shepard is probably, um, you know, one of the first ambassadors that we've had for the Rhinelander community. He kind of put us on the map, and he, um, I don't think he probably ever intended to, and I think he probably thought this is going to be hilarious when my friends hear this story about what um, I've just discovered. But he definitely has helped put Rhinelander on the map and has made a name for our community. Rhinelander looks a lot like any other small town dotted throughout the American Midwest. But it doesn't take very long to realize that this one has its very own distinctive local character. It's everywhere you look. Hodag may be a myth or a hoax, but in the town of Rhinelander, the creature seems to tower over everything. As you drive through the city of Rhinelander, you will see pictures of the Hodag almost everywhere you go to include uh, little statues of, of the Hodag itself. The Hodag has been associated with the name of Rhinelander for over 100 years now. And from my experience, it's sort of gone up and down in terms of its popularity. Uh, there was a period 15, 20 years ago where there was, there was a controversy over whether they should paint the Hodag on one of the water towers because, you know, we don't want to have this town become known for nothing but the Hodag. Since then, they've turned around and, you know, the Hodag, there's a massive sculpture of it right in front of the Chamber of Commerce and it's on the water towers and people are proud of it. Uh, and it's it's absolutely a draw to the tourists because it's, it's the lore of a bygone era of the, the lumberjack area that's uh, you know, only a hundred years ago or so uh, that really was what this town in most of northern Wisconsin was built on. 
People come here to Rhinelander, and when they come here to Rhinelander, one of the first things they do is stop at the Chamber of Commerce, and they take a picture of themselves in front of the giant hoedag, which is one of the main attractions for Rhinelander, and does bring people here because they want to see what is this, this myth of the hoedag, this story of the hoedag. How did it develop? Where was it kept? How was it captured? And of course, they need to have a picture of it. The hoedag is really one of the things that Rhinelander is known for. A lot of people from Wisconsin, if you say, oh, I'm from Rhinelander or I live in Rhinelander, they'll say, oh, home of the hoedag, we know the hoedag. We've kind of embraced the idea we are the Rhinelander Hodags. That's our high school mascot. We have the Hodag Country Festival, which is one of the largest country festivals in the state. Bringing the hoedag into everything else kind of helps keep the legend going. It's very hard to put a date when you're from here, on when you heard about the Hodag, it's around you all the time. It's on every sign, it's on your tire dealership, it's on a restaurant, it's on everything. So it sort of begins when you begin. Uh, one of the big tourist attractions we have here, of course, is our Hodag Country Music Festival, where we bring in a lot of great country music stars. And then we've got other festivals that take place, uh, Potato Fest, uh, downtown events taking place, art fair. These are all things that take place outdoors because we have such a beautiful area to, to visit. And now we're gonna go over to Pioneer Park, which contains the Logging Museum. And in the Logging Museum, there are artifacts and there's equipment that was used in the early days of logging up here in uh, northern Wisconsin and specifically in the Rhinelander area. The county fair and the Hodag uh, share a history, and here we are in uh, 2013, and the Hodag is back at the county fair. Welcome, welcome to the world famous Hodag Exposition. And it's a popular show at the county fair. So, full circle, 110 years, 120 years later, the Hodag's back in town. Who's here to see the Hodag? Yeah! Gene Shepard's hoax has evolved into one of the local county fair's star attractions. It's at events like this that Gene Shepard first displayed his fearsome beast to anyone willing to pay a dime for a peep. Jerry Scheidel has revived this tradition with his own slapstick reenactment for an appreciative audience outside the Rhinelander Museum. When Jerry first came up with his sketch, or his actually a reenactment of Gene Shepard talking about the Hodag at the original Oneida County Fair, uh, he performed that at the latest Oneida County Fair one year ago, and it was a smash hit. If we were to look at a Hodag's heart, it would be black. That's how evil and sinister this creature is. People just love the performance. They love the thrill of the, the you know, we're going to see a hodag. Uh, Jerry is a great actor, and he really knows quite a bit about Gene Shepard, and he's, I think he's captured sort of the showmanship, the P.T. Barnum quality uh, of Gene Shepard. So, you know, people loved the show. They were flocking. In fact, uh, I think for their final performance of it, they had a couple hundred people that they didn't even fit into the tent where they were performing it, they had to open the flaps. 
During the reenactment, we have the carnival barker who's out there trying to sell a particular product. In this case, Hodag Magic Elixir Water. Madam, one bottle of Hodag Magic Elixir Water for your husband, and you'll have a new boost in the boudoir. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take one of those. And then we segue right into a little bit of a story about how the hoed egg was discovered and a little bit of a description of the hoed egg in a humorous manner. Jerry's show was um, very interesting. I've never really seen anything like that. Oh, it's just normal. Normal. Okay. A little help here. And I don't know, it was kind of strange at points. <laughs> so I think people loved it because it was, you know, a touch of old time medicine show history. Uh, and, and, you know, in a, to an extent, everybody just can't wait to go into the tent to see the hodag. On a carnival sideshow basis, if you've ever seen movies about the old uh, circuses and the old fairs around the country, they always had the sideshows. They always had these unique things, the, the bearded ladies, the tall and the thin, and the, the skinny and the short, and the, the, all of these different sideshows that nobody believed for a minute, but they were always fun to listen to the barkers out there talking about it. And then it was always fun to go in knowing full well you were probably going to get ripped off. Claws and our lunches. But there's hoed eggs here in town, too. Why, this morning, someone took my eyeglasses. I think it was a whole day. The Rhinelander area is... A few years ago, we used the Hodeg hunt for a marketing campaign, and Chris Drees was one of our Hodeg hunters, and we did television commercials based on the different places that you can find the Hodeg. The Hodeg is very well known for stealing golf balls, for example. Um, and so we went hunting for the Hodeg on the golf course. The Hodeg also loves fresh fish, especially fish from the end of your fishing line. So if, if that big one ever gets away, it's not really that the big fish got away. The hodag is, you know, out for a swim and, and took it from you. Chris will definitely take you out hodag hunting and he's probably one of the, the expert hodag hunters we have in the area. And the fun thing about it is if you can get a hold of him and he happens to be free, there will be no charge and he will take you to those places in the in the woods, in the water, around town where the hodag is, is best known to be spotted and you have the best chance of finding him. There's never been a confirmed sighting of the hodag. Uh, only, um, you know, people rumors we have up in the north. So when I came north uh, to northern Wisconsin, I was intrigued, as many other people have been. And I started uh, doing some research. Uh, you know, uh, camouflage is, is very good, apparently, as, as we can see by the, uh, the, the hodags we have locally. Uh, the, the, the greens and the, and the dark shadows uh, mimic our forest very well. He may right be right behind you, and you wouldn't know. Uh, his scent is, is much stronger than any dog. Uh, it's reported, so when you look for the hold egg, you have to wash your hands very carefully, very, very carefully, and you have to take a breath mint, because they will smell your breath of a human well over a mile away. So that's probably one of the reasons no one actually has seen the hold egg. This is very uh, good hodag country. And we're also going into a swamp area, which uh, most people don't like swamps. So the creatures that live in the swamps are somewhat protected uh, from people who are looking for them. You have to look in unusual places for the hodag. Uh, this was made, and the stick is broken as you can see, this was made by something. You know, whether it was a hoed egg or, or uh, dug by a bear, uh, but it was dug for a reason. This is very important. 
because they may have been here looking for roots. I do not think we should do any actual hunt for the hoed egg because, you know, if you get out in the woods, there might be, uh, you know, there might be real animals out there. You know, maybe there'd be a bear or some mosquitoes or something like that. And so, you know, I just think it would be more trouble than it's worth out there looking. But sometimes, you know, if guests want to hunt down a t-shirt with a hoed egg on it or a coffee cup, you know, something like that, like a hoed egg souvenir, I will tell them where to go because uh, they do sell those at a few places in town and they will go uh, hunt those on down and they are successful every time in that hunt. I would say that there absolutely is a tie um, economically between the hodag and tourism because even for people who Rhinelander may not be their final destination, that means still they might grab lunch. They're still going to try and take home a hodag uh, souvenir with them and, and say that they saw the hodag and get their picture taken. Gene Shepard made a fair amount of money. There was one weekend where he actually, at a dime apiece, brought in $500. Now, $500. Even today, it's a nice little chunk of change. Back then, it was a, quite a lot of money. The whole thing you can find on keychains, um, bumper stickers. I, I got a little snow globe with the hodag on a it. snow globe. Anybody who has any kind of business acumen at all uses the hodag to promote their business. We have sweatshirts, we have t-shirts, we have, of course, we're in Wisconsin, so we have beer mugs, we have children's stories, so we have a whole line of merchandise called Happy the Hodag that was created by a woman who originally is from Rhinelander, and so Happy's the more children-friendly uh, version of the Hodag. Window clings, bumper stickers, postcards, you name it. If we can put a Hodag on it, we will try. Gene Shepard discovered a very evil, sinister, ferocious animal that just stunk to high heaven. Over the years, in order to adapt and adopt a mascot to the current times, it had to be a little more friendly. And the school, the, the high school, Rhinelander High School, made it the mascot. And that was the beginning of a lot of changes with the hodag, because the hodag was a real monster before that. Uh, you wanted to scare people with the hodag. But after that, after the school adopted it, it became, well, it ate white bulldogs instead of human flesh. And only on Sundays did it eat the white bulldogs. So it was cleaned up a lot. And there's a story about how the black hoed egg of the North became green. It's a simple story. The Rhinelander High School had green football uniforms. They repainted the hoed egg. It was a terrible thing for the poor beast. Growing up here in Rhinelander, uh, the hoed egg was always part of our family. Uh, and we are all very proud of it. It's, it's grown and grown the support for the Hodig. It's just been wonderful. So it turned from black to green and from ferocious and evil to a little more likable. Hodag isn't the only bizarre hybrid creature that supposedly inhabits America's forests. The Jersey Devil is believed to be a cross between a kangaroo, a bat, and a goat. And the jackalope is half rabbit, half antelope. But the hodag is the only creature that's been caught and only one of a handful to have captured the public's imagination and interest. We do um, get asked quite frequently if people were going to go out and if they were going to look um, where they might uh, take the kids and what kind of fun things they could do while looking for the hodag. We've been coming up here for years yes. trying to find one. Yeah. Yes, we have not seen it. We've been hunting for them. Yeah. yeah. I've also actually seen the hodag used as a parental tool in that they will tell their children, you know, you might want to watch out and behave and stay in the tent if they're camping tonight because the hodag could potentially, you know, sneak out of the woods or climb out of the lake. And it's always great when kids' eyes get really large and they hear just what might happen when they don't listen to mom and dad.
Whether anyone still believes or not, both locals and visitors all agree that the strange legend of the Hodag has left an indelible mark on this little city in the heart of Wisconsin. A mark that has put Rhinelander on the map of extraordinary places. People wonder how it is that the Hodag is alive after over a hundred years. Well, it's got several reasons. The main one being it is a unique creature. There are no other mascots that look like the Hodag, that exist like the Hodag. There are no other creatures that have a myth and a story built up around them over time. And it keeps getting bigger and bigger. USA Today had a contest where you could uh, vote online. In Wisconsin, we were considered the most unique mascot in the, the state. So it's an absolutely wonderful uh, bit of lore and a great, uh, great name of a creature that a lot of people have tapped into uh, and have carried on with the myth. The mystery of the Hodag is something that is just a lot of fun, and it's something unique, and it's not something that anybody else can say that they have. And so um, whether you believe or don't believe, it's a little bit like Santa Claus. I think, you know, kids will always believe in Santa Claus until they're told differently. So um, we, we treat the Hodag sort of the same way. The Hodag, like, gives us more pep. I mean, it makes... This makes the city a cooler. I don't know. I I'm trying to explain this. It, it brings recognition to to the town of Rhinelander. Plus, then we can make T-shirts about it and sell it. I think it's a great initial hook. I think people really kind of get into it. I think that they they come here, they enjoy it here, they have a great time, and the fact that there is no hot egg at the end of the day really doesn't matter. It's as real as, as you want to make it, and kids love it. I mean, we have storybooks about it. Um, they did a Scooby-Doo episode about it. So in, in Rylander Hearts, it is real. It's real to all of us. Over the years, because we have mellowed the image of the Hodeg down so nicely, uh, it's just a more lovable, more mellow, more interesting creature to adopt and to like. And so people have, they've taken to it. If you want to believe, you'll believe, ultimately. Uh, it's fun, it's, it's the whole mystique behind uh, the creature, the hodag, the lore of uh, the 19th century lumbermen, and if you want to believe, you're gonna believe it. Klagenfurt is the capital city of Carinthia, the southernmost state in Austria. The city is located in the scenic foothills of the Alps. Klagenfurt has about 100,000 inhabitants and sits in a valley surrounded by 3,200 foot or 1,000 meter high mountains. The peaks are so tall that snow covers them well into June. Whether it's a day at the beach, a boat ride, an outdoor concert, or sipping a cold drink on a sunny terrace, there's something here for everyone. But there's a dark side to these lively attractions. Something sinister may inhabit these waters and mountains. Tradition alleges that a terrifying creature hunts here, one that attacks and eats humans. The body shape is long, stretched, it's um, round. The head is similar to a dog. What you also can see is that it has very small eyes and a large nose. So it was very aggressive because it couldn't see well.
It always attacks here and it jumps through the air, say, up to 15 feet or more. With short legs and uh, short wings and a frightening, frightening face and teeth. It looks like a dragon. Um, he can also fly. You have to be very careful, uh, especially when he is hungry. It's so poisonous that even its breath can kill. Yeah, once it blew out fire, it destroyed our city. So if you are being attacked, you better run. The creature everyone's talking about has been spotted hundreds of times. Their stories vary. Some describe it as a large lizard or snake. For others, it's a dragon or a hybrid of all three. Some say it has two legs, others four. Still, others claim it has a hundred, like a centipede. Eyewitnesses believe its skin and tail resemble a crocodile's. Whatever it is, every school kid in Klagenfurt learns about it. Girls especially fear it because many of its victims have been female. Locals have several names for this monster, but most call it the Tadzel Worm. I actually, I really believe that people who see strange things and strange creatures do see what they see. So people who see a strange kind of reptile or who believe they've seen a strange kind of reptile would have reported until the 1930s that they have seen a tutsil worm, where there were regular news reports about sightings of tutsil worms and where scientific magazines asked their readers to send in their sightings of tutsil worms uh, for analysis for zoologists. The idea that there are large reptiles of serpentine or lizard form exists all over Europe. And um, the, you have one general term that is dragon, which comes from the Greek word draco, which means serpent. The Germanic word for that is lindwurm, or snake snake, um, gener actually translated. And wherever you go in Germany or in the German-speaking parts of Europe, you have different names for dragon, and one of these is Tutselwurm. The belief in fire-breathing dragons was common throughout the Alpine regions of Europe during the Middle Ages. Frightening tales emerged as families went about their everyday lives in these secluded and unexplored mountainous areas. Even today, some people still believe there is some truth in these old stories. Imagine in former times, not only in the Middle Age, but also lasting until the end of the 19th century. Nature at that time was still something dangerous, something very strange, which is, is, is something against human beings. But nevertheless, people had to walk from one place to the other wandering from one valley to the other, crossing mountains. And in such ways, lonely, wandering, I could imagine that they get in contact suddenly with such a creature. And the most interesting case was in, for me, was in uh, 1899, when an official forester in Austria reported that he had been attacked by a tutsil worm in a very smooth fur coat. This particular encounter with a tadzel worm is especially chilling. Records indicate this hairy creature spit poison at its victims. Fortunately, the forester shot it dead. Nothing more is known. There are more recent eyewitness accounts to add to the legend. One day, a farmer discovered a skull in one of his fields. The skull is now on display at the Klagenfurt Regional Museum. Could it be the actual skull of a tadzel worm? When alive, was this the head of the monster that terrorized so many people? Are these the eyes that stalked its victims?
Cryptozoologists investigate undiscovered animals that have eluded the science of traditional zoology. Creatures like the yeti, sea serpents, and giant squid are just some of the legendary species cryptozoologists research in an attempt to prove whether or not they exist. Since my early childhood, I have been interested in cryptozoology, which is a Greek word meaning the um, signs of hidden animals, animals still undiscovered by uh, zoology. And while most cryptozoologists are interested in whether these animals are real or not, or try to hunt them, are more interested in the sociological and folkloric implications of these reports. Well, all over Europe you find the myth that there were dragons in earlier times. And there are many terms and names for these dragons. In Germany, the dragon was often called Lindwurm, which is an old German word. Lind means serpent, and Wurm means serpent too. So it's Lindwurm actually translates as snake, snake. In the Alpine region, the Lindwurm was often called Tatzelwurm which is one of many local names. Others are Stollenwurm, Haselwurm, Murbel, Bergstutz, uh, or in Italy, Basilisk. With hundreds of eyewitness reports, it's hard to determine what's real and what isn't. In 1860, a cross between a Tatzelwurm and a sea serpent was spotted in Lake Monzee in Austria. More recently, in the 1980s, a farmer claims to have seen a tadzel worm near Carlton in Italy's South Tyrol province. He ran over it and crushed it with his tractor. And the evidence is still mounting. In recent years, more sightings have occurred in Austria's Enns Valley. Sightings of the tadzel worms, that is, people who actually claim to have seen a dragon-like creature in the mountains, spreads all over the Alps from uh, nice in France, over to Italy, around the large Italian lakes, to all over Switzerland, Austria, parts of Germany, uh, in Bavaria. And it also goes down to Yugoslavia, where there are, again, local variants. Thousands of years ago, the region around Klagenfurt was carved out by glaciers into deep valleys. Swamps and marshes were left behind by the melting ice and runoff from snow-capped mountains. Large animals grazed in the alpine meadows. Many of these creatures were very different from the ones we know today. Early humans lived in these areas too and came into contact with the prehistoric animals. They may even have had close encounters with the tadzel worm. Well, the people uh didn't live in the Klagenfurt Bassin a thousand years ago, they lived up the hills. So in the Bassin, you, you could have seen the Lindworm. Generally, people tend to think that the Tatzelworm is an animal that lives in the rocks um, above the tree line. But um, from all the stories that I have assembled, um, almost half of the stories refer to a tutsel womb near or in water. There are practically no sightings of tutsel worms in the forest. So uh, generally, where people expect to see tutsel worms or where people see tutsel worms is where people would say normal lizards as well. As much as Germany became deforested and settled, the more the dragon was pushed to the geographical margins of the region, and that were the lakes on the one hand and the high mountains on the other. The most recent sightings of totsawurm like creatures have been in the area of the big Italian lakes that is around Lake Como, Lake Garda, and Lake Maggiore, and in southern Tyrol, in the edge Adige Valley, and um, in the Veneto, which is the province of 
Venice in Italy, the Alpine parts of that province, and in Austria in the Enns Valley. So if someone is looking for actual living tutsil worms, he should concentrate his search there. More than 500 reports of large lizard-like creatures have come from an area of several hundred square miles around Klagenfurt. It's not clear if people are seeing the tadzel worm because no one can agree on what the beast actually looks like. So the creature remains largely a folktale, somewhere between superstition and unproven scientific fact. Is this creature still crawling around these regions? The most impressive evidence is this giant skull found near Klagenfurt 700 years ago. The skull of the lindworm uh, was found in the 14th century uh, in uh, near Klagenfurt at uh, St. Michael's at the Zollfeld um, at the dragon's, the so-called dragon pit. In the 13th century, the city seal of Klagenfurt already showed a winged dragon, the lindworm. The discovery of a tadzel worm skull caused the legend and fear to spread throughout the Alps. Seeing the monster's image immortalized in Klagenfurt's town emblem reinforces local belief that the terrible beast that once devoured its residents may still be on the prowl for more. Finding tadzel worms is a daunting challenge. During the Middle Ages, people claimed the creatures lived in marshes. Today, some people believe they inhabit the shores of local lakes. Others think it's the alpine forests that offer the best chance for a close encounter. Wherever it lives, most witnesses agree the tadzel worm is a huge reptile, either a large lizard or a giant snake. Because such a creature is within the realm of possibility, some people still believe it exists. Tatzelwurm is a German word which translates into English as a snake with legs, which generally gives you a good idea about how a Tatzelwurm is supposed to look like. People who see them have told of many different kinds, but generally it's either a large lizard, like an iguana, or a snake. And um, there have been reports of Tatzelwurms with no legs, so complete snakes, or only front legs, or only hind legs, or even with a row of legs like a centipede. The tatzel worm has uh, often generally resembles a lizard, but with a stumpy tail, so like the tail being cut off. The skin is like that of a lizard or a newt, but there are many tatzel worm sightings who say the tatzel worm that I've seen had hair. Um, Generally, in modern reports, which are more credibly in zoological terms, um, the head is said to resemble uh, that of a newt or a snake or a lizard. But about 200 years ago, the tutsil worm was always, um, when people reported tutsil worms, they said it had the head of a mammal. So like mainly a cat's head or a goat's head or a dog's head or even a child's head. Legends dating back to the Middle Ages describe tadzel worms attacking cows for their milk and eating young girls before slinking back into the impenetrable swamps. The story is that um, the lindworm lived in Klagenfurt and the people um, lived outside of Klagenfurt because they were afraid of the lindworm. And the tadzel worm was living in this area so the, especially the woman, they had a lot of fear. When we were younger, we, um, when we heard the story, we were a little bit afraid of the lindworm. Because when he was hungry, he has also eaten sometimes one of the nice girls. I um, thought that the lindworm can bite me and eat me. <laughs> and uh, then the men are coming from the small villages around. 
And um, one day the Prince of Klangfurt built a tower where um, young knights could fight against the Lindrum. And uh, one of the farmers, he had um, a beef, a strong beef, and they put something in his uh, mouth, like a, when you go fish. Man hat einen Stier angekettet. Und uh, in diesem Stier einen Widerhaken angebracht. Uh, und auf den Lindwurben hat man dann gewartet. Der Stier hat sehr laut geschrien. Und durch das Schreien uh, des Stieres ist der Lindwurm angelockt worden und hat sich auf den Stier gestürzt und ihn natürlich versucht zu fressen. Und dabei hat er sich in den Widerhaken verfangen. Und je tiefer er sozusagen das Tier in seinen Rachen verschlingen wollte, umso stärker hat er sich in den Widerhaken hineingebissen. Kurzum, am Ende ist eben äh, der Lindwurm auf diese Art und Weise äh, getötet worden. Und die jungen Männer äh, sind seitens des Landesfürsten auch in der Art und Weise reich beschenkt worden, dass man gesagt hat, hier wird auch äh, die Stadt Klagenfurt gegründet. Is the Tadzel worm a surviving remnant of some extinct species that once inhabited the Austrian Alps? Or perhaps it's an undiscovered and unclassified new species that has managed, so far, to escape capture. I did not only read books and newspapers and collect stuff about these monsters, but I also uh, traveled to many areas where monsters have been seen, also where tussle worms have been seen. And I spent some summer holidays in other Italy, where around the Italian lakes Tatsu booms have been reported well until five years ago and um, went through the mountains. But um, while I found old reports, I was never actually able to photograph one myself. One of the most interesting things that I've noticed is in contrast to, say, sea serpents or lake monsters, a large percentage of the reports refer to dead animals. That is, about 60 out of 500 reports um, refer to um, the finding of a skeleton or actually the killing of a tatsu worm. But the most recent that I investigated was the case of a tatsu worm that was killed in the 1980s at Kaltan in South Tyrol, where a farmer found a tatsu worm that was dead and because he had run over it uh, on his tractor. And this was collected and later analyzed by zoologists and was found to be a shelter pusik. And that's a legless lizard that lives in the Balkans in what was then Yugoslavia. It was very close to a railway line, so it was suspected that this uh, Balkan lizard, which looks like a snake, very strange creature and large, did crawl on a railway wagon in the Balkans and then went out when the train stopped at uh, St. Joseph in Kaltan and therefore was killed there. The Alps have been thoroughly explored and mapped and an inventory of every living species found there reveals nothing resembling a tadzel worm. Yet, reports of sightings extend over 900 years. In spite of logical explanations about what it could be, the legend of the tadzel worm lives on. Die Geschichte des Lindwurms ist natürlich eine sehr lange Geschichte und reicht bis in das Mittelalter, bis in das sogenannte finstere Mittelalter zurück, späten 12. Jahrhundert, als uns der Lindwurm in einem Stadtsiegel zum ersten Mal begegnet, war natürlich äh, der Volksglaube, äh, der Aberglaube äh, und damit auch der Glaube an diesem Lindwurm äh, sicherlich in großen Teilen der Bevölkerung noch vorhanden, weil es auch durchaus dem damaligen Zeitgeist äh, entsprochen hat. Nowadays, with the uh, tendency of many people to keep exotic animals which escape or which are released into the wild, 
Certainly there is more uh, chance that um, real animals might be behind some of the sightings. But generally I do think that it's um, still a question of perception. Around um, the year 1800 you have three meter tetzel booms as a rule and 1930 you have one foot tetzel booms as a rule. And um, I think this is a very strong confirmation of the idea that as long as the Alps as a habitat were practically untouched by man, he could imagine large creatures living there, like in foreign countries. As much as the mountains were explored by mountaineers, by tourists, um, the idea of a three-meter dragon living uh, around, say, Lake Como became incredible. So people tended to see smaller animals. Because the tadzel worm raises so many questions and contradictions, skeptics have a field day with it. One of them is Dr. Michael Martis, director of Austria's Alpen Zoo in Innsbruck. Innsbruck twice hosted the Winter Olympics in 1964 and again in 1976. Martis knows all about the alpine animals and their behavior. And he has a theory about what the tadzel worm might be. The name Alpen Zoo is the theme we decided to show to our public with uh, about 150 species and more than 2,000 individuals. We display on our grounds the largest collection of the alpine fauna in the world. Well, as far as I'm a natural scientist and especially an interested in animal behavior, I believe in what I see and what I know. The story of Tatzelwurm is um, interesting, but it's for me, it's a myth, it's a legend. And I could imagine that we have a very basic biological counterpart to the Tatzelwurm, which is the river otter. The river otter is living mainly, as it, the name says, on rivers, on streams, on ponds. He's more or less nocturnal or active during the darkness. And its behavior gives me the impression that it is the realistic figure of the Tatzelwurm. The river otter is raising his body to have an overview He's screaming if it's something scaring him. It is also hissing if it's in fear. And when swimming, it is diving. And if during the courtship behavior, a male is following the female, it gives the impression of a snake. And so all together, this behavior of the river otter could be a very good uh, picture for the idea of a tatzel worm. For Martis's theory to hold any water, hundreds of eyewitnesses over nine centuries would have had to mistake the tatzel worm for a common river otter. But even the most rabid skeptic has a hard time explaining why so many people confused a giant reptile with a small mammal. Martis believes there's an obvious answer. People from rural countries, they were wandering, crossing mountains, or sometimes very isolated, alone, in the night, in the darkness. And at that time, even in the 19th century, Nature was something strange, dangerous. It was something to be scared of. And river otter actually is not only 
river, uh, living in rivers, but or in water, but is also wandering from one valley to the other, so crossing mountains. It could be happen that a river otter is crossing the way of a wandering man. Well, you know, if you look at an at a river otter, he he could bite you if he's if he's scared, if he's in in a corner and cannot escape, he will attack you. He will bite you. He will scream. Uh, so this animal, I think, shows a lot of items which are belonging to the so-called Tatzelwurm. And the most interesting case was in, for me, was in uh, 1899, when an official forester in Austria reported that he had been attacked by a Tatzelwurm in a very smooth fur coat. Um, the Tatzelwurm had fur. And um, it was spitting poison at him, and he hit it and killed it. And when later scientists came to recover, it was the antler of a deer. So practically everything could be turned into a Tatzelwurm if the fear or the um, idea that this animal existed uh, was believed to be real. Anything could turn into a tetzel wall. Fear and superstition explain away most of the stories about the tetzel worm. Yet some believe the monster might actually have existed back in the Middle Ages, then disappeared. Their hard evidence is this large skull discovered in the 14th century and now on exhibit at the Klagenfurt Regional Museum. 500 years ago, uh, each uh, bones and skulls the people found, they thought uh, it's, um, that it is uh, related to dragons or to mythical creatures. So what we see here is the uh, skull of the so-called Lindwurm, which is of course uh, not a mystical uh, creature but it's from the Ice Age and it's a woolly rhino. So um, in that time when they found the, the creature, uh, they thought it would be something else because they don't know about dinosaurs and fossils. But after that, in the year 1840, the paleontologist came to uh, the, uh, the city of Klagenfurt and saw the skull. And then he found out that it's the woolly uh, rhino from the last Ice Age. So it's about 30,000 years old, maybe a little older, but we think about 30,000 years. And what you can see clearly here at the uh, sides and here also that it's really of bone structure. If you break a bone today, it's the same structure. Also, when you look at it, you can hear this is no bone anymore. This is um, silicified. Of course, it doesn't live on the ice shield, but it lived around at the grass uh, areas together with the mammoths, but it was not so uh, frequent. What you also can see is that it has very small eyes and a large nose. And because of this fact, they think uh, the sight was bad, but the, um, the smell was good. So it was very aggressive because it couldn't see well. When the people of Klagenfurt found the skull, they saw only the upper part because the, the lower jaw is missing. So it looks much more like a snake than everything else. Also, it's very large and has no um, similarities to other animals. Nowadays, as a paleontologist and with our knowledge, we know that this is uh, a rhino. If you're going to Africa and look at the rhinos today, they have um, or Sumatra. They are very similar and they are, um, uh, uh, they are related. So this is no question, this is a rhino and not a lindworm. As an example as how this process might work, if you visit Loch Ness and see a large dark shadow in the waves, even if you're a skeptic, you would be thinking in terms of the Loch Ness monster. People have preconceived ideas about what they know from the media and in earlier centuries we have known through folklore about what to expect uh, in terms of monsters. And um, there's a general tendency for monsters to be at the margin of civilization. That is, dragons were reported in Germany everywhere in the Middle Ages. Nobody had ever seen one, but it was known dragons lived there. 
And as much as Germany became deforested and settled, the more the dragon was pushed to the geographical margins of the region, and that were the lakes on the one hand and the high mountains on the other. And in the Alps, this idea of the dragon has been able to survive the longest. I think the, the people who found the skull in the 14th century really believed the legend of the Lindworm because they didn't know that uh, it was a, a skull from the Ice Age, of a mammal from the Ice Age. Well, I would say the, the, the people of Klagenfurt were disappointed about this fact at the first time. But anyway, um, the skull came to the 1849 founded um, uh, Regional Museum of uh, Natural History and later on to the Regional uh, Museum of uh, Carinthia, where you can still see it. The one piece of evidence that might prove the tadzel worm is real turns out to be the skull of a woolly rhinoceros. Paleontologists authenticated it as an extinct animal that roamed the region about 30,000 years ago. In spite of this fact, the people of Klagenfurt are so fond of the dragon legend, they include the mythical tadzel worm in their city's emblem. Moreover, the dragon statue glares down menacingly from a pedestal in Klagenfurt's city square. of the city of Klagenfurt. We have around 100,000 inhabitants, a bit less. And here we're in the main place. That's the new square, Neuer Platz in German. And behind us we can see the Lindwurm. That's the symbol of our city. We have all a strong connection to the Lindwurm right here. The Lindworm, yeah, it's, it's not so easy to define what it is. Actually, everybody says it's a dragon, but if you go further on, you will see the, the face is close to be the one of a lion. Then you can see the ears, it's like a bird, and the, at, at the end, the tail is like from a snake. And it was built in the 16th century. The big statue of Hercules uh, was, was added in the 17th century. Tatsache ist, Im Jahre 1593 wurde dieser Lindwurm offiziell in die Stadt gebracht und hier am heutigen neuen Platz aufgestellt, und zwar auf Veranlassung der Stände. Meine Interpretation äh, dieses Ereignisses ist, äh, dass die protestantischen Stände es dem katholischen Landesherrn eben sozusagen zeigen wollten, Hier ist unser Machtsymbol. 40 Jahre später etwa wird der Lindwurm dann in die heutige Position gebracht. Das heißt, auf ein Fundament gehoben und herum entsteht dann ein Brunnen und dann kommt als völlig neues Momentum ein Herkules dazu. The Tadzel Worm is front and center in Klagenfurt's city square for all to see. Yet the stark presence of a giant stone dragon gushing water through its ferocious teeth can't be dismissed as just another piece of historic art. Today, this ancient statue keeps watch over year-round festivals and assemblies in the square. However, since the sculpture was erected at the end of the Middle Ages, it could also be seen as the visual record of a creature which may have actually lived during that time. The monument of the, of the Lindworm at the new place in Klagenfurt is uh, it's a, an interesting fact. It's about six tons and uh, it shows the Lindworm with his open mouth and uh, out of the mouth there comes a fountain. So this is very artistic 
And when you look to the, the tail, at the twisted tail of the lindworm, this is also a sign for a high mastership in, in sculpture. This fountain had also, was also a practical thing. It was um, used for the water supply in the city. So the whole ensemble is a, a very characteristic um, a sign of Roman mannerism. It's a, it's a very important work of art. When we are little children, um, every class go to the Lindwurm and um, watch it. And we learn the story of the Lindwurm in school. And yes, I think um, for the citizens in Klangfurt, it's also an important um, symbol because it's the symbol of our city. So the people, uh, they have to choose uh, what they want to see first. But most of them, they are going first to the new square where we have our Tesla room. And then they decide we are going for a swim, we are going in a museum, we are going shopping, or let's have a look where we have to, where we can buy a souvenir with the Tesla worm. So here we are in the tourist information office and you can see a lot of products connected to the Lindworm, to the Tetzel Worm. And you can see the brand is on the t-shirt, so if we go further we can see the legend. It's written in a nice book and you can see the coat of arm of Klagenfurt with the red background, the white tower. It's, it's like a, a brand mark, you know? So you can go further on, it's also for kids. You have a book about the dragon. It's described as a dragon in here. Souvenirs are for little kids. It's very nice, a uh, lindworm to, to take you to your bed, to sleep. And for the sportive ones, you have also a hat. Yeah, like that. There are some holdouts who still believe the Tatzel worm is waiting to fill its stomach with more victims. But most people are just grateful this mythical beast helps fill Klagenfurt's commercial coffers. The Tatzel worm's been so good for business, it's become an iconic symbol of the city. I think uh, it is the combination. The combination is the town, the lake, and the Tatzel worm. I cannot uh, say that a person is coming to Klagenfurt only to see the tassel worm, and a person is coming to Klagenfurt only to go for a swim in the lake. It is the combination what Klagenfurt offers. I work in the Hofbreutzum Lindwurm and we have the Lindwurm in our name because it's a symbol for Klagenfurt and um, our restaurant is really near um, the stature of the Lindwurm. Hofbräu is a restaurant chain where you can eat and drink um, typical Munich food and yes, I worked in a Dirndl because it's also typical for Munich. The Tatzel worm is so integral to tourism that many shops, restaurants and pubs find ingenious ways to honor the beast. But having such a celebrated creature can also attract the wrong kind of attention. Occasionally, revelers out on the town try their hand at dragon slaying after killing a few pints. the monster can be alive. Because like some, some months ago, there was a very strange story. There've been some guys, maybe drunk, and yeah, what they did was that they thought the monster was alive, and so they tried to, to, to fix it. No, they, they climbed onto the monster, onto the tail, and the tail broke down. So we had to fix it again. It was a nightmare, more or less, for the lindworm and for those guys, for sure.
So actually, I believe that it's death, but you know, you never show. And being a young girl who was like the main dish of the of the Lindworm back there, you can never be so sure. And when you're swimming, having a good swim in the lake, and you're going further on, you might touch something, and you're not sure if it might be the Lindworm. So sometimes you you can be scared. Let's say it like that. The tadzel worm has now morphed from a monster into a moneymaker. Klagenfurt counts on its famous dragon to drag in customers. From cuddly toys to chocolate treats, the tadzel worm is now the ultimate in creature comforts. Many tourists come here to see the lindworm because it makes Klagenfurt a little bit interesting because they want to know the story about the lindworm and want to see it. When I get older and I have kids, um, I will tell them the story about the Lindworm, but um, I don't want them to be afraid. Uh, ich denke, der Lindworm ist unter den vielen sogenannten Untieren, uh, die es in der Geschichte gegeben hat, die es auch heute uh, noch gibt, uh, doch etwas Einzigartiges. Der Tesselwurm has also something special, uh, a warm, um, how do you say, energy. Well, if you really, really want to see a tetzel bomb, then I give you the advice. First, drink a schnapps, which is very common here in the, in the Alpine region. Then, when it's late in the night, start walking up the mountains, across some little rivers, and listen, maybe you hear it, and I bet you will be feel scared, and that's the Tatzelwurm. Despite all my skepticism uh, regarding the Tatzelwurm, you can never, it would be very unwise to actually 100% rule out that there is something like the Tatzelwurm. It's highly unlikely, but who knows, and um, even if you don't encounter a tutsal worm, I'm pretty certain that the, the scenery on the mountains um, of Carinthia will be well worth the visit, with or without a tutsal worm sighting. California. The name alone conjures up images of sunshine, surfers, beaches, and of course, Hollywood. But further north, the scenery changes drastically. The beaches and sunshine of the south are replaced by lush forests, majestic mountains, and wild rivers. This region with its 15,000 hectares or 37,000 acres of dense forest attracts hikers, hunters and fishermen from all over the world, eager to explore its natural beauty. One particularly scenic road connecting the towns of Willow Creek and Happy Camp takes travelers through a redwood forest with trees among the tallest on the planet. But tourists coming to Willow Creek, nestled south of the Oregon border, are after more than just the scenery. For centuries, a shadow has stalked the woods here, inciting panic and spreading rumors. You don't see them unless they want you to see them. They're very elusive. They're, some people call them tree peekers. Somewhere between six and eight feet tall and covered in brown or reddish or blackish fur. It was um, dark brown to black hair. It had um, a protruding brow ridge, a pointy cone head. They're very careful. They know the woods a lot better than we do, and they don't want to be seen. The creature has footprints that look like this. It's usually big and bulky. They still do not know what the creature was that had the tracks. That's Indian Creek. And that's where these people were when they saw it scooping up water in his hand. 
There was something in my yard that was big and heavy and made the ground shake. I don't think it was a bear, and it sure didn't sound like a deer. And all of a sudden, this big shadow with arms and legs and a head walks behind us going that way. He said, my biologist found an elk with its head twisted off. Ran up to my wife and kids and said, let's go, let's go, move. And they're like, you know, what's your problem? I go, now, move. Nestled in the heart of the Six Rivers National Forest, Willow Creek is known as the world capital of Bigfoot. The best place to search for the ape-like monster that walks on two feet and was known by Native Americans as Sasquatch. Willow Creek is probably the most concrete base for Bigfoot. Uh, if you're looking for Bigfoot and if, you're, if you want to find people who have information regarding Bigfoot, Willow Creek is the center of that story, that lore, the, the history of it. We have many people in our community who have seen, heard, felt, smelled, found his dens. Uh, you know, we can, you can find a lot of good stories about Bigfoot here in our town. And we have a lot of believers. Well, there's several local, a variety of local legends, and there's a lot of local tradition that goes back quite a long time in uh, the Hoopa Valley, and then north in the Yurok area, and then northeast in the, in the Karuk area. I mean, the, the stories in the local area go back six, 7,000 years with all the local tribes having stories about it. There are lots of Native American stories of lots of different creatures in the woods. And a book, Bigfoot type creature is among those. There was a notorious uh, history of a, of a larger, hairier uh, uh, creature that lived in that area. You know, these cultures didn't have an image of an ape back in the early days. Um, the more traditional members of the culture will probably tell you that it's a spirit of some kind, you know, not uh, an animal at all. In their languages, they all had names that reflected uh, physical beings. For instance, the uh, White River Apache have a name for this thing that literally means big, hairy man. The uh, Blackfeet in Montana have a name that means big feet. And they all have different understanding of what, what these are. The, the uh, Diné, Navajo, uh, in the Four Corners area, uh, believe that the more often this being is seen, uh, the closer we are to the end times. Well, people see them around here still to this day. Just ordinary people. But uh, some of these people working up in the area saw the creature at night, you know, when they're driving home from work, just crossing the dirt roads out in the woods. Uh, locals who fish or hunt, um, they see them out in the mountains. Uh, some local people describe seeing them just in their backyards. You know, we don't have fences here. We have, your backyard is mountains that go on for miles and miles and miles. In 1958, they were building this road up there into Bluff Creek. It was uh, virgin timber for the most part up in there, and they wanted to do some logging. There was a construction project uh, in the area, then they found really strange footprints. and. This finally got out to the coast as a, as a story about Bigfoot. These original tracks, they had a very human-like appearance, you know, um, and th this is where the, the word, uh, the name Bigfoot really was born. They, they were found many different times uh, around the tractors. You know, they'd leave the tractors up there at night and go home down here for the most part. And uh, when they'd come back in the morning, they'd find this. These workers witnessed other disturbing things. Pieces of heavy machinery, some of which weighed hundreds of pounds, were found well into the forest, a trail of mysterious footprints leading up to them.
Willow Creek is intimately linked with the Bigfoot legend, as anyone who has visited the town knows. The Bigfoot Books Library is a veritable goldmine of records, eyewitness accounts, and documented evidence. Its owner is happy to talk about the mysterious creature and shed some light on the mystery. There are these mystery primates pretty much everywhere across the world, um, through, through Central Europe, Asia, Siberia, the Himalayas, up uh, and down the coast of Asia, all through the Indian subcontinent, into Africa, you know, South America. About the only place they're not really legitimately described is out on the islands of Polynesia, but I mean, out farther like Hawaii, but uh, throughout Indonesia there, there, there are plenty of uh, these mystery apes. I am convinced that there's Bigfoot, and it's not only here. It's absolutely worldwide. When we had, I think it was 2003 symposium, a Russian scientist came from Russia and brought books on their Amesty, which is also a Bigfoot creature. And I met Heath, who was a publisher of a book called The Yowie in Australia. So they have a creature in Australia that's similar to the Bigfoot. I don't think there is one missing link, right? Um, we, I think we still are apes. We ha are primates. We are, we are very, very closely related to the chimpanzee. Um, some biologists consider us to be the third chimpanzee, you know. Um, we think we're very special, you know, and different and unique because our civilization has dominated the world, but uh, we are animals and we did evolve naturally. Much of the evidence surrounding Bigfoot's existence is surprising, and not just by the nature of the facts themselves, but by the amazing credibility of their authors. In July of 2000, Dr. Matthew Johnson was hiking with his family in a national park when he was suddenly overcome by the feeling that he was being followed. I was looking down the slope to try to see if I could see what it might be that was, you know, paralleling us. Keep in mind, the slope of the mountain is like this. I'm up here. My family's about 50, 60 feet over here down on the trail. So I'm, I'm looking, all of a sudden I see movement out of the left corner of my eye. And I turn and I look and down slope is when I saw Bigfoot walk off the pages of myth and legend into reality. I was up the mountain, up the slope behind a natural blind. It couldn't see me. When I saw that, everything I knew about the outdoors, grew up in Oregon, lived in Alaska for 20 years, everything I knew, hiking, camping, fishing, a little bit of hunting, came crashing down. I literally felt my brain crash, reboot, and then I had some real protective instincts kick in. You know, that was my family down there. I ran down through the brush and trees, avoided eye contact because the only thing I knew what to do was in Alaska with the grizzly bear, you don't do the eye contact thing because they'll see it as a challenge. So I avoided the eye contact, hit the trail, ran up to my wife and kids and said, let's go, let's go, move. And they're like, you know, what's your problem? I go, now, move. And they're like, okay. So I move them up the trail a couple hundred yards around a switchback, another 100 yards. I'm not seeing anything, I'm not hearing anything, I'm not smelling anything. I sit the kids down on a log and I give them some water. I pull my wife aside and I said, you're not gonna believe what I saw. And she said, what? And I said, I saw Bigfoot. And she said, I believe you. Immediately after this encounter, Dr. Johnson told his story to a park ranger who had no trouble believing it. But Matthew Johnson's troubling testimony is not the only one to be marked with a seal of credibility. Bob Schmalzbach is a retired Silicon Valley engineer and the former president of the town of Happy Camp's Chamber of Commerce. 
He's also a Bigfoot guru, having spent seven years examining the possible evidence for its existence in collaboration with the University of Oxford. He operates a website compiling Bigfoot research. All over this place, we have sightings on a pretty, not a routine basis. I have seen them using thermal imagers. I've seen them using night vision. I've been with people that saw them that I was, because I'm usually the one taking pictures and whatnot, I wasn't uh, fortunate enough to see them. I've had them photographed, watching me, photographing footprints, uh, things like that, but because uh, we always went out in a team and I had my duties and everybody else had theirs. This beach on the other side of Highway 96 is called China Point or China Flat. And it turns out that now that I've been here and got to talk to people here, there have probably been 15 or 20 sightings at this point. If you stop here for a second and just listen, all you can hear is the river. You don't hear cars, you don't hear trains, you don't hear buses, you just hear the river. So uh, it's a unique place. Bob returns to the exact spot where Bigfoot has repeatedly been surprised trying to cross a road. You can see the 25, this is a 25 mile an hour sign. You could see that from where it happened. So between it and that guardrail is where it happened. Whatever it was came up from down there by the river, stepped right over this, took two steps, two or three steps across this hill, and within just a, a 30 seconds, it was to the top of that. Up at the top of that edge, uh, ridge, you see the, all the shorter trees? Those were not there. And that person said they heard rustling up there, they thought it was a deer, looked up there, and this thing was looking up, standing there at the edge, looking down at her. And when it turned to walk away, she could see the soles of its feet, and they were lighter colored. This experience, and seeing this for the first time myself, is why I got started investigating Bigfoot, because before then I thought it was a novelty and kind of interesting, but when I saw the physical evidence that supported the eyewitness reports here, I knew there had to be something more to it, so I went on the road to find out. Bob found footprints on top of this hill, which he believes supports the testimony of eyewitnesses who claim to have seen something that night. After reviewing the hill, he considers it highly unlikely that a normal human could ascend so steep a slope. The Bigfoot legend casts a wide shadow over Willow Creek. Fingerprints taken in the region and thought to belong to a beast are so numerous that a special annex was constructed for them in the China Flat Museum. In the Bigfoot room is predominantly casts from, from uh, people that have taken tracks, like Al Hodgson, who's curator here, longtime friend of John Green, who was the er one of the early writers about Bigfoot. And, uh, other, other people locally that over the years have had seen casts where they've taken a cast and brought in. And there's also uh, some of the first articles written in the newspapers about having seen tracks, what were they, and that sort of thing. And it, it's just grown from there. Al Hodgson, um, who gave me this cast, he signed the back of it here. He, he's still alive here, just up on the hill. Um, they found these tracks, and they just happened to, to know a fellow named Bob Titmus, who is a taxidermist in uh, Anderson over by Reading here on Highway 5. Uh, and he had taught Jerry Crew how to make plaster casts. So Jerry Crew uh, is seen in a photo in the Ti Humble Times newspaper holding the track like this, you know. And that really made a big impression on just about everybody. So it hit the AP Newswire, and it went out all across the world. 
What um, it's important to say is that people just assume that you can make a plywood cut out of a Bigfoot and go around tromping around and make a bunch of footprints that are going to fool somebody. If you have bigger feet on your feet than your actual feet, then that's like snowshoes. Why would people ever have snowshoes? So that they don't sink into the snow. Well, in the same way, if you're going to be a human-sized person with some great big feet, you're not going to sink in even to fairly soft mud. So if you've got feet like that, a number of things aren't going to change. Your weight isn't going to change. Your stride length isn't going to change. In fact, if anything, it's going to get shorter because you're so clumsy carrying these clumping things. But just as important, your the way a plywood foot hits the ground is not the way that a real foot hits the ground. Real feet have toe position changes. When real feet hit the ground, if this is a foot, as they move forward and they made a break right there at the toes, there's a little bit of ridge of dirt pushed back. There's all kinds of dynamic things that happen with a real foot, but not with some plywood thing. Richard Stepp is a professor of physics at the Humboldt University and one of the few scientists who dares to publicly admit that a Bigfoot-like creature could exist. He cites Grover Krantz, the famous anthropologist who died in 2002 and was known for his work on Bigfoot. After analyzing a slew of foot imprints, Krantz believed that some of them were genuine. Some footage captured in 1967 during the filming of a movie by Roger Patterson and Robert Gimlin provides another disturbing piece of Bigfoot evidence. Patterson and Gimlin filmed themselves on the sandbar, you know? Uh, so they had uh, switched, the, when they got to fi Bigfoot on film, the camera roll actually ended, and that's when you see the creature walking away in the distance. It just ends. Unfortunately, they couldn't follow it and get more footage of it. They um, had to go on, he went under a tarp, you know, and switched the camera roll with a new roll of film. You know, a lot of people want to make Bigfoot into like some kind of big, glorious, fascinating, monstrous legend, you know, but uh, if the truth is just a mundane, ordinary thing, uh, that's more valuable to me than some big, tall tale. Were you to walk up the stream here, you'd have to go about 25, 30 miles to get into the heart of the Bluff Creek watershed and the area where the film was shot, the, the famous uh, footprint finds and stuff. People talk about it wherever you go. And the history of it is just everywhere out in the landscape here, if you study it at all, you know. Um, I can't help it because people tell me, you know, down at Aikens Creek, they found a footprint a couple years ago. And so people come in with their photographs of footprints and uh, uh, shadows in the woods that they think are Bigfoot. Many people consider this video captured at Bluff Creek to be definitive proof of the existence of Bigfoot. But the nature of the creature in the video remains an unsolved mystery. The family of one of the filmmakers, Robert Gimlin, tightly controls the film itself. But despite this restriction, the image in the center of the controversy can be found all over the internet. But the image is of extremely low quality. We tried to reduce the blur to better analyze it and perhaps get a sense of what really happened that day. But with the original version of the film unavailable, questions remained unanswered. Well, this is the, um, this is an image, the most famous one from the Patterson-Gimlin film from 1967 up in Bluff Creek. And uh, this was taken from a 50 megabyte uh, scan from a transparency that was taken from the original film. Most people who've seen the film and dismiss it as blurry, grainy, um, don't realize that there is this kind of quality of imagery. Um, if you can see this, uh, uh, if we could just find that original film or get a published version of this out there, I think it would convince a lot more people.
You don't see like zippers and seams and baggy uh, flaps and, and fake fur. You see something that looks like muscles are moving under the skin. Um, you see uh, what appears to be the motion of the hands and the toes and the face and the breasts on the front of the creature. A man named Bob Hieronymus later claimed to have worn a monkey suit for the making of the film, but Patterson and Gimlin have always maintained that the scene filmed in 1967 was genuine. It looks pretty darn realistic. Um, it's, uh, it's still not enough to prove that the creature is real. You know, for every person that believes that that's a real Bigfoot, there will be another who says that just looks like a man in an ape suit. I've had people come into the museum, two gentlemen from who knows where, dressed up in business suits, take one look at the picture of Patterson, which is on our wall in, as you come in the door, and one said to the other one, oh, you can see the face zippered on, and it's a guy in a costume. Well, if you look quickly at Patterson's film, it is a female Bigfoot. It is not a guy in a costume. Even Hollywood said at the time that Patterson filmed in 67, that costume could not have been manufactured. Well, uh, you know, I think the proof would be finding a body of one. Uh, hopefully, you know, not uh, hunted down and killed, but something um, found along the highway, a, a, a piece of a body. Uh, there's these attempts now with genetics to prove it through DNA. Now, some people say that DNA evidence would, would suffice, but really, there's been no DNA evidence uh, of it. Uh, the people have submitted uh, hair fibers and all kinds of different things. Uh, there was recently a study of uh, published uh, online by a veterinarian named Ketchum, who said, uh, you know, we, we have this DNA evidence, and all she actually discovered was that there was genetic material of people, and then there were anomalies but that anomalies does not prove there's Bigfoot. It just means that she found anomalies. You can find anomalies in all kinds of genetic material. Genetic analyses have been conducted on all kinds of materials attributed to a Bigfoot, but the conclusions usually reveal them to have come from bears or porcupines. Dr. Johnson still spends most of his time devoted to his Bigfoot passion, and to his mind, it has paid off. I put in about 10 years of being a diehard aggressive researcher with all the high tech equipment and never having any visuals or interactions. Well, there was a group of people out there in the Bigfoot world who were suggesting habituation. Popularized by primatologist Jane Goodall, habituation is a method of study that involves acclimating the animals to a human presence. You know, go out and do the Dr. Jane Goodall thing, hanging out with the chimps, right? Well, I did that in this new area. It took them five years before they took food from my gifting bowls. Dr. Johnson claims that this method enabled him to develop a close rapport with the mysterious creatures. Yesterday morning, I knew I was gonna be leaving to come here and, and film and I had to pack up camp. And so I walked away to where the, from the base camp to where the main bedding area is. And I stood on the flat area above where the main bedding area goes, it slopes, it's on the slope down the mountainside. And I stood about 70 feet back from the crest of where it slopes down. And I stood there for a good half hour. And I sang some songs, whistled a couple tunes, and just kind of stayed there. And then I heard crack, crunch, crack, crunch, and Daddy walked up the hillside, came over the crest. He stood there. He looked at me. Then he looked down at my little dog on the ground. Then he looked back up at me. And then he turned around and walked back down the mountainside. Whether credible or not, the many hypotheses and theories surrounding Bigfoot raise more questions than they answer. 
For some, the question to ask is not whether or not the witnesses saw something abnormal, but rather, what did they see? Everybody loves a good myth, and especially myths that are the best myths and the best uh, science fiction is always those stories that are just a half a step away from reality. The ones that are truly outrageous, those are really difficult to truly believe. You can't sink your, your thinking behind that because it's just too outrageous. People uh, love stories and they love to believe in those stories. So I'm just kind of interested in the, in the whole phenomenon, mostly about why people believe what they do. And, uh, and in particular, this one, it seems to be so unbelievable to me. Uh, Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and there is no evidence, but there are lots of extraordinary claims. You know, the, the nature of human perception is so uh, fluid that uh, you have to question everything that people say. You know, you can't even get a a straightforward answer about a crime or a car accident. You know, some people will say the guy had a red shirt on, some say he had a green shirt on, and the memory is, is, is not reliable all the time. Nonetheless, I think you can, you can still construct a possible uh, creature out of these, these sightings. Um, you have to be careful not to just be uh, creating your own myth, you know, you're creating your own new legend. You want to be an honest investigator and, and hopefully um, not a deluded uh, myth maker. Myths and science fiction that's only a half a step from reality, it's like, okay, I can kind of get into that. And Bigfoot is the perfect myth. Because, yeah, at one time, there were many species of humans running around. And some of them were big and hairy and stood really tall. Gigantopithecus that's been found in Africa, you know, which presumably people think these things are, fits the mold, okay? So it's like, okay, well, this creature did exist in the past on the planet, so maybe they could still be here. And so there is a lot of forest here that has been untouched. And so, there's this idea that, well, if it's been unex unexplored, supposedly, <laughs> that could be where Bigfoot is. But the area is not empty of humans. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of logging roads. Uh, the forest here provides a, a continuous source of timber. There's a lot of people that make a, a living working in these mountains, working in these forests, and they're all over the place, and the roads go all over the place, and there's, there's people out there all the time and have been for a very long time. Um, I know there's a natural tendency that humans have to see these kinds of forms out in the woods, you know, boogeyman or whatever strange ghostly forms. Uh, we tend to see ourselves out in the woods, especially in the dark when we're scared at night, you know. Uh, that's a common thing that goes back to childhood and the monster under your bed or whatever. Well, Bigfoot is a fun story. It's mis it's mysterious, and when you're out in the woods and it's dark and the stars are out and you're with your friends around the campfire and you start telling stories, you think, wow, how amazing would it be for there to be this creature out here around us? And people love that. You know, they love the legendary stories. Anyone who works in the woods will always tell you that there are certain times, you know, that the hair on the back of your neck will stand up, uh, that you think you see something out of the corner of your eye. And we're animals ourselves as much as people don't want to admit that. And so um, we have survival skills that are deep inside our psyches. It, it, it helped us survive all of these many hundreds of thousands of years. And so when you move around in the woods, of course, sometimes you're like, what was that? I heard something. Especially if you're not used to working in or living in this environment and you're visiting, uh, you're already off balance. You are already not seeing the things that you're normally used to seeing. And so you don't know what the triggers are to keep yourself safe. And so your, your imagination will be really heightened to, to keep you safe. And so every little clue that happens out there, a snapping twig, a, a a tree branch, you know, moving in the wind. Um, and then, of course, the large animals that we do have living around here, the bears, uh, the elk, the deer, uh, they make sounds. All of that will contribute to the fact that, wow, maybe I saw something. 
and off your mind goes to the races, you know, and especially with this pervasive myth of this large, hairy animal, you know, stomping around out there, you're, well, I mean, that was Bigfoot. <laughs> so my coworkers and I have said, oh yeah, that was a Bigfoot day. Yeah, definitely, you know, saw something out there. Like Keith Benson, many people flatly refuse to believe that a half-man, half-ape creature could be lurking in the forests of the region. And the many hoaxes only hurt. There have been a number of people who have uh, created hoaxes that provided so-called evidence for Bigfoot, you know, the, uh, the footsteps in the, in the mud and, uh, and sightings and the, and, and the film of the guy in the monkey suit uh, walking around. It has been proven that some of the footprints were deliberately faked. Wilbur Wallace, the supervisor of the famous Bluff Creek site, fabricated the footprints found here, according to denunciations made by his nephew. His form of tracks that he had um, made with these wooden footprint stompers uh, started to appear. And they have a much different appearance. You know, they're more hourglass shaped and they have strange, uh, awkward appearance. Uh, those started popping up all over the place. And, and a lot of these local construction workers and foresters, they like to play jokes on outsiders, you know, uh, anyone out there in the bigger world. Well, it was very funny, I think, for them to, to get them to come all the way from Canada uh, and look at fake footprints. I think one of the aspects of the Bigfoot story is how many hoaxes there have been and uh, how easily it is to get Bigfoot believers to believe in the hoaxes. Some of the tracks that you find just look ludicrous, uh, ridiculous, and a lot of them are probably from bears or, you know, they're just strange shapes in the ground. People have said they found prints and um, it's been shown that they're bear prints. They're able to track it back to another animal, test the DNA, find out that it belongs to a different animal, one that we know existing. I mean, you find other ones that, I mean, what can you make of them like this? This is claimed to be a juvenile Bigfoot track. Um, a lot of people think, well, Bigfoot is, is so human that uh, when they see f human footprints in the mud, they think, well, this could be a Bigfoot track. And so then you get to the point where you, how do you know the difference at all, right? Any. Anything that humans do could be claimed to be Bigfoot, you know. Uh, it's very problematic, especially when people really want badly to see Bigfoot or to prove Bigfoot. I think it, it, it lends towards the bending of evidence and interpreting things in favor of one's favorite hypothesis. Keith Benson is a wildlife biologist with enormous experience dealing with rare animal species. If Bigfoot really inhabits the forests of Northern California, nobody is better placed than him to discover it. These are presumably really large animals. So they're maybe six, seven, eight feet tall. If you figured out the weight, maybe five, 600 pounds, really large animal. They should leave a really large impact on the environment that we can detect where they're feeding, where they're uh, bedding down, where they're, you know, wherever going through their, their daily lives. You know, these things are super duper long lived and they only mate every hundred years, or it's really unlikely that they could survive, or we're seeing the very last of them are about to go extinct. And then in my own profession, um, there's a number of endangered species that live in this area. And especially with the advent of, of new technology, we are detecting increasingly rare animals pretty easily. Um, even small carnivores that are only, you know, a foot or two long, only weigh a few pounds, and there's less than 100 of these things. And we're able to detect them because we use photo traps and detection uh, gear that allows us to, to find these extremely rare animals. In none of those surveys, of which there have been hundreds in this region, have we ever picked up a Bigfoot sighting in any of our studies. Never, never. And so it's like, if I can, if I can find an animal of which there's only less than 100, they are only a couple feet long, and they exist in this area of thousands of square miles, if I can find them, why can't I find an eight foot tall, 700 pound primate?
But despite all of the evidence, all of the proven hoaxes, vast numbers of people continue to believe, fueling the legend. Uh, the more I look into it, the more convinced I become, or at least the more convinced I am that all of the theories of the hoax um, are wrong. And you have to look at it, I think, as a broader picture. Almost everybody in every state in the union has had an episode of one kind or another of Bigfoot. The fellow who claims to be the man in the Bigfoot suit doesn't even know how to describe how to get to that film site, which is, you know, like I said, uh, some 60 miles off into the backwoods on rugged dirt roads. And he, he, his description of the area sounds more like six miles off the highway. Uh, it's, not, it's not convincing. There was no way that you could absolutely get in there, except like Patterson and Gimlin, who went in on horseback. For others, the Patterson and Gimlin film has serious credibility issues, and no other image of Bigfoot has been captured since the day of that fateful shooting over 50 years ago. In science, it'd be really hard to dispute a single data point. You can't. And all you can do is go, OK, well, you made an observation. Great. Let's go see if we can do that again and again and again and again and get a solid base of evidence to, to prove the existence uh, of this animal. The ultimate problem with the the film clip is again, like I said, we haven't gotten other images in decade after decade of thousands and thousands of people running around out there trying to find more evidence of Bigfoot. While many doubt the existence of Bigfoot, the believers have come to romanticize their faith, associating it with nature and freedom of spirit. Bigfoot kind of represents the end of civilization too, you know, the, the thing that exists outside of it and despite it and can never be found by it, right? So it's kind of appropriate to the Bigfoot legend out here too. All summer long, there's groups of people going back up in the woods back there looking for Bigfoot, mostly just totally ordinary people. You would not know them from Adam or Eve or anybody, Joe Sixpack or whatever, you know. They're usually married with kids and jobs. And most of these people that come out here on these expeditions, this is like their big adventure. It's a, you know, uh, a vacation. And they want to experience something different. 90% of the people, I would say, come and want to go to Bluff Creek where Patterson filmed. So starting in the beginning of May, when we have sunshine clear through summer, it's a steady procession up to, up to Bluff Creek and to where Patterson filmed or where they think Patterson filmed. You know, through the years, we had people call up and say, we're coming from Ohio, and how big a bore of a rifle do I need to shoot this thing? How big is it? And uh, so we've had uh, every spectrum. I've had uh, people visit. I had a young man and his wife come on their uh, anniversary from Pennsylvania, where they had saved the money to come. He had a big foot tattoo that went from his knee to the top of his hip, and he had thought about Bigfoot all his life from his youth and could hardly wait to get here and to go out to Bluff Creek and to explore that area and to look for Bigfoot. While the real Bigfoot continues to elude his admirers, his image is everywhere in the village of Willow Creek, from storefronts to park entrances, and he is the reluctant star of annual festivals. Despite his shy nature, it has not prevented him from appearing on all kinds of merchandise. The biggest festival or parade centered around Bigfoot would be the one in Willow Creek. It's Bigfoot Days. It just happened a few weeks ago uh, for this year. And you have people dressing up as Bigfoot, and you have, I mean, half the town is dressed as Bigfoot. So 
some of the parades, we'll have a dozen Bigfoot marching in the parade, representing casinos and representing businesses, and representing bands. So uh, Bigfoot has been quite a phenomenon in this community. I've uh, twice been the Grand Marshal of Bigfoot Days Parade, so, so I'm certainly a party to enjoying Bigfoot. Bigfoot is a mascot for Willow Creek. If you go to the town, you'll see at least three or four large carved wooden statues of Bigfoot. Uh, there's a couple businesses named after Bigfoot. There's Bigfoot rafting. Uh, there's Bigfoot books, obviously. Uh, there is four, there are four or five big murals in town. I think it's really fun to think that there's some big, hairy, human-like thing running around out there. Uh, I mean, what a wonderful story that is. Um, and that, I know, makes people happy. It gives them joy that there's this mystery out there. Wow, there's this, this extraordinary other species of human wandering around out there. It gives people hope. It gives them happiness. It's a wonderful sense of mystery. Um, that, you know, we haven't conquered every single square inch of the planet. There's still really wild, really weird things out there. All of that helps to propel the myth. Well, because I've been in these woods for a good part of my life, and I hunt, and I fish, and I travel, and, uh, and I, I see all of the animals that are out in these woods. Uh, if, if there were a, a, a Bigfoot, this would be the place for him to be. He certainly could exist and, uh, and live a uh, rather carefree life uh, with, without being inhibited by man, because uh, this is an immense country, and uh, it's a steep, rugged country, and for somebody that wants to hide out, this is the place to do it. This is the quintessential summer vacation for BC residents. The Okanagan Valley is located in the southern interior of British Columbia. It features a bit of everything, lakes, rolling hills, high mountains, valleys, and desert within its 21,000 square kilometers or 8,000 square miles. We're situated in a valley, so there's a lot of land that we can, you know, explore. Despite its huge size, the Okanagan has only about 350,000 full-time inhabitants. But in summer, that number swells with more than one and a half million tourists. People come here because it's the best weather in all of Canada. End of June until the end of August, the average temperature was anywhere from 28 to 30 degrees Celsius every day of the week. I mean, you just can't beat it. Dramatically beautiful natural surroundings. We have a very thriving agricultural scene. The apple orchards, the peaches, the pears. For people who love food and wine, this is the location. The wine region has just gotten totally insane. The wine is some of the best you'll ever find in the world. Like it's becoming you know, the wine region of, of the north. Besides the wine and the fresh fruit, Mother Nature's other gift to the region is Lake Okanagan. First and foremost is, is the lake. The lake is very apparent, it's very beautiful, it's, it's very large, uh, provides a lot of recreational activities. Experts can't agree on the origin of the meaning of the word Okanagan. Some Aboriginal people say it's actually several words, one of which means big head, that might explain why some believe this lake is home to more than just water sports. This long, deep, prehistoric lake may be the home of something big, mysterious, frightening, something lying in wait below the surface. Recorded sightings date back to the 19th century. Native people's accounts go back even earlier, 
Every report confirms there is a sea monster in Lake Okanagan. Those who see it say it's heart-stopping. Look, it's rotating in the water. It's moving. I see three humps. Dad, get pictures! This is the beginning of evolution, from shark to, to dinosaur. And this creature is still alive. It's meant to survive. It can swim, it can fly, it can breathe underwater, it can walk on land, it has, it, it has ability to hide. It's unbelievable. If it doesn't look like a fish, it doesn't look like a snake, it's sometimes 25 feet long, 30 feet long. It tends to have a greenish color is what people talk about. And it has uh, the face, or the history is that it has the face of a horse. This huge black thing came out of the water probably 40 or 50 feet away. The slimy, kind of shiny, like three, four feet out of the water and big. I mean, this is not a fish. Lake Okanagan covers an area of 350 square kilometers or 135 square miles. The lake is 110 kilometers or 69 miles long and has a maximum depth of 242 meters, that's about 800 feet. That's more than enough natural habitat to support a strange creature with an even stranger name. What is Ogopogo? I mean, it's, we have to admit, it is a, it is kind of a cute name with all the O's in it, almost like Mississippi, but it's Ogopogo. Ogopogo has never been caught, but people have been catching glimpses of the beast for a very long time. My father had seen it himself. Oh, yes, he had seen it himself. Uh, I have, my grandmother has told me stories. I believe that it's possible that there could be something like an Ogopogo in our lake. It really varies what people talk about. Sometimes people don't see the animal at all. What they see is a strange, you know, spout in the water or a strange movement in the lake. I would love to see it. I look for it all the time. Ogopogo has been uh, like almost this mythical creature that, uh, you know, that everybody is just fascinated with. Uh, as a newspaper man, I mean, you almost hate to say it, it sells newspapers. Uh, if I hear about a sighting of Ogopogo, it goes front page every single time. My name is Alan Gartrell. I've lived in Penticton since 1944. I have seen the beast. I'll tell you, I was up in Naramata for coffee at Ray Piper's place. It was February the 18th, 1984. There was no wind. The lake was like glass. And he looked out on the lake and he said, who's the idiot out there with the with a speedboat this time of the year. And I looked at it and I said, it's not a speedboat. I said, that's a head out of the water. It's got a big long neck on it, probably about 14, 16 foot neck on it. I started looking at it with my binoculars and when I started looking, it dove and it thrust with all four flippers. I went away down in the bottom of the lake did a circle down there and came up right up the center and took fish off just about 10 feet from the top of the water. It did it 17 times for us. We had a real picture show in front of us and we did not have a camera. Just by what I saw, it looked like it had the power of two workhorses. It's real strong. In my books, it has to weigh probably 1,500 pounds. It's big. It's a 12 or 13 foot body on it. Its flippers have to be at least six feet long. Nobody gets a chance to see something like that. I took my brother-in-law and my daughter down the beach in kayaks, 2009. So I do a U-turn uh, at this underwater ledge, and uh, 
the water's a little bit stirred up, but there's this orange-like creature under my kayak, as big as my 18-foot kayak. And it's as wide as long. And, and, and I keep paddling, because I was afraid. It was right there. I have a picture of me uh, in a kayak, and beyond me is, is an object surfacing just, uh, just a kilometer down the beach. And this object, in, by scanning in the negative, looked like some kind of a, a alligator coming out of the water, uh, just sort of with its mouth open. I, I, I was very afraid. When I had my first sighting in 78, I, at that point in time, I was a, I was a skeptic, I, I'll have to admit. I didn't believe in Ogopogo. I was going to work. I lived on the west side at the time, and I was coming down the west side of the bridge. And as I'm going across the bridge to Kelowna, to the east, I look over, and couldn't believe there was something in the water, and it was traveling parallel to the bridge. So I stopped my car. I stopped my car, put the four-way flashers on, and of course there was traffic coming down the hill behind me. They all came and parked behind me. I get out over the railing, and what I'm seeing is three black humps moving parallel with the bridge towards Kelowna with what looked to me like a head going in and out of the water in the front. And I looked down, I looked to my right, and there had to be 40 people seeing the same thing with the cars all backed up. So anyway, I was all excited, and then it disappeared. Saw it for about 30 seconds. Bill Stechiak is among hundreds of eyewitnesses who include the earliest European settlers that arrived in the Okanagan Valley in 1811. But the first reports of a lake monster go back much further. Native peoples left behind many pictographs and oral histories of their first-hand experiences. What I find fascinating is the pictographs. Uh, that were drawn by the First Nations peoples. They obviously saw the same thing that people are seeing today and wanted to portray something that was so unusual, so fascinating to them that they wanted to document it. I mean, it's the equivalent to us going out and shooting video or shooting still photographs. White Haskell Hulk, he squeezed Jordan Kobo, couldn't tell Saktu Khanut. Uh, we have always referred to the Ogopogo as Nkhaka'it, which translates to the spirit of the lake. Our people know that there's more out there than just a lake. There's something in there that's, that's really deep and really meaningful to who we are as a people. Native elders have passed down stories about nomadic tribes offering sage and tobacco to Hoktik, the monster, in exchange for permission to cross the lake during their seasonal migrations. In return, Hoktik would calm the water for their safe passage. But one day, according to the legend, a tribal chief ignored the lake creature and refused to make the ritual offering. That had not been done, and so, and therefore, the lake really started, went from a nice, calm, peaceful setting to a really alive, really kind of daunting, scary lake. Uh, the waves can get rather high for being an inland lake, um, and it was really dark, really cold, and Chief Kikinsula instructed his people to let go of the horses to uh, get across the lake as, as quickly as possible because there was something in the water that was not uh, being respected at the time. And as they were doing that, they heard the horses weaning. Um, some of the horses ended up going underwater, and they made it across the lake, but the horses had scars um, it looked like giant claw marks on their, the torsos of their bodies. Uh, some had bite marks in their bodies. When the first settlers arrived, you have to remember what the Okanagan was like. It was basically wild country. It was like what you would find if you went in, into northern British Columbia right now. So that when settlers came here, I mean, they were living right at the edge of the big forest. They had no idea what was here, what wasn't here, and stories about a lake creature that they got from the, uh, from the First Nations people probably scared the bejesus out of them. 
They believed the native stories and there were many um, frightful occurrences, many sightings. They actually posted armed guards on the uh, shores of Okanagan Lake. Used to patrol the beaches with their muskets uh, to protect their families, or they tried to capture it by running hooks out into the lake. I mean, it's the most incredible thing. These are tough people. I mean, hello, you know. So they must have seen something, and they, and they were very, very upset. They didn't know what to think, uh, but from the First Nations people, they had to take this as, as a serious threat. Locals and legends claim that a mysterious monster has been lurking in the depths of Lake Okanagan for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. But how did it get here? What is it? And how has it managed to survive all this time without ever being captured? This lake has a prehistoric history, and uh, 10,000 years ago, it was quite a bit higher and longer than it is now, so all of this would have been underwater. So the theory is, is that many years ago, when this was open to the sea, uh, Ogopogo uh, came up and got into Okanagan Lake, chasing the salmon. When the glacier receded, it left behind a long, deep and narrow valley that filled with water as the ice melted. It gradually cut off access from the lake to the sea. Bill Stechuk believes Ogopogo is a prehistoric animal that became trapped in the lake. Got landlocked here and then, uh, kind of lived here and kind of adapted to where he was. Species are either well adapted to an environment, in which case they persist, or they're not, and they die. They wow. become extinct. One animal which proves the theory that some species can adapt to a radically different environment is the kokanee salmon, found only in Lake Okanagan and its tributaries. It's a landlocked salmon, and they still spawn in the uh, creeks in the area, along the shorelines. It's a very interesting phenomenon because, of course, these fish came from the sockeye that used to be able to make it out to the ocean. So there is that question. Could there be something um, in the water that we don't know about? It's a very deep lake. About 100 million years ago, the Plesiosaurus, a marine dinosaur with a long neck, flippers, and a stubby tail, lived in what is now the Pacific Ocean off the west coast of North America. Descriptions of Ogopogo bear an uncanny resemblance to the prehistoric Plesiosaurus. But there are other theories also. Some would say it's a very old species, in other words, one that was thought to be extinct, uh, but turned out not to be. And others would say Ogopogo and Loch Ness monsters were a new species in the sense that it was one un unknown to science. There's all kinds of species being found all the time, new ones, probably every week all over the world. And, you know, why couldn't something live here in the lake? Why couldn't the species in this body of water that's 90 miles long, it's incredible, it's four, it's two and a half miles wide. It's one of the deepest lakes in North America. Why couldn't something live here that hasn't been found? By restricting their search for Ogopogo only to the lake itself, hunters might be missing a creature that is living literally right under their feet. The Western perspective of Ogopogo, and I, and I fall victim to this all the time, is that because it's such a large creature that it, it's a male, they refer to Ogopogo as he all the time, and I, I definitely fall victim to that as well. Um, but our people tell stories of seeing multiple Ogopogos, which means that there has to be, you know, Science proves it has to be a male and female to, to uh, recreate more Ogopogos or more Nkaka'i. Um, and there's stories of the Ogopogo being on, on beaches and even appendages to, to walk on the land with. Well, this is Pebble Beach. This is West Kelowna. Just down the beach is beach land. Andrew Bennett has developed a theory about how Ogopogo's been able to survive here for centuries. 
place yet. In the late 90s, he was leading a tour of native pictographs with a local Boy Scout troop when a small, unusual-looking salamander crossed their trail. When I saw this creature running uh, from the Boy Scouts, it was very timid and darted out of, out of view very fast. It did not fit any description or any picture that I was ever, ever able to find. My, my thought is it is not a salamander. This is really uh, the part of the, the stage of this creature to, to be born on land and then go back into the water. Uh, life cycle. Andrew believes they had stumbled upon a newborn Ogopogo that day, heading towards the water, like young turtles do soon after they hatch. This encounter piqued his curiosity. If Ogopogo has a nearby nest, he'll try to find it. Just was going over in my mind, there must be some more, some more to this spot. A few weeks later, Andrew Bennett returns to the same location, this time armed with a camera and determined to record some hard evidence. Bennett takes a series of photos he says proves Ogopogo laid a nest here. He keeps his distance so that he doesn't disturb the site or scare away the creature. He also photographs the nearby shoreline where Ogopogo likely exits and enters the lake. Uh, I took pictures, underwater pictures, what looked like logs, and, and then I was going through my pictures and, and uh, realizing, oh, maybe there's something more to it. And then I realized that this was not a log, this was a creature, it had a, a flipper. Obviously, that looked like Ogopogo. It, it was long, it was only maybe a foot wide and maybe 18 feet long, and, uh, and a closer examination, you can see an eye and a lizard head and a tongue sticking out. I didn't know before that it was so lizard-like, but anyway, that's what, what seemed to come out in the pictures. Later, Bennett enlarges his high-resolution photos and discovers what he believes is evidence of newly hatched Ogopogos, like this one. And this one, a single unhatched egg on a pile of debris. There's an egg and a creature coming out of it, still hatching, and, and then there's all these young ones all around it, all very well camouflaged. Its orange color is hid by the orange leaves in the crevice. It's really, really good camouflage. Bennett concludes that Ogopogos are masters of disguise. You would swear it was a log. A and you would see these pictures, you would swear they're logs, but they really aren't. There, there's an eye, there's a nostril, there's a tongue sticking out. There, there's, there, there's details that just aren't in logs. Uh, this camouflage has evolved over millions of years and, and it, it is almost perfect. It just can sit there. Even a shark has a hard time sitting in one place uh, for more than half an hour, but this creature can sit there for hours and, and just pretend it's a log. And, and then the, the, uh, the part of it that tells you that it's not a log is you, if you go back there, the log is gone. Like some of his other photos of driftwood and logs, Bennett believes this one is unmistakably Ogopogo on the move. Uh, and, and this is its home. This is where it, it lays, hatches eggs up here and in the water. It, it lives here. So last four or five years, I think, in many pictures of this area, and uh, I'm convinced this is the home of Ogopogo. Bennett's photos lead him to one startling conclusion. Ogopogo isn't one animal. There's an entire species thriving in Lake Okanagan. Uh, a few years ago, I took a picture of the head peeping out of a cave on the bottom of the lake, about 14 feet under. And it looks just like Ogopogo. Skeptics see another interpretation in Bennett's photos. There's lots of trees around Lake Okanagan. Floating and sunken logs are commonplace. One of the first reports to mistake a drifting log for a monster dates back 140 years. A Mrs. Susan Allison had a sighting and she saw this object which she thought was a pine trunk, a, a, a tree trunk, but then she saw it was moving against the wind. Nevertheless, Bennett is convinced some moving objects are the creature cruising on the surface, perhaps on the hunt. Any kind of dinosaur-like creature that has lived that long can obviously 
quickly destroy a person. So uh, I did not want to experiment by lifting it up. Um, it, it, this seemed too dangerous. And even although it, it has its, its advantage in its, in its camouflage, my fear is uh, that, that the, eventually uh, the creature will be hunted and that would not be my wish. My wish is, is that, that the species at risk would identify the creature and then protect it. Eyewitnesses, fuzzy photographs, and a handful of theories, but no corpse has turned up on the shores of Lake Okanagan. Without that, Ogopogo the lake monster remains a myth. The more recent pictures that you see, none of those pictures really have been scientifically verified as Ogopogo, but there is definitely, you know, those, those are pictures of the lake that people don't take every day and don't see every day, so. Bill Stechuk never forgot the time he spotted Ogopogo back in 1978. It was so intense that he decides to recreate that day in a short film. What we were doing is we were reenacting what my first sighting in 1978. And of course, I was a little younger then, so my son played me. Incredibly, Stechak doesn't have to restage the main event. And out of the blue, something appears in the lake. Look, the three humps. One, two, three. You mean those glistening wave? That is not a wave. You think, I mean, what are the chances? You know, it's like, it's so rare to see Ogopogo, and he shows up for a film crew. And we had all the extras there, the film crew. We had 14 people there. It wasn't one person who saw this. 14 people. Look at it move. And everybody starts screaming, and they're turning the television cameras towards it. Look, it's rotating in the water. It's moving. I see three humps. Whoa, wait a minute. Are you filming this? And it, the most incredible part of it is nobody is acting in this. They're looking at this, and we've got the audio, and it's the most incredible audio you've ever heard. Really, really good stuff. I don't know what to say other than my breath was taken away. I started freaking out, basically. <laughs> Dad, get pictures! Hello. <laughs> there was obviously something there that wasn't natural, that wasn't quite proof, but was so tantalizing as to, you know, as to make the day, make the week, make the production for that film crew. We saw something. Convinced that what he filmed was the lake monster, in 1999, Stechuk assembles a research team and spends three weeks on the lake looking for scientific evidence. It was great. We had 75 people involved. We spent three weeks on the lake, and we got some really good results. With a houseboat, a team of divers, sonar, underwater submersibles, and cameras, Stechak conducts the most intense scientific expedition ever assembled. The investigation begins here at Rattlesnake Island and Squally Point. Native legends point to this area as the Ogopogo hotspot. It's just a small island that the First Nations used for their sacrifices to Ogopogo. And uh, I guess at one time they had a lot of rattlesnakes on it, so <laughs> that's why he got its name. Divers go down to a depth of 100 feet looking for a cave and signs of the beast. And that's where you got these sheer drop off, these sheer walls that go down like two, 300 feet, which is just incredible. This cave was at 100 feet down. It was about 14 feet wide, and there was actual colder water coming out of the cave into the lake from some kind of underground spring or whatever. Would the cave lead the divers to another body of water? Perhaps Lake Okanagan isn't landlocked at all and actually connects to the Pacific Ocean. They don't know how far that cave goes in. And Bill Stasiak said that He's got his divers had went into the cave and there's too much water coming out of the cave and makes it too hard for the divers to swim into the cave. Our divers, of course, they, they get a little panicky and they didn't go very far in. So who knows what's in there? And that's just one, one cave on the wall. So there are other places in the lake where water is entering. 
really interesting stuff. The first stage of the expedition gives the team some intriguing but inconclusive evidence. The next stop, however, propels the venture into high gear. Hey, Bill, something on the soda over here. What? Come here. Yeah, look at that. They had this the side scan sonar, which is a quite an advanced type of sonar. Sonar emits sound waves, which strike an underwater target and rebound back to the transmitter. These waves appear on the sonar screen as images. The team is now looking at something moving slowly across the bottom of the lake. There is something in the water. That sound would not have been bounced back if it didn't hit an object. They found something two to 300 feet down in the water, something huge that there was no way it could be a, a, a bunch of fish. And they said, you know, we don't know what it is, but there's something there. I guess we better get the ROV down then. Okay. Wasting no time, the team deploys the ROV, a remotely operated vehicle and camera. We estimate that the target itself was 17 meters long. But the ROV arrives too late. Huge and then disappeared. Yeah, it was like 266 okay. feet of water. It was right there. Uh, we had it on two sweeps of the sonar. Uh, the third sweep, it went below our beam and we lost it. But whatever that was, was huge and it was a solid sonar return and it was moving. It moved 10 degrees port to starboard. This could be Ogopogo. Could be, but not good enough as hard data. More weeks of intense searching turns up nothing. If Ogopogo does exist, it got away once again. As far as I know, nobody has ever actually produced scientific evidence. I mean, there's been $1 million and $2 million rewards for proof of the existence of Ogopogo, and nobody has claimed the reward. We've had people all through the years come and see if they can find something and, and uh, find definitive evidence of the existence of Ogopogo, but uh, it has remained elusive. There are some people who absolutely say, I've seen something, I can't explain it. Um, and then you get those that say, absolutely not, it's just a big fish or it's a current or whatever. In general, I'm a skeptic. Uh, that's sort of a, a lifestyle. I feel like coming here and talking about Ogopogo like this, I'll be the equivalent to the guy who told your kid there's no Santa Claus. Sorry to those who uh, may be, might be upset by this. There's a lot of people that believe Ogopogo is just a giant sturgeon. Um, I guess that could be a kind of a scientific analysis of the Ogopogo. The beaver. <laughs> I would liken it to, to the Santa Claus story. Oh, well, I've born and raised here. I've never seen it. <laughs> At least not when I was sober, but. <laughs> I think it's a wave. <laughs> My grandfather used to swear he's seen it, but he tended to be as a little bit. So. It's an old lake. It's a really deep lake. So I suppose there could be something, but I think it's just a big fish. I don't know. Gopogo himself seems to be a bit of a tease. It's like, come up and just show myself briefly and, uh, and tease the tourists, and then I'll disappear and leave them wondering. Was it really a Gopogo, or was it a fish, or was it just a series of waves? Witnesses, in general, are honest. They are reporting also, in my experience, more or less what they're seeing. But actually, it's a mistaken conclusion. Often, cameras do lie. Sometimes it's because deliberate hoaxes are, are made. And sometimes it's because a picture is taken which is a little bit ambiguous and then perhaps people begin to attach importance to it. I come on this trail 50 to 100 times a year, 
And I sometimes see unusual waves in the middle of the lake. And, and, and one day I was walking along and I saw one and there were four people coming along behind me. And I stopped and I said, what do you think of that over there? And they stopped and they said, oh wow, that's a humongous animal under there. Uh, and uh, I said, well, or it's just a standing wave in a quiet lake. There's a lot of scientists that say that it just, it's just waves, okay? And, and certainly, there are waves, and people take pictures of waves. Motorboats, large fish, and swimmers cause waves. But according to eyewitnesses, some waves defy all logic. Skeptics, you know, you can't blame people for being skeptical. But at the same time, there are humps, and there are heads, and it's moving through the water. And what about the waves that appear from nowhere? They're the hardest phenomenon to explain away. Our lake is, is calm and flat, and then all of a sudden, you get this, this w wave coming from the middle of nowhere in the middle of the lake. That where did it come from? It's just like in the middle. Yeah. And it's this big rolling thing that could look like a monster. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It has to be the monster. It just has to be. What else could it be? <laughs> well, we see a wave, but there's no boat. It must be an animal, OK? And well, there are other things that it could be. There's pockets of methane gas in the sediment, and it releases instantaneous, uh, which causes all kinds of bubbling and, wa and steaming at the surface. Uh, and that's been seen many times, and that's also uh, been taken for a sighting of Ogopogo. It's as much a process of rationalization as imagination. So for example, these logs which move upwind uh, can be caused by what are known as seiches, internal seiches, whereby the warm water from a summer's warming can be pushed by the wind to one end of a lake and then will flow back again, causing underwater waves. Now, you don't really see those waves at the surface, but if there's an object on the surface, like a tree trunk, then it will move against the wind. And you need to, a little bit of general science to understand that. We know from the physics that Fluids moving in a gravitational field will form something called a gravity wave, created simply because of the difference in temperature. When that corrects, the uh, water will actually start to form waves. The other questions you can ask, too, that there's some sort of submarine cave linking all of these things is geologically ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it would have to go under major mountain passes and thrust systems and volcanic terrains and things. I mean, you know, uh, number one. And number two, is it supposedly an air-breathing animal? And uh, how is it going to swim hundreds and hundreds of kilometers underwater without access to the air? People will scoff and laugh, but everybody that, that, that's seen something in the lake has been ridiculed. But you, you just have to take it because it's a real thing. Uh, people laugh at me when I tell them what I saw, but they can laugh all they want. What I saw, I saw. The last fellow told me, he says, yo, you probably saw that beaver out in the lake. Well, it's, it's 3,000 times bigger than a beaver. <laughs> I think if you believe in dinosaurs and all of the things that are now extinct, you have to believe that there could be something like that still living in a deep, deep lake like the Okanagan Lake. Finding that scientific proof is something that some people need. Um, our people, the West Bank First Nation people, the SEAL people of this area, uh, don't believe that you need to see something to believe it. All of us want to believe. I think it's wonderful to have the myth. I think Santa or, or the Ogopogo is, is a great addition to Kelowna's story. Do I believe in it? No, but I'm not going to debunk the myth because I think the myth is fun. The days of being afraid to go swimming in Lake Okanagan or making ritual sacrifices to a lake monster named Ogopogo are a thing of the past. These days, the creature has resurfaced again, not as a beast, but as tourism's best friend.
The creature that, that was feared by the early settlers is not the creature that we see now. We see this fuzzy green toy in the department store, so there's this very benign creature, which is not what the experience of the early settlers was. Rebranding a lake monster into something the tourist industry can sink its teeth into involved a name change. The original native word, Hoktik, lacked a touch of playfulness. And basically, people didn't like the native name, I guess, back in the beginning, and they came up with this Ogopogo name from a song. They took a British dance hall ditty. His mother was an earwig, his father was a, and I can't remember the rest of it. And it just became sort of everybody's pet project. And when you see this little creature at, in, encased in cement at the foot of the main street, uh, the children are climbing all over it, and absolutely nobody's afraid of it. Of course we don't talk about sacrifices to the monster. <laughs> Since nobody's ever died from him or her or whatever, I think he's friendly. <laughs> he's got the smiley face and everything else, OK? Towns and cities around Lake Okanagan have all adopted the colorful and cuddly monster as their own. Of course, there's also a commercialized aspect of Ogopogo, uh, the more cuddly, um, you know, stuffed animal version of Ogopogo that uh, you can purchase in the tourist centers and stuff like that. Lots of people look for Ogopogo, and they're, you know, very sane people. And I believe there's something in the lake. He's a friendly fella. He hasn't eaten too many tourists yet. He doesn't eat people. He eats plants. He eats ice cream at Ogos. <laughs> My name is Sharon Brown, and I live in Penticton, BC, where I run and own an ice cream shop called Ogo's Ice Cream. We have our ice cream that's named after Ogo Pogo. It's a vanilla, black licorice, orange ice cream. Very bright and colorful. The kids really love it because of its color. People come in, they're happy. They're coming for a happy experience. And it's a really, really happy place to be. The people love the monster. You know, Okanagan Lake and the Ogopogo. It's what, what the lake's about. Certainly we have images of Ogopogo all around town. We have a mosaic of Ogopogo. Um, you'll see businesses that are called Ogopogo whatever. There's an Ogopogo Rotary Club. There's an Ogopogo Swim Club. There's the Ogopogo Zone of the Canadian Ski Patrol Club. Ogopogo Tours, you know? We'll take you out on the lake and there's a chance you can see Ogopogo. It's a great marketing tool. Keep your eyes open because you never know. You never know when he could appear. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a great tourist promotion. I own and operate a bed and breakfast and it's called Ogopogo. Ogopogo B&B, perfect place to be, you know? The, the sales has become almost emblem emblematic of Kelowna. It's used in the city logo. It's used on all, all kinds of different stationery. It's, it's kind of become the sim symbol of Kelowna. But then right beside it, they see the Ogopogo. It's a focal point for the tourists. If people want to believe there's an Ogopogo, it's great. I love this place. So yeah. it brings people to look for an Ogopogo, sure. The jury's still out on whether Lake Okanagan has a man-eating sea monster or a shy prehistoric vegetarian. Then again, it may be only a great story to attract tourists. In any case, Ogopogo has become an integral part of the breathtaking scenery. Yet it may be more than that. There's so much deep water stretching for over 100 kilometers or nearly 70 miles that no one should completely write off the possibility Ogopogo does exist. People may come to try to find Ogopogo, exploring the depths of, of Okanagan Lake. 
but it's not something that has to be feared. It's something to be respected and, and it has to be believed in to, to really experience it, I think. I think it's actually kind of neat that nobody's been able to prove or disprove that there is an Ogopogo. I mean, people love the stories. People read the stories. They're, they're avid followers of Ogopogo. They, they, they'd, like, you know, they'd like nothing better to know that he exists, but at the same time, it's kind of neat that he, there's been no proof because the myth goes on. There's been an incredible change in, uh, in attitude with people about Ogopogo, and, and I've seen that over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, there's less skeptics now. Uh, I think people are starting to come to grips with the fact that, you know, there, there, could, have, there could be an animal that lives in this lake. Uh, there, we're certainly finding new species all over the world almost every week that we didn't know existed. It's a great draw for Kelowna. Uh, and the fact that there's actually something here is just remarkable. Uh, and, and this is its home. This is where it, it lays, hatches eggs up here and in the water. It, it lives here. This deserves to be protected. Ogopogo has plenty of fans who believe in it and want it left alone. Even the creature itself is never caught. People who visit Lake Okanagan are definitely hooked. Okopogo's unpredictable. You never know when he's gonna show up. And of course, he's always gonna show up when the camera's not ready, when the camera's not focused, when you left the camera in the car. He always seems to show up when you're least likely to be able to provide proof that he exists. They're looking to find that, that, that scientific proof that Ogopogo exists, and I don't think that's really necessary, but, you know, it keeps the spirit alive. It is an ongoing story. Um, you know, I might not find the, the scientific evidence to prove that, but there, it's, it's something that I believe in my heart and what my elders have always taught me is that if you believe it in your heart to be true, then it can't be wrong. The Lake District, also known as Lakeland, is one of the United Kingdom's most picturesque areas. Located in the northwest of England, near the Scottish border and just five hours drive from London, this mountainous region is a popular holiday destination. The Lake District National Park, occupying the region's central area, is the biggest tourist draw. The jewel of the Lake District is undoubtedly Lake Windermere, framed by the highest mountains in the country, some of which reach nearly 1,000 meters or approximately 3,300 feet high. At its longest, Lake Windermere extends to nearly 18 kilometers or 11 miles. Along the lake's eastern shore, the small village of Bonus on Windermere charms even from a first glance. For over 150 years, it has attracted lovers of nature and the great outdoors who come to admire this magnificent lake whose depths have been carved out by thousands of years of melting glaciers. But this lake also hides a fascinating mystery. A strange creature lives in its depths, surfacing only occasionally to surprise tourists and unsuspecting fishermen. I saw some strange disturbance under the water. About a foot under the water, I would say, and it was like a churning kind of motion under the water in a horizontal fashion. I could sense that the boat was going to rock from side to side or have an impact on it. It was three lumps, really. I kind of saw th round about three lumps in the water, the classic kind of Loch Ness shape. I panicked because I'm in the water, I'm alone, and I feel there's something there. What's going to happen? I would describe it as a sea monster um, with a large body, a long neck, and a small head. Travelling very fast, uh, so fast that white water was breaking off the, off the humps, uh, and it was heading north up the lake. I saw something in the water. Whether it was a monster, I don't know, but I definitely saw something in the water. It was long, it was black, 
it was moving through the water. Um, what it actually was, I'll leave others to determine. Since 2006, there have been at least eight eyewitness sightings reported, all of which gave similar physical descriptions. The mounting evidence of this unlikely creature continues to disturb local residents. Bowness is the main village on the lake here on Windermere. When the local paper first reported the first sighting of the monster, um, they took the name from a Scottish legend, a folklore in Scotland, where on Loch Ness there is a monster known as Nessie. Um, so they put the two names together and came up with Bow Nessie, which caught on in popular imagination very quickly. Bow Nessie's been seen as um, really a, um, a dark shape in the waters of Lake Windermere. Generally, we think that she or he might be maybe 20 or 30 metres long with humps and a sort of traditional monster shape. Rumours about a monster had been circulating since at least the 1950s, but it was not until 2006 that Bo Nessie would fully reveal herself in front of two lovers who, like so many others, came to the Lake District on holiday. They remember, as if it was yesterday, a walk they took down by the lake. First sighting was July 2006. It was the end of July. It was a, a warm summer. It was a good summer. Um, we were having uh, lunch with some friends who were staying just nearby at the Dower House next to Ray Castle and decided to go for a walk after lunch. And we walked down to Watborough Point and we were chatting and um, I heard Steve talking about something in the water and he was pointing and at first I didn't take any notice and then he said, where's my camera? I was looking down on it from the promontory, so I may have been about, I don't know, 20 yards away from it, perhaps even closer. I, I'm really quite close, really. And it was clear that it was a living creature. And I was, what surprised me most of all, I think, was not just seeing it, but it was the speed at which it was traveling. There was no kind of flapping about or anything. It wasn't like a fish. It was going like a torpedo. So it's clearly, it wasn't anything other than a, than a living creature. It all happened really quickly because, because of the speed at which it was travelling. And within, I don't know, 20 seconds or something, it was way up the lake. What exactly was seen that day remains a mystery. But subsequent strange sightings have corroborated Eileen and Steve's testimony and lent credence to their theory that something strange inhabits the depths of Lake Windermere. Until the first sighting in 2006, Bo Nessie was more a myth than a monster. Nobody really believed in the existence of a strange creature in Lake Windermere. But the couple's story of their encounter has changed all that. Almost overnight, opinions altered and Steve and Eileen's testimony traveled far beyond England's borders. There'd never been any history of uh, anybody seeing anything in this lake, as, as far as I know. So I was the first person, really, to see it. The story appeared in the, in the Westmoreland Gazette in August 2006, and then was, the story was picked up by a lot of the media, both nationally and internationally. It seemed to go around the globe. Somebody told me that quite early on it was in the... Uh, it was in one of the big Indian national newspapers, and, and I have heard said that, uh, you know, it's, it's now kind of got into travel books abroad. It's become a... It's become a, a kind of an established fact, if you like, that there is something in here. In 2007, a man named Lyndon Adams and his wife witnessed their own disturbing scene on the lake, and the pictures Lyndon took made headlines in local papers. All of this excitement and mystery attracted Dean Maynard, a renowned specialist in paranormal phenomena, to come investigate for himself. 
To document his research, he hired professional cameraman John McKeown. Yeah, close to where we are now on the road behind us um, is where I filmed some shots of a disturbance in the water, which I couldn't explain. The nature of my filming that day was to come out on the lake to see if we could capture shots of a creature that Lyndon Adams had photographed from Gummer's Howe to film what people have now dubbed Bonessi. So the shots I took were the establishing shots of the lake. It was a, it was a clear day. It was slightly overcast, but the water was still. Uh, and the disturbance I saw, I thought, was from the local car ferry. So I stopped recording. Later, when I spoke to a local boatman, um, he pointed out that the ferry was a mile further up the lake, so it couldn't have been that kind of disturbance. He couldn't explain it, and neither can I, and I've not had a good explanation of what the footage is. But what do the people of the region believe, especially those in Bonus on Windermere, the only town on the lake's coast? Are they also convinced of the presence of an aquatic monster in their lake? I think, on balance, most local people are skeptical. Having said that, when the local paper ran an online survey at the time of, um, I think it was one of the subsequent sightings, maybe two or three years ago, they ran an online survey and said, just very simple question, do you believe in, in Bonessa, yes or no? And it was absolutely 50-50. And that was among their readership, who are mostly local people. My experience is, is there a fish that's lived there for thousands of years that people have experienced? They've never sort of brought it out into the community for fear of ridicule, for fear of laughter, for fear of being taken as a fool. Well, I can tell you from now, they're not fools. There is something in there. I would class Bonessi as a large mammal, prehistoric possibly, who's been around in Windermere for quite a number of years. And he just chooses to be seen by various people every so often. There has been various sightings in the last couple of years and a couple of very credible ones. Myself and Thomas have had a encounter with him, and other local people have also had encounters in the previous years. The different sightings reported over the last few years have occurred in both the northern and southern ends of Lake Windermere. England's largest body of water, Lake Windermere, is embedded in the hills of the Lake District, an area whose natural beauty has been perfectly preserved. I describe the Lake District as like the Great Lakes of America, but smaller, like the mountains of Switzerland, but in miniature form, and it's a one-stop travel experience. They can come here, they can uh, visit everything in a week, as opposed to sort of traveling around the country for weeks or months. And here, and here's just with the villages, and it's it's unspoiled. It's uh, you know, it's it's a beautiful from maybe. If we were here 300 years ago, and I'm sitting here, it's exactly the same view that you would have. Is it possible that so idyllic a landscape is haunted by a lake monster? Half of the area's residents say yes. Between 2006 and 2013, all of the witnesses claiming to have seen Bonessi were, fortunately, outside the water. All of them, that is, except Thomas Noblet, a local hotel owner and champion swimmer who regularly crosses the lake. It was on one such crossing, according to him, that he was literally grazed by the monster. I have had one quite serious meeting with Bonessi a couple of years back. 
In preparation for a channel swim that I had committed myself to, uh, we had to train. And the best way to train is in the lake. But also, the lake is full of boat traffic. You've got water skiers, you've got the ferries. It's just a constant activity. Uh, so we decided that we'd start early morning swimming. I accompanied Thomas throughout the UK and Europe on various long distance swims that he's encountered. I train him and keep an eye on him when he's swimming as well. The most important thing when I'm out swimming with Thomas is the safety aspect, keeping an eye on him constantly and ensuring that if he got into any difficulties, I'm able to fish him out of the water straight away. We had a very unusual encounter early one July morning a couple of years back when training with Thomas on Lake Windermere. And this particular morning, it was 5.45 and it was a mirror, it was like a mirror. The lake was beautiful, you could see the mountains looked upside down, it was a perfect picture. And I really didn't want to jump in and spoil the tranquility of the, of the lake. We head out to an area just opposite the Langdale Chase Hotel called The Deeps, which is the deepest part of Lake Windermere. It's called The Deeps and it has a very, and it, it puts sort of fear into me as well. And I have swum all up and down the lake. But as soon as someone mentioned the deeps and any swimmer, you recoil because it has that mystique about it. So I got in, I swam and I do what I normally do, get my stroke together and then kind of switch off and just let the mechanics of my stroke get me across to the other side of the lake. Thomas was swimming along, he was in his own little world. I was planning my day, we're talking five o'clock in the morning, I was planning my day, what I needed to do at the hotel. After this, I was swim, and then all of a sudden, we had a bit of a bit of an encounter. I felt this massive thrust go past me. And first and foremost, I thought it was a, a large fish, then I thought it could have been a speedboat with a, the water skier on the back, and I thought, with the whole lake, we're the only ones on here, why come so near us? And it sent a panic through me. And then, next thing, the boat that I was canoeing in at the time rocked from side to side, nigh on tipping me out of the boat. He was being tossed around, and next thing, I was lifted up and dropped down like a cork. And I looked around, I could see nothing. And I could see the concern on his face. And I said to him, what the hell was that? And he was speechless, looking down the lake. I just watched in absolute amazement as it go down the lake, a bow wave, and then all of a sudden it just sank straight down, whatever this was, disappeared straight down. Nothing's there, like a Mary Celeste. I said, let's get back. I was shaken and I was shocked. And I said, I've just experienced something. I don't think no one's believed me. Here, bonus, he was. And I had got to feel him. Many people over the years have said to us different things. Or oh, was it not speedboats? Was it not somebody water skiing on the lake? We're talking five o'clock in the morning. It was flat calm, the lake. It was like glass. There wasn't a soul about, hence why we go out so early. After that experience, I'm a true believer. Lake Windermere is crisscrossed throughout the year by ferries and boats. If a giant creature truly swims in these waters, these mariners are without a doubt the ones best placed to know about it. I'm the managing director of Windermere Lake Cruises. We operate 16 passenger boats on Windermere, and those boats will have a crew varying from two on the smaller boats up to a crew of seven. So I've got probably about 40 captains, and they spend all their working day on the lake. We sail 364 days a year throughout the hours of daylight. So from first thing in the morning until late in the evening, we've got skippers and crews out on the lake watching, keeping a lookout for other boats, other craft, and for anything in the water. Well, I've uh, I worked for the company for about 18 years. So I've been driving these boats for about 12 years, full time on here. So I spent a lot of time on the lakes. There are, you know, four full-time skippers on these boats. Uh, we spend about 2,000 hours a, a year 
on the lake. No, I've never seen an animal on the lake that you wouldn't expect. I, I, I have a list of animals that I see swimming in the lake that you wouldn't expect to see in the lake, but I know what they are. There's a, a pheasant, a gannet, a squirrel, and a deer. In my time here, those are the four animals that you wouldn't expect to see in the lake, but I could identify them. Perhaps they want to believe that there's something here, and they maybe think they do. You know, like on the day to day with lots of waves, you can see ripples in the lake that they might construe to be a, a creature, but it's not something that I've ever believed in. I've only heard descriptions from other people, and as boatmen, we keep our feet very much on the ground or on the boat deck, so we have to see things with our own eyes, really, to believe it, so maybe I'm not just the right guy to ask. It's a fact for me. It's, uh, if there have been eight sightings, that doesn't convince me that it exists. My own sighting convinced me because I absolutely know what I saw. You know, I saw a living creature that was very long, travelling very fast, and it didn't resemble anything I'd ever seen. Or it certainly didn't resemble anything that should be living in this lake that anybody's ever recorded. So for me, uh, my own sighting convinces me absolutely. And bear in mind that my background is as a journalist, so, you know, I'm kind of a sceptic about most things. I'm sceptical about things until I can prove that they're true. But I have to believe my own, my own senses. I did, I did see it. I was born and raised in uh, Bowness on Windermere. Um, when I was younger, I uh, worked on the rowing boats down on the lake and um, we were out every day, most summers, on the lake itself, uh, in the rowing boats, um, tiring them out to tourists. And to be honest, we've never seen anything mysterious actually in or on the lake, other than tourists. And um, my feeling is that there isn't anything really to worry about um, out there, but obviously I could be proved wrong. question plagues those who believe in the creature's existence. If there really is something inexplicable swimming in the lake, why did virtually no one report seeing it before 2006? Why all of a sudden has Bonessi decided to make so many spectacular public appearances? The first sighting was in 2006, which was 12 months after um, the speed limit came uh, in force on the lake. So the lake was a much quieter place. For 12 months, there had been no speedboats. So anything that perhaps had been living at the bottom of the lake or in the depths of the water might have felt encouraged to, um, to show itself. In the spring of 2005, a law was enacted prohibiting boats from traveling faster than 10 miles or 16 kilometers per hour. Apart from the rare occasion that a speedboat breaks this law, the lake is extremely peaceful. My theory is really quite simple. It started appearing because the lake is now quiet. You know, it's not frightened by, by this constant noise. Perhaps in the past it has been popping up at night time when there's nobody around, but now, because the lake is quiet, uh, that's why I think it's appearing. Whatever it is, I think it's appearing because of that. I'm a lake ecologist from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and I've been conducting scientific research on Windermere since 1990. Most of my personal work is to do with the, the fish populations of, of the lake, but I work within a, a research group which looks at all aspects of the lake, from its physics, basic elements of its chemistry, through its plankton and other small animals and up to the, the fish populations. Well, the, the, obvious feature of the Lake District are the lakes themselves. There's nowhere else in England that has such a diversity and such a number of lakes. And then Windermere itself is the largest natural lake in all of England by surface area, and it's one of the deepest as well. So it may well be that there are other species down at the bottom of the lake because it's such an ancient piece of water and because it's so vast, it's 11 miles in length, and because of its depth, then there may well be um, creatures, fishes, large ones, 
at the bottom of the lake that had not been seen. Windermere is, is inhabited by a number of species of, of fish. And one, the Arctic char, is very localised in England, so it's quite a rare species. We also have large numbers of perch, uh, fish called the roach, and also fish called the pike. And Atlantic salmon and brown trout would come into the lake as well. But the largest of these fish would be the pike or the salmon, and the, the largest individual we, we would ever see would still be less than a metre in length. So none of the native fish of the lake could possibly explain sightings of a, of a very large animal. My, my best idea of what the Bonetti thing could be is uh, if it is a larger animal than the kind of things that we know are in the lake, my best guess is that, that it's a large catfish that has been introduced. A species which is not native to this part of the UK for sure. And we know that some anglers have brought catfish into the UK for fishing purposes. But these catfish, even in their native part of the world, they don't get large enough to be the kind of size that Bonessi is supposed to be. I, I see no reason why there might not be a, a genetic hybrid sort of creature uh, in the lake, perhaps a very large eel, a very large catfish. My perception of what I think might be in there and what I thought prior to swimming are two different things. If you had asked me prior to my swimming what was in there, I would say large fish, cold water and boats. And in my opinion, there are believers, non-believers or in between us. And people that, you know, I know would never come out with these different stories have experienced different things, whether on top of the water, on the side of the water, whether they're sailing, uh, not so much swimming. Uh, they've experienced something very similar. Now, all of us can't be wrong. And what to make of the disappearance of certain fish populations in the lake despite its remarkable water purity? This is a recent phenomenon that has only added to the lake's mystery. And since then, with the questions and asking sailors have been on there, which they've experienced seeing something come towards their boats and rolling over like a slab of meat, then disappearing down. It makes it could be a, an old prehistoric monster that lives down on the bottom that's feeding on the fish. The lake is not overfished. There's the odd fisherman that goes out there, there's no trawlers, but there's a lack of fish and swimming sometimes, apart from the odd fish, we see nothing. And at the bottom, there's char, but people are not catching anything. And there's no pollution in that lake. It flourishes with all types of wildlife. Um, and it just begs what is eating, or why is the fish not bountiful? Despite much of the local population's skepticism about Bonacy's existence, its growing legend, propelled by media reports from around the world, has attracted many tourists to the Lake District. The first sighting was made by a guy here on holiday, uh, so I saw it in our local newspaper. And then it subsequently turned out that the, the, the gentleman concerned was a lecturer in media studies. So my first reaction was, this guy is conducting some kind of research of his own and planting a monster story and seeing how the media take it up. So that, that was the first time I heard these, these ideas. The next thing that happened was um, some photographs were taken of the monster by a professional photographer. And I was shown those before it became public. And my first reaction to seeing the photographs was that they were indeed of something biological out in the middle of the lake, something moving around, some, something real, not, not an artifact. Um, but from my perspective, what I couldn't judge was the, the size of this thing. So it, it looked to me like it could just be a, a cobrant or a goosander or an otter, even a deer swimming in the lake. Sometimes we get deer swimming to the, into the lake. The, 
the sightings have all been tourists um, who are perhaps not used to being in the area, seeing the lake, seeing the various moods of the lake, because the mood of the lake can change very quickly. Um, there's lots of uh, different things that can happen. The light can change, um, swells can get up, the wind moves in different places at different times. It can be calm one minute and it can get up quite uh, blustery the next. The mountains as well do cast quite good shadows over the lake. Also, there's lots of woodland around the lake, um, which means it's very difficult to actually get to the edge of the lake to really look at it. And I think probably two thirds of the lake is private, and private woodland and private land around it. So most people are going to see Bowness if they see it from quite a distance. And I think you'll find that apart from some canoeists that thought they'd um, seen it while they were on the lake, um, most of the sightings have been from the hills or from a fair distance away. As, as a scientist, when we see hair of most sightings, what we, we desperately want is, is objective evidence for it and good photographs. And there really haven't been good photographs. So it's the same as a, as a Loch Ness story. It just doesn't, doesn't produce decent photographs. If we grant, for the sake of argument, that an animal of this size cannot exist in Lake Windermere, the question remains, what did all these presumably honest people, swearing by their testimonies, really see? Well, one of the ways in which we study the fish of the lake is using echo sounding, in which we go out in the lake in our research vessel and transmit pulses of sound five times every second down into the water. We drive around the, the lake on a, on a set, um, set of transects and we record things in the water column. So that lets us count the fish and it lets us assess the size of those fish as well. And we do that once a month, um, daytime and nighttime since 1990. And so we have good ideas of the changes in the numbers of fish and the changes in the, in the sizes. And we've never seen anything larger than a metre or so, which is the, the maximum size of a, a salmon or a pike that we would see. Some other people have suggested that the thing that's being seen really is an otter or even a, a family of otters at certain times of year because the otters are quite common around the Lake District now, much more abundant than they were just a few years ago and they certainly do exist on Windermere and around Windermere and if you saw something in the water and you misjudged the size of that object then an otter would fill a lot, fit a lot of the descriptions that have been given. At, at certain times of the, of the year the, the female otter will be with her cubs so they will be in a, in a family group, as it were. So you can, if you're very lucky, you can see a group of otters moving together on the lake or around the edges of the lake. If the otters are, are close together, you could get the impression that you're looking at one big thing rather than a number of, of small things which are, are nearby. From a, a scientific point of view, I think we can speak with some authority for Windermere because it's the, the lake which has had by far the most scientific study in the whole of the United Kingdom. There have been scientists based at Windermere since the 1930s looking at all aspects of the lake. So it's really remarkable if, if something has existed and has not been detected by all of their sampling over all of those decades. The skeptics say that it's unlikely, but nobody has proved beyond reasonable doubt that there's nothing there. They can't do that. The lake's far too big for them to do that. This is a very old lake. It's an ancient piece of water. It was formed 13,000 years ago. Um, it's very deep. In places, it's more than 200 feet deep. So there may well be things down at the bottom of the water that are not yet to be explained. Another mystery likely to remain unsolved. But no matter what we think, so long as irrefutable proof of the monster's existence has not been presented, there will always be room for doubt. Some will consider this doubt justified and others will think it absurd, but this is the inevitable result of science that, at least for now, doesn't have all the answers.
Bonacy is ultimately not very visible on the lake, but its presence is evident everywhere on the streets of Bonus on Windermere, where the residents have increasingly embraced it. It's now time to pass the monster from science to folklore. I believe there may well be some strange creature in the lake. I'd like I'd see no harm in believing in folklore and legend. I think folklore is very important to an area. Before 2006, Bowness wasn't part of our lives. And then there were the first sightings, and of course, with the first sighting, you're very skeptical. Then there's another. I think so far there have been eight sightings of Bonessi. Tourists can come from far and wide to do their own little investigation into Bonessi's existence. Outside of any chance monster encounters, they will discover a charming region filled with natural beauty. It's mainly British visitors, people from the Far East, and in a smaller proportion, people from North America, United States and Canada, and also people from France and Belgium and Holland and Scandinavia. Tourism is incredibly important to the Lake District National Park. Every year, about 15 million visitors come to the National Park. It sustains employment, about 15,000 full-time equivalent jobs in tourism, and the value of tourism to the Lake District National Park, somewhere in the region of a billion pounds. So it's incredibly important. I can't really tell how many of those visitors come to the area looking for Bonessi. Sure, some of them do, but I think probably the vast majority come for the spectacular landscape and the genuinely world-class visitor experiences. One thing that the Lake District is not is Disney World. You know, people come here for the scenery, for the mountains and for the lakes, but they also come to see Bonessi. You know, I have four hotels with 150 bedrooms of my own, and we ask our guests why they're coming here, and more and more of them are saying, we're coming here for Bonessi. As a coincidence today, it's the first time I've ever been asked this, and this was a Chinese family, and they showed they had a Chinese uh, tourist book in Chinese with a picture of what they call what it's supposed to be the Nessie. And he asked me, did I know anything about it? So, but that's the first time I've ever been asked. Bonessi isn't a tourist attraction in the sense that, you know, people come to ride on Bonessi um, or people come to see Bonessi toys. They come to see Bonessi on the lake. Of course, they can buy a Bonessi toy as well as a souvenir. But the real attraction of Bonessi is the chance of seeing Bonessi emerge from the depths of the water. You've got to keep your eyes peeled. Don't you let your kids put your feet in the water. They uh, never know about Bonessi maybe nibbling their tootsies and that sort of thing. So it, we sort of jay it up a little bit uh, to try and get them interested. And they do join in with the fun. And I think it just adds a little bit of fun to their uh, trip. Maybe they'll tell their friends, maybe it'll become a bit of a, a myth and a legend and uh, maybe it'll spread the word that way. Visitors from abroad particularly are very, very interested. The Lake District attracts a great many visitors from China and Japan. Um, and they like any kind of folklore stories. They love those kind of tales. And they appear to have really fallen for the stories about Bonessi as well. There's now um, a, a storybook for children about Bonessi, and that's very popular. And during the summer, I understand that quite a lot of Japanese and Chinese visitors went on a, a trail that's been set up by, mostly set up for children, actually, but um, grown-up Japanese and Chinese visitors went on the Bonessi trail. So I think they, they are curious.
we are from China and we come here to study in Lancaster. So we travel here to uh, spend some uh, holiday, yeah, holiday we can. Yeah. Weekend. We are trying to buy the tickets there so we can listen to the uh, mysterious stories here. So it will be sounds very interesting, I think. During the Middle Ages, dragons held an important place in English mythology. Some of the legends of King Arthur say that, pursued by the Knights of the Round Table, the dragons found refuge in the depths of Lake Windermere for thousands of years. Asian legends and the collective imagination of some areas alongside the Asian seas are also full of dragons and other sea creatures, which may explain why so many of the region's tourists hail from the Far East. Most of the Japanese come because of Beatrix Potter and Peter Rabbit, but the Chinese are coming because of Bonessi. They want to see the British dragon. I think it's very interesting that um, in the ancient history of the Chinese and the ancient history of England, there is a common link. Dragons are part of our national culture and they're part of the Chinese national culture. They're celebrated every new year. And in a sense, the British had begun to forget about dragons. Now Bonessi is back. Bonessi is reminding us that dragons are part of our culture. Legend or not, Bonessi certainly adds a unique flavor to the Lake District. But the tourists, who have been visiting since the arrival of the railroads during the Victorian era, come visit first and foremost for its scenery, reputed to be the most beautiful in all of England. Oh, we love the Lake District. We come here um, probably a couple of times a year, maybe three times a year if we can. Um, we just think it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful and the kids love it and it's the fresh air and, and you know, the beautiful scenery. We don't really know about any monster here. We've never seen one anyway, but we always have a look, look when we're on the boats, but we haven't done yet. It's just a bit, bit of fun, isn't it? We have a little Bonessi display up on the wall and we have some little stuffed Bonessi toys, some colouring books and bits and pieces that uh, do spark interest in tourists. They perhaps have never heard of Bonessi until they walk in the shop and then they see uh, the newspaper cuttings we have up on the wall and they, uh, they will ask us, what's all this Bonessi thing? And we, we talk to them about it. We have a bit of a joke and say, well, if you have to be careful when you're on Lake Windermere, you never know. To those who argue that the story of a lake monster was invented to attract tourists, the residents of the Lake District have a simple and undeniably true answer. They have never needed a story to attract visitors to the lake's pristine waters and breathtaking scenery. It enables one to experience adventure on a fairly small scale that people who might dream of the Alps and the Himalayas but no, they'll never get to the top of a mountain there. They can achieve something here. With a relatively modest effort, they can get to the top of quite a difficult climb in a couple of hours and see the most spectacular views. And it's within everyone's grasp. It's all about achieving and realizing dreams. I would like to think that Bonessi does bring tourists to Windermere and the National Park as a whole. I think in years to come, Bonessi could become as big as Nessie up in Scotland. Why not? He's got to have a family member somewhere in the UK, so why not in Windermere? I 
I don't think you would be fully human if you didn't find yourself here and find yourself standing on the edge of the lake and looking out and thinking, you know, is there really something in there? Anything that people can't fathom out, anything that people fear, any mystique, any mention of monsters always attracts the public. Now, here in the Lake District, we're already an established tourism base. It's one of the most beautiful areas in the UK, if not in Europe, and certainly if not in the world. It is a mini Switzerland. It's uh, a mini Rockies, it's a mini Alps, it has everything there. It has the four seasons, you have your spring, you have your summer, you have your autumn, you have your winter, which brings the snows. Each season is a different land when you look across the lake. And no two days when I walk down here, or I'm swimming here, no two days are the same. And the beauty of the Lake District is it's changing scenery, it's changing the atmosphere, and it's just beautiful. Now, Bonessi that comes in, that would attract other people for their own benefits to see what's out there. It can be no harm, and what it does, it attracts people into this beautiful area. I believe there's a monster out there, many don't. And, and it probably would quell the, mis the mystery of Bonessi, but I'm a believer that Bonessi's out there, and he's there, enjoying the beautiful Lake District like we all do. Iceland, a country like no other, emerged in the center of the North Atlantic before it was settled over a thousand years ago by Norwegian Vikings. Imagine 300,000 people living on a territory as big as France. The island itself has been shaped by volcanic and geothermal forces active now as ever, making it a site of incomparable majesty. Among this country's natural treasures, Osterland, also known as the Eastern Region, is a huge valley formed over millennia by glacial erosion and through which the Lagerfloot River meanders, fed directly from Iceland's largest glacier. The central part of the river widens at the city of Eulstador, forming the lake called Logurin, or Lagerfloot, which, at first glance, has the appearance of being just another tranquil body of water. However, this large lake with a depth of over 100 meters or 320 feet hides a mystery. For several centuries, a giant worm known as Lagerflotermurin was sighted in the lake. Living witnesses number in the dozens. Recently, one of them even managed to capture images of the creature. <laughs> They saw something move up and down, humps or something. People have been seeing these kinds of humps coming up from the, from the lake surface. Well, we have the records of uh, some kind of a monster living in the lake. Uh, the first record is from 1345. Many hundred years ago, the, the worm was believed to be very dangerous. I think there's a creature there. There's something alive down there. I always have a camera in my car when I travel around the lake, if I would see something. I would, I would describe it as something very huge. It's uh, enormous in size. I mean, every child here in the area can tell you the story about the monster. I think the last of Solomon is really big, ugly, and scary. I was here in the house. 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 I was here in the house.
Svo sást þetta bara og ég tók þetta upp. Nei, kannski alvöru. Þannig að svo ferðum við að horfa á þetta og svona getum ekki átt á okkur á því almennilega hvað þetta er. Þannig og... Við vorum kilt by poison og fire people. Sko, þegar ég sá þetta, þá trúði ég svona meira. Do you believe in the in the worm? Yes, absolutely. I believe in it. I I know it exists. The Lagerflotermuren lives in Lagerflot, the third largest lake in Iceland, spanning 53 square kilometers or 20 square miles. Filled with sediment from the glacier that feeds it, the lake's grey colour and opacity have helped keep this mystery alive. This lake is... Uh, it's deep. It goes down to at least 112 metres. The glacier dug it down in the, the ice, ice age. It has a very, very much volume uh, because, well, the surface of the lake, the altitude of the surface of the lake is about 20 metres above sea level. But the bottom of the lake, well, where it is steepest, it is more than 112 meters deep. We have, we have this 80 meters below sea level of the lake, and that is, that is rather unusual in Iceland. It, it's not transparent, as, as many, many lakes are, because it's glacier waters. So I believe it, there is a creature down there. And on the bottom of the lake, also because of the glacier river that runs into it, we have, have a very thick layer of uh, clay, of sediment, from, from the centuries that the glacier rivers have yeah, washed into it. When glaciers melt in Icelandic mountains, rivers filled with sediment carve a path to the ocean. Most of these rivers are not navigable because of the violence of the current, but there are exceptions like the Laker float. Among the residents who live around the erosion basin, the famous Laker float lake, everyone knows at least one person who has seen the terrible creature emerge from its surface. The people has to that has told me the, the story of the worm are people I trust very much. My neighbor, Waldemar, he's a very down-to-earth person. And uh, he, was, he was working with several other, uh, other men, uh, putting a telephone cable in the lake. Uh, and they had a lot of trouble with the worm because he, he bit the telephone cable. Það var aldrei neitt vaf á því eftir við sáum hvers konar meðferð kapallan hefði fengið að sko, þarna var eitthvað óhemi stert og mikið afl sem að gat gert þetta. Ég kapallinn var, eins og ég sagði, svo sterkur, sérstaklega framleitur. Þetta er kallað armering, þessi styrking utan á kapplanum. Ekkert venjulegt uh, afl getur gert þetta. Þetta er eins og að vefja upp járnkarla að gera þetta. Svo leysa að við erum bæði hræddir og hissa. Þegar við áttum á okkur á því hvað við höfðum gert. Ekki neinum vá um það að þarna var sá gamli á ferðinni. It was totally unexplainable how it could be twisted so much because it was so strong that uh, they thought it was impossible and they, the, te the technicians there, they, they just had no explanation of it other than this, this very good expl explanation that it had been in contact with the monster and the, con and the monster didn't like this cable to go over its back. Very young by the standards of Earth's timeline, Iceland emerged from the bottom of the Atlantic some 20 million years ago as the result of volcanic eruptions. Inhabitants live under a constant threat from 130 active volcanoes, 
which may explain why this state is the least densely populated country in Europe, with only three people per square kilometer. We are here in Iceland, actually in the Easter, eastern part of Iceland, or East Iceland, as we call it. And this, uh, this part of Iceland is uh, renowned for a very good weather. Most Icelanders know it for uh, that they want to come here for summer holidays because of the good weather. We are here in the valley of, of Fljotstallur, or the Fljotstallur Valley, and uh, through it runs this river, which is a glacier river coming from all the way from the Vatnajökull Glacier. And so that runs here into the river, and, and the rivers run into the lake Lagerfljot, which is actually a, a river all the way to the ocean, but, uh, well, a river lake. Well, we have the records of uh, some kind of a monster living in the lake. Uh, the first record is from 1345. So it's quite, quite old, and it's mentioned actually in, in all, the, all the annals or the chronicles of Iceland through the centuries, some sightings every century. Uh, we have very uh, well-written annals through the centuries, and there you can uh, read uh, about the worm that has been, uh, been seen various places in the lake and, and by whom and, and when and how. The presence of religious missions allowed Iceland to keep a fairly accurate record of its history. Icelandic annals make explicit mention of the appearance of a monster here and there over the centuries beginning in 1345. I was uh, surprised to see how much was written about it. We have a lot of, of descriptions of old parishes in Iceland that also tell us about the life of the people and the, and the nature. And even there, you have several times stories about the worm. Mainly, well, people at least try to connect it with that, okay, if the monster was seen here at the Lake Lagerfljot, people could expect something very dreadful to happen in the nature. Some eruptions, uh, earthquakes, or a very hard winter following. So it uh, was this belief that it occurred only when something dreadful was going to happen. We have a tale about the origin of this monster. Uh, this beautiful little tale about the, about the girl and the gold ring. Well, the legend about the Laaflutsormur is very, very old. And it, it, it's in every folk tale uh, collection you, you have in Iceland. Once I was a little girl, and her mother gave her a little golden ring. And she put the gold in a box, and she was told to put a little worm under the gold, and then it would grow. So she put the worm on the gold, hoping it, the gold would grow. but uh, the golden grow just the worm. It was a giant worm, and she was, and she was so afraid, and the, the, she threw the box in the lake. And then it came, became this monster that uh, attacked farmers and, and uh, destroyed the harvest for the, for the farmers. Icelanders asked some Fins to Fins to come and help us. They came and they tell that they met this big monster out close to the sea that was like a big seal. And then they met this big skate with this, I think, nine tails with poison claws. And one of the Fins, he got hurt by this poison claws. So he had to stop. And the name of that place is, is Finnstadanes. It means where the Finn stopped. So the story lives in the names of the surroundings. It is said that the, the Finns, the magicians from, from North Norway that came here or from Lapland, 
that they managed, after a very hard struggle, they managed to chain it down on the head and the tail. So for that reason, you only see the humps coming up. Well, it has been kept alive because people have been seeing it so often through the, through the centuries. We have the same descriptions from people that, well, even not have read the tale. According to legend, an evil worm thrown into the lake slowly grew into a terrifying giant monster. Skoli Gunnarsson is the director of the cultural center of the region. He has dedicated part of his life to preserving the myth of the Lagerflotter Muren and cataloging its appearances from oldest to newest. This is actually the first map that was made of, of Iceland where it is, well, a little bit similar to how it really looks like. Uh, with all the fjords and, and, and the peninsulas. And uh, so there is, uh, about the Lagerfjord Lake, it's written uh, a kind of a warning that says something like this, that uh, in this lake there is a living creature, a uh, big creature that uh, occurs when some dreadful things are going to happen. A dangerous monster, actually, it says there in the Latin. So... It is written there, and it was copied then to other, other uh, maps of Iceland for centuries. When walking along the lake, Skuli cannot help but scan the horizon. Many witnesses claim to have seen the monster while they were driving their vehicle. In response, Skuli has installed information signs in areas where the creature has been thought to emerge. This is actually an information board put up by the, the, the Worm Associ Association. And uh, it uh, it's explains a little bit the story behind the, behind the worm, but mainly it's, it's pointing out the places where something peculiar has been seen. And we are just taking out a few places where we have the descriptions from, from written papers from the annals, from the chronicles of uh, some peculiar sightings. Well, we can, we can, for example, take this, the triangle with the, with the letter D. That is, that is a sighting from 1965, when the staff here working in the forestry, in the forest, in the Hadlandstad forest, they saw uh, the worm, or at least they thought they saw the worm, and uh, they actually went all the way, well, they saw it there, and they went all the way to here, where we are standing now, and there, they, there it disappeared. It, uh, it seemed to be swimming. It seemed to be swimming up, upstream. And they were coming some humps up, but when they got here, uh, at this place where, where it, it's a very good panorama over the lake, they, it, it disappeared. These forest workers were under orders from Siguldor Blondal, who led the National Forest Office. His daughter Sigrun, a historian, has pulled archives from the time period to try to understand what happened. I think it was in 1962 that my father was looking uh, out uh, of the window uh, where he lived, and he, suddenly he saw something rise from the lake and he called my, my cousin, that was there too, and my brother. They saw something move up and down, humps or something, move up and down for 10 minutes, and they all uh, three watched it through the window very clearly. And my pa father is a, he's a scientific person. He's very pragmatic. He was a, a forest warden. So it was very clear to him that it was a worm he saw. And he has, he's, never, he's never denied that. He's, he's always convinced that he saw the worm. Ég og 
Bjartis til Jó og Ásdís vorum að á leiðinni hérna upp eftir frá Eistlaum. Og Ásdís hafði komið hérna svo. Þegar ég kem hérna yfir hæðina hérna fyrir þann þá sé ég eitthvað á fljótinu og... Stelpur sjáið þarna, er það lágur svo fyrir þarna? Segi eitthvað við stelpur að sjáið þarna í lágflósarvori. Ég man ekki alveg, en sko, við vorum allavega leiðin heim hinga og við vorum bara eitthvað svona í bílnum og leiðin hinga og hún bara ekki að tala saman og eitthvað leiðis og svo sá við það. Og við kærðum svona lengra langað til þess að sjá þetta betur. Þannig að ég hélt að það væri bara svona ormur svona eins og lifra eða eitthvað neginn en veist, ég sá ekki beint hvernig þetta var sko. Það var bara eitthvað svona gusa upp og hún er þegar ég sá tók þetta upp hana. Við erum bara áfram og horfum á þetta og þannig að þær taka upp, eða Ástis tekur upp þarna símanu og tekur myndir af þessu. Þannig að, já já, þannig að við teljum að við séð þau lagalfú sorg með þarna. Ég hélt bara strax að það var lagalfú tólmurinn, sko. Nei, ekkert, nei, ekki fyrir en ég sá þetta á YouTube og, og bara þegar Fólk voru að tala við mig um þetta. In 2012, a creature that looks like a snake is filmed swimming against the current upstream of the lake just outside the house of a sheep farmer. With the help of his nephew who explained how to work the camera, this farmer managed to capture some very disturbing images. And the telephone rings and, and it's my uncle telling me that uh, the lagerfloat swarm is uh, trying to swim ashore. And I think to myself that this is probably just some debris floating in the river and I just tell him to take pictures of it. And he wants me to help him to take a video of it. That was how he was able to capture video of the thing. Hringdi í sjóhalsréttamannin og ætlaði að fá hann til að taka mynda þessu verðbæri en þá var hann í frígi. Og ég áttur um myndavél en kunni ekki á hana. Og hann kendi mér í gegnum síman á að á vélina og ég tók mynd af þessu fyrirbæri þarna í Jánni sem að ég tel og mun halda mig við að hafi verið ormurinn eða þá afkvæmi ormsins. They weren't very interested at first. They asked me to send them the video, but they did not put it on the 7 o'clock news in television. They only put it on the web. And uh, a few days later, uh, the editor of the web, Roof.is, calls me up and tells me that uh, the web is almost crashing because thousands of Japanese people are watching the video. And so then we realized that maybe this was something big. And uh, then we did a television news story on the video, but the video and the worm was not the main thing. The main thing was the attention that the video had gotten from Japan and also from millions of people that had watched it on YouTube. In a few days, millions of users from around the world share the link and look at the images captured by the farmer. But even so, some of the locals remain wary. The first reaction uh, here in the area was, okay, this is, this is something, this is some stunt. They've been planting this there in the river and, and making this look like a monster or something like that. But uh, I knew, of course, that that's, that couldn't be the fact. I mean, he wasn't even able to be ready with the camera. So after the video got so famous online, uh, camera crews and newsrooms from around the world started sending people to Iceland. And uh, at times it was... Uh, almost crowded here with uh, reporters and I was constantly answering questions, helping people out, uh, directing people who to talk to. Uh, I, I was busy 
because of it, and uh, my uncle as well. He was very happy. Suddenly, he was uh, world famous, and the farmers from uh, uh, around they were envious, and he was the uh, talk of the town. Oh yeah. Ég tel mig með góðurið saman sko geta trúað á lagafsjónsvar minn. Eftir þetta þú hefur endar alltaf trúað á hann. Ég er búin að sjá ár minn, taka mynd á honum. Og því ætti, því ætti menn ekki geta trúað á ár minn. Já vil þú menn hafi ekki séð hann. Menn trúa nú á Guð, hafi menn, hafi menn séð hann allir. A country of legends, Iceland has been the land of elves and trolls since the passage of the Vikings in the Middle Ages. But the Lagerflotter Murin is something else. The legend of the worm is, I think, more alive in our, in our, our, our thoughts than, than maybe the elves and trolls. You look at the elves and trolls more, more like a folk tale. Maybe you know the Icelanders, they believe in elves, they believe in trolls that believe in hidden people and hidden things, and some people, they see it, and they believe that they see something. If it's only in their head, or if they are really seeing something, I, I can't tell. But, but uh, my father has seen the worm in Laraflot, and my brother has seen it, and uh, my neighbor has seen it. So, so it's, it's uh, you, you, you don't... Uh, it's hard to deny the legend, uh, the, the story, when, when people stand before you, uh, in front of you, and tell you that they have seen the worm. Yeah, <laughs> In recent years, several theories have been advanced to explain what the dozens of witnesses believe they saw in the Lagerflot Lake. Skarfedin Porrison is a biologist at the University of Iceland. He studies reindeer populations and is intimately familiar with the lake, which he encounters on a daily basis as part of his research. And although he remains skeptical, his camera is never far away. So when I, I drive around the lake, I always have the camera because I'm always thinking about seeing something that could be related to uh, Lagerfjord's worm sighting, something like that. And, but I'm not expecting to see a live creature. Although some people talk about that the creature is somewhere between the real world and the spiritual world. I don't believe that a real creature exists, but I believe that many people, they sense or feel something that they say is a creature. I can't believe it because uh, the creature have to eat, you have to breath, it has to breathe, and I don't think it's, uh, uh, it's an environment for creature to do that in this lake. If it's a fish-like creature, it has gills. But if it's uh, something like a reptile, like Nessie in Scotland, uh, Nessie is, be people that believe in Nessie believed it was a, a plesiosaurus, a reptile. But they became extinct 60 million years ago. The oldest rock in Iceland is only about 15 million years old. And the lake is, is, is young. So it's difficult to, to see what kind of creature should live in the lake. It would seem, therefore, to be impossible for a giant creature to survive in Lagerfloat Lake. But thanks to the high quantity of sediment and glacial debris found in the lake, conducting a proper survey of what exactly is in the water is difficult. 
The water running into it is a glacial water, so there's a lot of floating sediment. The lake is go down to more than 100 meters, and the, the sediment is very thick. Up there, it's 100 meters thick, and in the sediment we have uh, we have vegetation coming from the wood on the sides of the lake. This vegetation trapped in sediment ferments in the depths of the lake and can release pockets of gas that then rise to the lake's surface. So maybe we have uh, some small earthquake or something happen, and, and the bubble goes up, and, it, and then they look like a hunchback on the, on the water. Gas sometimes comes up uh, from the bottom of the lake like it's erupting. Gas can erupt from the bottom of the lake, so it looks like uh, something is rising from the lake, but it's actually just air and leaves and debris. If you go back, I think some four or five hundred years ago, the uh, narrow-minded public, people, when they see something strange, like uh, in, this, in, in this lake, we, the worm is not the only creature here. There's a, a big seal monster out there. And then we have a skate, the fish, with tails. And on the tails, we have a poison uh, claws. And it's, I think it's uh, not hard to, to imagine that maybe a walrus visit this place out there. And some local people that had never heard about walrus saw something with big teeth, and they tell others. and so on, and it changed to a monster. But it's also in our subconsciousness, I would say, because we have, just as uh, in other places where you have some kinds of uh, tales and, and some mysterious things, you, you have these taboos, usually. One thing that if you go to a person here in the region and, and you ask, uh, can I have a trout from the lake? Or you will probably get the answer, no, 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 the trout from this, this Lagerfield lake, it's, it's unedible. It's uh, so bad tasting and so you don't want that. But uh, that is not the fact. I mean, the trout from the lake, it, uh, the meat of the trout is a little bit lighter because of the color of the lake, but uh, it's, it's not bad fish f to eat. And then the other thing is that, uh, why are no boats on the lake? Well, you haven't seen any boats on the lake. Then you get the explanation, oh, the waves, the waves of the lake, they are extremely sharp. They are much sharper on this lake than any other lake you can find. So you shouldn't go out on a boat to this lake. I think that in Japan, as in Iceland, uh, there are a lot of myths. And uh, I believe that uh, when you have a monster video, you have to have a myth to go along with it. And here, that happened. And I think that explains why this video that Hjörtur captured has gotten so much attention, international attention, and maybe especially from Japan, because they have similar myths. At some point, a TV crew came in from uh, the United States and they did all sorts of tests. I think that the tests that the American crew made uh, don't prove that uh, the video that Hjörtur took is fake. It only proves that uh, debris floating in the river can look like uh, a monster is swimming, but that doesn't tell us anything about what Hjörtur actually captured on his film. And what about the strange phenomenon captured on camera in Birgir Bragesen's car? The video that the girl shot of some phenomenon, something happening on the lake, uh, I think it's just some weather ph phenomenon. It's a little cyclop going over the water. You see it inland where the, it, it moves over land, taking up dust and so I, I think we can we have a uh, natural explanation. 
I believe that uh, we have two types of uh, worms in the lake. There's the old uh, six or seven hundred year old uh, giant monster that might be living there, but I, I doubt it. And then there is the undiscovered uh, organism. Uh, I don't believe in the six or seven hundred year uh, giant monster. But I don't want to rule out that there might be an undiscovered uh, life form living in the silt at the bottom of the lake. Ultimately, until proof of Lagerflotermurin's existence is produced, strange phenomena observed on the lake will continue to fuel belief in the legends of this rich region of Iceland. The children of the city of Eulstador have a particularly fertile imagination. How could it be otherwise, given that their school is located just across from Lake Lagerflot? I think young, pe young children, they believe very clearly in it. They absolutely believe that the worm is alive. And I asked my son that is eight years old, do you believe in the, in the worm? Yes, absolutely, I believe in it. I, I know it exists, and, and he described it for me, what it looked, look, looked like. So it's very, very clear in his mind. Uh, it's important because it's part of the community and part of our history, and it's linked with the, with the imagination of the kids when they do arts or drawings, something like that, they often uh, draw the, the worm and they, uh, it helps them with, them with their imagination and it comes out uh, in that way and we use the saga when we teach them about the area, history of the area. It starts with uh, her mo there was a little girl and her mother gave her a little gold ring. That she was, they, she opened the box and she was very afraid. Then the worm began to grow and he grew bigger and bigger. Here, here he threw the box in the lake. And now here, this is for the end of the story. I think it's very important because when I was a child, uh, I was born here in the neighborhood. Uh, we really believed uh, there were monsters in the lake. And we always were, were beware of it. And it was like part of the nature and very exciting. We are trying to keep it alive because, uh, uh, of course, it's nice to have uh, a monster because uh, it's uh, today it's not eating people anymore. <laughs> so you don't need to be afraid of it. This thing is made from clay and this is uh, special for me because my daughter was very young. She was in second class and she decided to make Lavlos Orm. And I did not tell her to make Lavlos Orm. It's, uh, it was her, her decide, decision. It's not not big deal. It's, it's not big deal. There are trees here around us. And the, the, it's also not big deal. There's mountain and there's lake and there are houses. And, and we have this environment. And we have also this creature in, in the lake. And it's not big deal. It's just a common thing. In our, in our life. Flotermuren plays an important role in the cultural and folk identity of this part of the country, where residents treat the mythical creature with great respect. There is no talk here of making a promotional or commercial effigy to attract tourists.
main reason I think Icelandic people come to visit Fljotsalsjera is it's so green. We have the trees here that most part of Iceland, they don't have as much trees as we do here. People love to visit because it's it's a great destination for families and it's, it's, it has a beautiful scenery. People travel to the area, they do know that the lake is home of the Laaflots worm because it's a really popular children's story and probably most of Icelandic people have heard the story at some point in their life. And we use it as our symbol for the municipality. And that tells us how, how, how important he is for us. And you also have seen, see artworks, several artworks in Eilstad and, and this area that, uh, that are, are formed as a worm. The poem uh, is about the Lagerflot's worm. It's tied to Husatanki over there where the poem lived. So it was a very real thing to him, or, or at least he thinks a lot about it. And uh, my daughter took this poem and made a tune and played it on a piano, and my wife and do second daughter sing it, performed it in the church in Eilstad last year. And I think it's just an indication of that everybody knows about the verb. Everybody looks at the lake when they are driving around it, uh, hoping to see some, something or expecting. So, so the worm is very much alive today. Despite its seclusion, the valley in Iceland's eastern region attracts more and more tourists each year. The city of Eulstador is essential since it is the only major metropolitan area around the lake. And it could be that the images of the giant worm circulated on social networks partly explain the recent increase in the number of visitors. Tourists are coming to Iceland mainly because of the nature. That is, that is the statistic says, says so. And then the second thing is the, is the culture and heritage. But people here, I think they realize that, okay, uh, maybe, maybe people are more interested in something like our worm monster than we, than we thought, actually. Meet the Locals is a, is a, is a pro or program that we are doing, Tanya Travel, with uh, local people in, in East Iceland, where we like, uh, invite people to come um, as guests and, and saying goodbye as friends. Uh, we invite people to, to local homes where they can either have dinner or coffee and, and uh, a chat with local people how it is to, to live here in the area. And our tour around the lake, life around the monster lake, offers you to, to uh, yeah, see the monster, if you're lucky or not lucky, and to, to meet local people and ask them by yourself how it is to, to live by the lake. Eilstadur is also the site of several annual festivals celebrating the cultural heritage of Eastern Iceland. The possible existence of a strange creature in Lake Lagerflot provides a pretext to hold the region's most important annual festival, Orum Teiti, which opens with a big party. Each August, visitors from across the country come to attend the parades, concerts, and cultural events that animate the city for an entire week. Whatever reason brings you to this unique area, make sure to always have a camera on hand. 
The tourists that visit the lake area uh, through us are mostly from, from uh, the UK and uh, America. But we also have a lot of people from Germany. And we get many requests from both Canada, we've had requests from Mexico, Australia. No, no, I have never seen a script and nothing sem að tengist því annað en þetta. En frá því ég kom hérna fyrir meir en hólri ald, þá hef ég oft heyrt talað um skrimstlið. Þetta er, ég hef lesið margar gamlar sögur um skrimstlið. Ormurinn hann er menningasögulegt fyrirbæri hér um slóðir. Og ég held að það trúi margir, flest allir hér, hér að búar að Ormurinn sé til. When you come to the, the lake area here, on the lake district here, it's, uh, I think you should uh, always be aware that there might be something moving under the surface of the lake. And just very, very occasionally, it occurs above the surface. So you should always have your camera ready. Östersund is located in, in the middle of Sweden, in the middle of Scandinavia, in the northern part of Europe. Nicknamed the center of Sweden, the city of Östersund is considered unique. Its history is closely linked to the presence of the Vikings who colonized the region a thousand years ago. Today, it is the only major Swedish city that is not located on the seaside, exposing visitors to a landscape very different from the rest of the country. A, a very wild region with uh, very much mountains, snowy mountains, and it's more about the outdoor life. It's called the winter town, uh, so most of the events that happen in this town is during the, the winter. Uh, there are generally uh, events out on the, on the lake, because it froze, it's frozen, so you go out on the ice and you can go like hockey, both skating and uh, skiing, cross-country skiing. Skiing, everyone knows skiing. Skiing has a good reputation. It's good to be famous for good skiing. But whatever the season, a strange mystery occupies the minds of Ostersund residents, as it has for centuries. A mystery as impenetrable as the murky waters that house it. Ostersund is a, a town located by a, a lake called Storsund. It's a huge lake, the fifth largest in Sweden but it has um, more water than some of the other bigger ones because of the depth of the lake. This is a very big lake. Uh, part of it is very deep uh, and it's dark water. You just have to go one or two meters under surface and it's completely, it's getting really dark and at the bottom it's black. This body of water came into existence at the end of the last ice age, over 9,000 years ago. It extends over 464 square kilometers, or 180 square miles, and reaches depths of up to 74 meters, or 242 feet. The mysterious sightings in the lake have led some to speculate that such a body of water could provide a suitable habitat for a giant animal species. This ancient mystery has given the place a special character. Popular legends from past centuries and eyewitness accounts of recent years suggest that a creature unknown to science inhabits Sturson Lake. It is even believed that if its existence could be proved, mankind's understanding of science would forever be transformed. It's, it's a huge animal. It's not something that is normal, uh, that would exist in the lake, uh, in, in any lake. This is huge. Oh, there! 
The testimonies and sightings of strange activity on the lake are so numerous that very few dare rule out the possibility that something unknown is living in Sturson Lake. But everyone has their own theory about the beast's shape. I would describe the Great Lake Monster as uh, somewhat snake-like. Seems to be a, a long animal that uh, just goes up and down in the water. Like this. <laughs> it moves very, very fast. It's about more than 10 meters and it's black, gray, shifting. Humps. And uh, probably it has a head that looks like a dog or maybe a horse. Almost like something between a snake and a dragon. Maybe a cousin to, to some plesios or type of animal. from the dinosaur times, uh, with a long neck and a small head and uh, a big body. I saw something over the surface I can't explain. Big, black, beautiful, in the same time scary. So, of course, it is something, but what it is, it's, we don't know actually. The Lake Sturson. The fifth largest in Sweden has not changed much since the last ice age. Except for a few months in the summer, it spends most of the year covered in a thick layer of ice. In warmer weather, boaters and fishermen frequent its waters. Almost all of the inhabitants of Ostersund, and even most of Sweden, believe that a mysterious creature lives beneath the lake's surface. People think about it and talk about it, not every day, but absolutely every summer, because every summer someone sees it and it's in the newspaper that someone saw it. So uh, I would say it's like um, a conversation piece every year. It's always there. Yeah, I think it's uh, very well known uh, here uh, in this region. Uh, most people know someone that have seen it or talks about it. And it's the only lake monster we have in Sweden, so it's well known in Sweden too. Mostly it's maybe one or two articles in the newspaper every year about people have seen the monster. And of course, everyone doesn't go to the, to the press to tell about their observations. So I would say maybe there are around five or ten people every year who claim to have seen the monster, but not everyone is so open about it. Is it to alleviate the mystery that the Swedes gave the monster a name? In English, the beast is simply called Storsi, but the Swedes have their own word for it, named after the image they have of it. Stor sjö odjuret. It's uh, three words. Stor for big, sjö for lake, and odjur for, uh, for a beast. My name is Jötun Norlander. I saw this Great Lake Monster at uh, 1982. Yeah, I needed a special tool because I was at home and I went to my workshop and there I met my landlord, who owns the house that I rented the local in. Vi pratade och pratade och tittade lite grann efter stranden då lite längre ifrån oss. 75-80 meter ifrån oss så, så ser vi plötsligt någonting som ligger flytande i, i, vid strand, strax till stranden. 
Och det var som en timmerstock det, som, som var uh, lite uh, räfflad om vi säger så. Lite knurig som vi säger i Sverige. Lite uh, ojämn. Nåväl, det gick en liten stund så, så tittar vi lite längre utåt. Och då kommer plötsligt upp en båg ur vattnet. Den här bågen var 4-5 meter lång. Det var 60-70 cm hög. Och eh, den var mörkgrå, nästan mot svart. Med guldbruna stick i dem. Guldbruna punkter. Och då står det är den här bågen i, i vattnet då. Nå, nu var vi väldigt upphetsade, både Viktor och jag, så att, men vad var det där? Så, så då sa jag till Viktor att, men nu du minns han Viktor, nu såg vi allt storsjö och djuret. Nej, det här pratar vi inte så mycket om, säger han då. Så då höll vi tyst i, i tre, fyra år då. Men sen så tyckte vi det var lika bra att prata om och berätta om det här, för det var en verkligt spännande upplevelse. I saw Storsjödjuret, the Great Lake Monster, in 1977, on August the 10th. I was 16 years old and I was uh, on my way home on my bicycle. And I was looking down because I wanted to see if there was coming a car. So I was doing like this and uh, there was no car, but I, just for a split two seconds, I managed to see something huge rise in the, in the water down there. It was black and it came up like this, and the size of a Volkswagen and black in the water. So I, I had thought, what was that? But to the left of me, I had three gentlemen aged 40 to 50, and they were very upset, and they were talking loudly and pointing and like this. And I realized then, well, I've probably seen what they call Storsjöjuret. I just had a glimpse of it, but uh, as any kid would have done, I went down to the lake again, and then I had the second sighting. 40 minutes later, Michael was walking along the shore when he saw the creature up close. It was less than 10 meters or 33 feet from him. His memories are still very vivid, even 35 years later. I could see it was like two to three meters uh, long. Um, above the surface like this much. And uh, it swam not like this or like this, but straight forward, like in a boat turned upside down, which is a very um, common uh, description of this animal that many people have seen that you find again and again in articles. Uh, the, the skin of the animal was dark, or sort of black, I think, and it reminds me or reminded me of a whale skin, sort of. It, it, it had no hair or anything like that. And the, 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 the speed of it was, uh, you know, if you jog like this, that was the speed, so I walked uh, in a similar pace and, and uh, uh, for some distance, and I got this idea, and I'm not proud of it, but I'm not going to lie about it. I, I, I thought I, I wanted to see more than this. I wanted to see the head. So I picked up a small rock like this, and uh, I figured that if I hit it on the back, it might look up. That was the thinking of a 16-year-old. And I threw the stone. But he missed his target. For several minutes, Michael observed the movements of the beast on the surface of the water while it moved away from the shore. And then a, a boat was approaching from beneath the bridges, and then it dove. I was not afraid when I saw it. Um, I was safe on, the, on, the, on land, but I wouldn't have been wanting to be in a boat at that moment. I can tell you that. Most accounts of strange phenomena on Lake Sturson are reported by residents on the shore. But from time to time, a sighting is made on the water, and such encounters take on a whole new dimension. 
My name is Evert Festin. I have seen the Great Lake Monster from about three, four meters distance. En sen kväll i juli 1994 var jag och min fru ute och uttrade. På den som är sträckt så går det på en fisk och jag börjar på att dra in den. Och när jag kanske bara halvvägs in med fisken så går det på någonting på linan som går rakt ner i vattnet. Och då åker båten baklänges. Och det som drog båten då var alltså starkare än, än motorn. Och då släppte jag den första linan och koncentrerade mig på den här där det var någonting stort som var på. Och jag hade en känsla av att jag halade mig efter linan, inte att jag drog in. Sen i nästa stund, det som kommer upp är större än längre än båten. Och båten är 4,30 meter lång. Och det första intrycket var att det var en lång ko som låg i vattnet, men jag såg aldrig några huvud på den. Och det var mörkt på ena sidan och det var ljus på den andra. Och på den ljusa sidan då så ser jag två liksom spröt som rör sig sakta mot varandra. De är ungefär en meter långa och det var som en andningsrörelse. Och då är det här djuret bara någon meter bakom propellern. Och vi var i chock och jag, jag trodde aldrig vi skulle överleva om det kom närmare. Jag trodde att vi skulle kantra. Och jag vet inte hur länge vi satt där i, i båsen, men det som hände det var att vi ryckte till i linan. Och eh, lekandet uppe vid huvudlinan gick sönder. Och så, det, det som var på kroken åkte iväg med i vålden och dina. Och vi såg hur det bubbla på vattnet när det sjönk ner. Vi var i en chock. And I don't know how long time we, we waited sitting there. Not wanting to damage his career, Everett waited until after his retirement before publicly disclosing his experience. If his story is to be believed, he and his wife are the witnesses who have come closest to the creature. That was also the last time Everett's wife ever ventured onto the lake. The history of the great lake monster, or Storsi, goes as far back as the history of Sweden. One of the oldest references to its existence is found on a rune stone dating from the Middle Ages. During the Viking Age, it, uh, Östersund wasn't founded, so the, the center of this part was the island in the lake called Frösön. And uh, that's where we have all the remains from the Viking Age, the, the graves. We have the runic stone, that's uh, the only one in this area. It was carved some uh, time between 1050 and 1070, we think. There are several runestones in Scandinavia, most of which recall the epic battles and legendary figures who have marked the history of the peninsula. The rune in Ostersund commemorates a turning point in the development of the region. The runestone tells the story about who built uh, the bridge between Frösen Island and what is now Östersund, and also about the Christianization of uh, these lands, which took place around that time. But what intrigues most is the engraving's depiction. The, the picture of, of the dragon in itself as the only dragon um, depicted on a runestone in, in Scandinavia could mean something, we don't know. Could be related to some um, ancient uh, Viking folklore or something like that, which is very interesting. And if it is often true that a picture is worth a thousand words, in this case, it seems to be worth a thousand questions. In the 17th century, the first mention of a sea monster in Lake Sturson appears in religious annals. From there, the beast enters local folklore. A, a vicar in, in the 1650s, I think, was, was the first person to write something about it. 
Without knowing it, the vicar gave birth to a legend that has inspired fear in local residents for centuries. And it was two trolls who was cooking near the sea. And suddenly it was a big bang. And a cat was jumping up from the cooking and uh, just jumped down to the Great Lake. Then we know that people talk about this for more than 400 years ago. 250 years later, the beast bursts forth from the world of fairy tales and legends to make a surprise appearance on the surface of the lake, in front of one of the region's most powerful political figures, no less. In 1894, our uh, member of parliament, Jens Bromé, claimed he had seen the monster along with some of his friends. And they decided to pursue it. So they took some guns and some boats trying to, to catch the animal. But it was going uh, too fast and it just disappeared down to the depths. And he actually told the press that he had seen the animal. And after that, we can see uh, the, the rising of the observations of the animal, because of course, if a person with that high ranking in the society says he has seen, seen the Great Lake Monster, it must exist. That is probably the one time uh, that had a real window open when people were fearless, they talked about it. And we have hundreds and hundreds of um, witness reports in the archives. The media of the time seized on the story, and Storsi became the sought-after goal of a massive expedition. It was a very interesting expedition, and even the Swedish king gave the company organization money because it was very interesting in what is it under the surface. Prepared for whatever might come their way, the hunters left with a veritable arsenal of impressive instruments all of which are now on display at the Jämtli Museum in Ostersund. In front of you, you have the trap that we used to trying to catch the monster in 1894. We put a pig in it and put it by the lake in hopes to get the, the monster into it. Here you also can see some of the other uh, things we used to try to catch the monster. Uh, here we have the harpoon, and uh, they made a big hole in the ice, and uh, a man stood by the hole with his harpoon, and he, hopefully, he would see the monster, and then he could uh, harpoon it. But uh, the monster never showed itself, so it's, uh, he, he was not successful. As a deputy director of Jantli, it's uh, important for us to show the story about the monster and uh, the stories about all the people who have seen the monster, because it's such a big and important story of the region. People have been seeing this monster for 400 years. We can't just uh, wipe that out of our history. It's an important part, so we couldn't really build a museum without it. The Jämtli Museum in Ostersund documents the history of Storsi and its numerous alleged appearances around the lake since the 1800s. This is actually an embryo of the Great Lake Monster. It was given to the museum on April 1st, 1986. This embryo was found on the shore of the lake in 1984. But uh, it's very difficult to see if it's actually the Great Lake Monster or if it's an embryo of something else. But uh, the fun part is that it was given on April the 1st, Fool's Day. This is the map of the uh, observation of the Great Lake Monster. And as you can see, the, the most uh, observations are around Östersund, Frösen. Most sightings were indeed recorded around Frosen Lake, very near the site where, a thousand years earlier, the famous rune was erected. This is 
actually not updated for the last 20 years, but it's still the same pattern today. So we, we see uh, the monster where the people live. That's where the most sightings are. We have maybe five to ten witnesses or stories every year in local media. And if you think that maybe one out of every ten that sees something, tell the press, well then we're talking about thousands of, of uh, witnesses. But of the thousands of possible witnesses, many do not wish to publicly share their experiences. An association has been created to enable them to privately discuss their experiences. This is how I think it is. Flera har sett liksom en stock som ligger. Och de har sett att det är någonting ovanför vattenytan. De tror att det är en sten eller någonting. Among people have witnessed this. There is this association called Föreningen Storförjuret. They have uh, meetings on a yearly basis. They move from town to town around the lake like this. Every year new witnesses come forward at those meetings. Usually there is about 80 to 100 people. So they have a meeting every summer and then uh, they can talk together about what they have seen. And it, it's serious. Everett Festen is an influential member of the Association of the Friends of Storzy created in 1990. Currently, there are 90 registered members who meet several times a year to discuss their experiences. Everett, who stayed silent for decades, understands the importance of creating a space in which everyone can express themselves with confidence and in safety. It may be that way, he believes, that the mystery of Lake Sturson will one day be solved. It can be up to five, six thousand people have seen it, but many of them don't talk. And every evening we have this, there come new witnesses. Some people come along and they say, well, I saw this in 1945, I've kept sick, kept, I haven't talked about it. But you hear all these stories. And then you start to think, how many people have seen this? must be quite a number of them. Each testimony reported to the association is recorded. They note all the details and circumstances of the sightings, and the data is then examined, compared, and measured. I have reported on that there was one who saw three people who saw them in the I can't say that I saw the same animal twice or if it was two different individuals. The first I saw was obviously huge. The second was a little bit, uh, not quite as big as I would have envisaged after the first. But you know, there's bound to be a family of sorts in, in the lake, a population of them, that maybe they can communicate some way. Everybody say the Great Lake Monster or Stor Sjur 1. I would rather say Storsjöodjur N, the Great Lake Monsters, because uh, I don't think that there is just one animal monster or whatever it is. It has, has to be more of them, because uh, we can go back 1,000 years from now, and I don't think uh, that the monster or whatever it could be could be that old. It's very interesting that when, when the uh... Ice Age came to a halt. Uh, new lakes were created that was connected to the sea. And I believe that whatever this is, it has to be a family of something that once existed in the sea that now lives in this lake. Something that we thought was perhaps ex extinct. Could be some, some type of relative to maybe plesiosaurs or something. I don't know, but a lot of people have seen the long neck and, and what I saw, how could that swim like that if it didn't have fins and maybe some sort of a tail helping it to move along. It should be most natural to have uh, that it would be a fish at least because uh, if it would be an, a mammal then it, uh, where does it uh, live uh, during the winter? I mean uh, where to get some air and breathe? So that's why I think it should be a fish. Some divers have seen some big heels. It could, be, it could be the both, big fishes, and it could be something that we have not found out what it is at the moment. 
alla de här och som är en vacker dag så, så är det någon som får en riktig, riktig närbild. and uh, I'm a cryptologist. Cryptology is about uh, animals that uh, are not proven existing. Um, crypto stands for uh, hidden uh, and zoology uh, is well animal kingdom. I don't consider myself as uh, a believer. Uh, because uh, it's uh, non-scientific to be believing in things. It's better to keep an open mind. And uh, I have a quite an open mind about uh, there being something and the like. I just don't know what. Ivan's approach to the Storsi mystery must be considered rational and evidence-based, a fact that surprises mainstream scientists who view Ivan's discipline of cryptozoology with skepticism. In the scientific uh, society, uh, there is a very anti-cryptozoology feeling. Um, it falls under almost the same thing as alien sightings or ghosts. Uh, and uh, they find this area being a lost cause. If the Storsi riddle is considered by scientists to be a lost cause, it's probably because for every person who believes in the monster, there are others who are skeptical and sometimes go as far as to openly discredit arguments for the monster's existence. Both skeptics and professional skeptics, um, scientists, use the same explanation for every uh, sea monster sighting ever, uh, everywhere on the planet. Great catfish, uh, big log, uh, weather phenomena, birds, uh, Swimming elks, but I, I'm not sure that's very common in other parts of the world. There are people who don't believe in this, and they go, don't go to our meetings and listen. And they say it's impossible, and they think we are crazy. They usually don't call people liars to their face, but behind their back, certainly. Oh, he wants to be in the paper, he said he's a monster. It's very sad, really. It angers me that people that have seen this um, are treated like this. It's like bullies in a schoolyard sort of situation. M Mr. Festin's sighting is one of the really good ones. Um, and he's working so hard and he, he you know, people like that, you, you shouldn't belittle them. I think that's disgraceful. But someday, you know, people like him and, and others that work f with this will be vindicated and, you know, I hope it happens within a few years. I really don't know why people believe or don't believe, but um, I think that the people who believe in the, the monster, the Great Lake monster, they have actually seen something that they can't explain in any other way than that it must be an animal. You can see it in other countries as well. The, the Great Lake Monster has cousins in Scotland, in Norway, in, in the US, and all over the, the world. So it's not only in Östersund that we see this kind of animal, so it has to be something that uh, the human being is, is um, seeing and trying to explain all over the world. We discover uh, new um, animals almost every year, N new sharks, new seals. And w maybe we have something extraordinary here that one day will just be a, a com complete sensation. And then we will have the scientists uh, coming here. And I'll say, told you so.
Efforts to capture Storsi or to try to prove its existence have not been successful so far, despite the sophisticated attempts made by the most convinced. But this is not a reason to give up. Over time, interest in solving the mystery has not diminished. Only the methods have changed. Uh, today we're going to dive for the Storsia in the Great Lake. And we will be uh, going down to about a maximum of 18 meters. These divers will explore the depths of the lake in the hope not of capturing the beast, but of obtaining images of it or any traces it might have left behind. Residents of Ostersund and any interested tourists are invited to attend the peculiar dive school. So the Great Lake uh, Master Course is uh, designed for two days. It's one day of theory. The next day is uh, two dives that we're going to look at the monster. We have this uh, story of the monster, so uh, it's fun to, to take it and uh, see what you can find. To help maximize the chances of success on these expeditions, the dives are done only under the most favorable weather conditions and are mostly carried out between the island of Frosan and Ostersund's shore. are very experienced diving instructors. They have spent dozens of hours exploring the depths of many bodies of water around the world. But according to them, nothing compares to a dive into Lake Storsen. I've never seen the Great Lake monster Storsjuret, but uh, sometimes can feel like something is uh, watching us uh, when we do diving. It felt like who is there? You can you can feel in the in your stomach when you when you dive that there is something around you, but you can't really make for sure what it is. Uh, and the first time I, I felt that, I my pulse went up, and I have to I have to control myself a bit <laughs> because it was it was a bit scary. Uh, but then I, I looked up and I couldn't see anything. It's, it's a bit hard to describe, but and I never felt that before anywhere else. It's not every dive that you have the feeling either. It's, a, it's, a, it's specific dives, but uh, many of, of my dives I have, have felt it. It was not a, a good... Uh, Great Lake Monster Day today. Uh, this was the second dive in my monster program, and I didn't see anything. I didn't feel anything. We saw a lot of uh, of uh, plants, but no fish. And uh, the monster's primary food is fish, so uh, I, I don't think it's around here right now. When we dived here last time, it was more summer. Uh, so, I think it's probably gone deeper now for the winter. Uh, you never know how many dives you have to do. Uh, if you're lucky, you can find it. But uh, some, some must dive a lot of times. I hope that I one day will uh, spot Stufujuret. And I hopefully have my camera with me so that I can show it to the world. An hour's drive south of Ostersund, in the city of Svenstavik, other means are still taken to try to locate Storsi. Today we're going to search for the Great Lake monster, Storsjöjuret. Beautiful weather, a little bit rough on the sea maybe, but uh, the weather is so good, the condition is perfect for it, so let's go for it. <laughs> Suzanne Kinstrom has hunted the creature for years. She directs a research center focused on Storsi. With her team, she travels the lake extensively, looking for clues. In 2008, 
Suzanne decided to take drastic measures. One of our members saw something uh, in the summer 2007, and that gave us an idea to work with cameras. We have behind us now this small islet with the cameras. You can see the four cameras over the surface, but we have also cameras under the surface. Three who are searching for the monster in real time, so we can see it from the observation center. In 2009, Suzanne established an observation center to find the Great Lake Monster, complete with the most sophisticated equipment. This is uh, what we call the surveillance station, where we have uh, the live feed cameras. Every time there's a movement, the cameras will register it, and we can go back and watch it and see what it is. This uh, technology is very unique for a museum. It's very easy, like with the touch screen, you don't have to use any tools. Any, anyone can use it from a 70-year-old to a three-year-old. With its permanent monitoring system capable of detecting movements on the surface of the water, as well as in its depths, the Great Lake Monster Center is unique in the world. Some devices are even programmed to be sensitive to heat. Uh, this is the only center in Sweden as a sort of a museum combined with high technology. That's why we want to have people to come here and be a searcher. <laughs> In being invited to scrutinize the images captured by underwater cameras, visitors become involved in research efforts. They are encouraged to share their observations, which are then analyzed by the researchers. So you don't know when the time comes, but you must, you must have the situation, and now we have it with the cameras. Images captured by visitors shortly after the center's opening have piqued the curiosity of hundreds of thousands of internet users. It was a, in the video, it was a small thing, just like a small worm, but it has an interesting mouth, just an upside down mouth. It's not a fish, it's not a frog, but it has a very interesting head. When people around the world saw it, it was a big bang for us. And then on three days, half a million people was just coming in the website. Then we understand that people all around the world are very interesting in unknown things. And someday, because of the new technology, we'll know. But, but um, for the moment, it's very difficult and it's a big lake. The, the, the people that are currently doing it are doing it on sort of one location, hoping to find it over there, I guess. But, but science has a long way to go yet. We need the new technologies here to, to really find out about this. Get the money to, to do proper research with sonar uh, equipment and so on on a much larger scale. That's the answer. When you come to Östersund, you will notice the animal on uh, quite a few places. And it's obvious that the municipality of Östersund, they really want to make it the symbol of the city. Up to now, observing Storzy in its natural habitat has been an unrealized dream. But it's impossible to miss him on the streets of Östersund. I don't think uh, tourists uh, are attracted to coming here, especially for the monster, but it gives the area a special value, special uh, characteristics uh, that are positive for the region. According to many residents, Storsi brought Ostersund out of obscurity, and some are convinced that the creature could further enhance the local economy. The monster is um, somewhat important to the tourism to Östersund, but it could be more important. I think we are a bit uh, hesitating if, if we, how much we should um, uh, use it in the marketing of the region and the city, because on one hand it's a great symbol and we 
uh, we like the story and we think it's special. And on the other hand, some people think it's a bit embarrassing. Oh, should we really we be famous for something that maybe don't exist? Uh, I think it could be much bigger, in fact. Uh, I think they have underestimated it, the potential for tourism and so on. So people know uh, that this is not just an ordinary town. We have something special here. The Great Lake Monster is an important part of the cultural heritage of, uh, of Jämtland. And uh, as a curator of the museum and the deputy director, I'm not really interested in whether it exists or not. The important thing to us uh, is the stories that people uh, have to tell. And uh, we are full of respect for all the, the witnesses and the people that claim that they have seen something, because they, they have. We absolutely believe that they have seen something. And it's their stories that, that we collect, and it's their stories that's important to us. I think the general public is not going to have too much of an interest in this until the day comes when you have the big head headlines. They have now conclusive a, a shot of film or something, or a dead animal. Then it will be a world sensation. Everybody will talk about it. It will be one of the biggest stories of our lives, really. I really hope that in my lifetime we will find out what it is. A territory of sea and mountains, North Carolina has been described by early explorers as the most beautiful land under heaven. But this coastal U.S. state hides its finest treasure inland, one shaped not by the forces of nature, but by the hand of man, Lake Norman. Located close to the capital city of Charlotte, Lake Norman is so large that it qualifies as an inland sea, covering an area of 132 square kilometers or 51 square miles and extending over 55 kilometers or 34 miles in length. It has become a paradise for anglers and boating enthusiasts. We have national fish tournaments that people come from all around. So there are a lot of fishermen that come to Lake Norman for sport fishing. You can rent boats, you can sail, you can rent houses or, or cabins on the lake. We also have the Catawba Queen. They have two boats out there, the Lady of the Lake and the Catawba Queen, on which you can take a, a luncheon cruise or you can take a dinner cruise. Lake Norman was created following the construction of a hydroelectric dam on the Catawba River in the 1960s. Its water is used to cool the reactors of a nearby nuclear power plant. But this lake is talked about for other reasons. It is said that its dark waters and jagged contours hide a mysterious creature, an as yet unidentified species of animal, one that is shy and mishappen. They said it was large, whale-like, dolphin-like, that just sort of breached the water, had a, you know, a trail for a few minutes, and then went back down again. There's stories of people being dragged underwater by a creature in this lake. Of a long lizard type thing with, with lots of teeth and four small legs seems to be the common description of him. I've heard people talk about um, witnessing strange movement in the water and maybe a, a wake following something that was partially seen, partially unseen. It had, to me, a, a, an alligator head with a snake body with two fins on the side with claws coming off those fins. That's what I saw. Two years after the creation of the dam, a rumor spread throughout the region causing widespread panic. Apparently, while working to repair the dam, divers were surprised by a large creature appearing out of nowhere. The Lake Norman monster. And of course, that's a lake monster down here that is reputed to uh, inhabit this lake that they built. They finished this back in 1963. And of course, they created this, uh, this huge lake, the largest lake in North Carolina. It's over 35,000 uh, acres of it. 
Ever since this happened, there's a lot of pro stories have cropped up. People have talked about seeing different things in the water. Well, after the dam was built, of course, this was a, um, a fertile fishing area. Uh, there were lots of crags and logs and that sort of thing for the fish to live in. The main story we heard was that uh, don't ever go swimming at the dam because there are catfish as big as Volkswagens. And of course, you could identify with a, a fish as big as a Volkswagen, which would be fairly intimidating. And we heard tales of divers who would be down inspecting the dam who would come back up and say, you won't believe what I saw. And that just fed into the, um, to the whole, don't go swimming there because there's something down there. And of course, the tales of the Lake Norman monster, Normie. There have been various sightings um, of Normie and um, uh, some to be believed, some perhaps not. I have not sighted it personally, though um, we have a pretty big lake and uh, pretty deep water. Carl McCall lives on the edge of the lake and considered himself a skeptic concerning the rumors of a mysterious creature's existence until the day he and his daughter witnessed the monster for themselves. Honestly, nothing of that size um, I've ever seen before, making such a wake where it actually would rock a sailboat that's actually more into a dock. Yeah, it was pretty big. I didn't think there was like something that big in lakes, like maybe in the ocean, but it was really big and I didn't know what it was. Growing up near the shore, I know what whales look like and sharks. I've seen them, dolphins, obviously, here in North Carolina. In the lake regions, you know, you see big fish and things like that, but nothing quite like this. And if I was the type of guy to actually take pictures and text, start texting people, then I definitely saw something that was a little out of the ordinary. Some local residents blamed the existence of the monster of Lake Norman, nicknamed Normie, on the nuclear power plant located on its shores. But other interesting hypotheses could explain this mystery. If many believe that radiation from the nuclear power plant could be the origin of the Lake Norman monster, others believe that the creature lurked in the waters of the Catawba River long before the construction of the dam. John Hare is the author of 20 books dealing mainly with history. He investigated local legends to write his book, Mysterious Creatures of the Tar Heel State. The Catawba River is uh, sort of steeped in uh, history and legends. There is a tradition, a long tradition, of stuff, uh, animals, mysterious kind of creatures inhabiting this river long before they ever dug this lake. I knew about the Catawba River because we used to sing and fish the Catawba River from up near Troutman all the way to where they built the dam. Lake Norman now covers over 530 miles of shoreline. So it, it's huge. It's bigger than the Sea of Galilee. And it's hard to imagine. There could be some creatures lurking in the deep because it's pretty deep down there where the original river went through. One of the prime examples would have been uh, the Catawba Indians used to tell the story about a uh, fellow that was uh, living in a little village over on the east side of the river, and he canoed across the river, and he was hunting over there, and he sees this, this, this huge animal he saw. So he's like, he didn't know what it was. It was there on the river. So then he gets up and to investigate, and it's a giant snake. So he's an Indian brave. He thinks, well, you know, it'd be, be kind of good to show this off if I took you back home, you know? And, and, and so he takes and shoots it with his bow and arrow. Well, it hits and it didn't kill, it just bounced off. But what it did was it made this animal mad, so the creature let go of what it was attacking and killed the Indian, killed the brave. This, so uh, he died there, his villagers you know, saw what had happened and stuff. And according to legend, sometimes it would sweep people into the river. There was a crossing place and it would sweep them down into a deep pool and take them down there and, and, and kill them. So. I've heard there were stories, but I never thought about them being weird creatures when I when I was growing up. This is something new, you know, this Lake Norman monster. I think when you get a, um, a big body of water, 
that things like this will come up. There's all kind of stories going around about uh, monsters, and somebody has named one of them Normie after Lake Norman. I think that's amazing and, you know, a little fun. <laughs> you know, I've never saw one myself. I was just interested in catching fish. There's been sort of a gap, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people in the knowledge. So, of course, you know, we have these stories back from the, the 1800s, then it comes up into the 20th century. Sort of this uh, latest manifestation came about back in the, around the year 2000. I started the website LakeNormanMonster.com after spending a couple of years here fishing on the lake, visiting local bait shops, talking to other fishermen, and just hearing fish tales that have happened, you know, from the entire history of the lake. And it, it turned into a, a little hobby just for people to come in and anonymously post sightings and grew from there and just kept growing and kept growing. And we now have over a decade of sightings through LakeNormanMonster.com. Honestly, I was surprised by the amount of sightings that came through the website. The um, local newspaper at the time picked up the website pretty quickly and published an article about it. And then the sightings just really started coming in. You know, the first month we had 47 visitors and the second month we had over a thousand and it just grew from there. Sunday morning, that's nice. Son-in-law and I, well, sitting right on the bank. The strange scene witnessed by Amelia and her father during a routine walk along the lake is not only engraved in their memory, they managed to take a few photos. Well, I was over here, it was a Saturday night, and I was walking up this path, and we saw a chair in the lake. And I said to Amelia, you know, let's go ahead and, and why don't you run over and get the chair in the lake, because she was more dressed for it. And she had run around, and as she was running through the path to get on this side of the lake, I saw the chair bouncing up and down, and I started to watch this chair jump up and down out of the water. The chair was like in the middle of the lake, and right next to the chair, the head popped up and left a huge wake, and it was swimming really fast. What I saw come out of the lake was a, a long head like an alligator, um, but it did, definitely had a long body. And what had happened is it left the chair and actually moved around to the other uh, side of the cove there, where actually where I was standing. And I watched it proceed to swim to the sailboat. And then behind the sailboat, it created such a wake that the sailboat was actually moving up and down and creating a wake. It was obviously attacking something, but we had watched this creature for about 10 minutes, maybe even 15 minutes, and, and watched it swimming back and forth from, the, from each side of the cove. Gus Gustafson is a fishing guide and seasoned fisherman. With 60 years of experience traveling to every corner of the vast reservoir, Gus thinks that the lake has kept no secrets from him except one. There's a lot of good reasons why the dam is a place that's a magnet for fish, particularly big, big fish. That's where some of the biggest catfish in the lake are caught. Some of the biggest striped bass are caught there. Many of the uh, normie sightings of Bender's at the dam. There is a, um, what they call a hot hole near the power plant where they put the water back into the lake. And that keeps that area warm year round. So during the winter, there's places for large fish to stay and feed and grow. It's very, very, very deep. So certain times of the year when the conditions aren't to their liking back in these shallower areas, the fish get down there in that deep water, particularly in the winter and in the summertime. It's just a place for them to, to spend time, sometimes maybe just even hibernate. If they're not feeding, they may just rest down there because it's kind of out of the way and it's so deep that uh, they kind of go unnoticed. fish really don't stop growing if they have a good supply of food and if they have a big enough area. So there could be some rather large fish in and around the hot holes that just continue to grow and grow and grow. If one believes the fishermen's theories, fish observed at the periphery of the dam would tend to be oversized. But since its creation, Lake Norman has been regularly stocked 
which has led some to speculate that Normi may be in fact the result of a crossing of species or genetic mutation. Well, you know, anytime you have a nuclear power plant on a, on a lake or a body of water, you're gonna get warmer water. We can actually swim here in February, in, in March, because the water is so warmed up by the new, those nuclear reactors. So we do get big catfish here. Um, the fish tend to grow a little bit bigger, but again, from what I saw, something this big was pretty amazing uh, to see. You know, it very well could be a crossbreeding of some sort. I mean, this, this lake was man-made. It was filled up, you know, from the dam they built in 1963. So, you know, it could be a crossbreed of some sort of creature or animal that they never really uh, found or anything. The, the, the greatest possibility is, is crossbreeding. There are fish that, in Lake Norman that are hybrid. There are fish that have been put in Lake Norman to help control things like hydrilla, uh, invasive weed, that uh, are not native and are supposedly sterile. But, you know, there's that great quote from Jurassic Park, life always finds a way. So it's possible that, you know, some of these hybrid fish that they've put into the lake are not sterile and have been reproducing and hybridizing with other fish that are in the lake. You know, I wondered about whether there was any truth behind the story, and I thought, oh, that's just one of those things that people talk about. But having been here for 40 years, it's something that so many stories, so many coincidences could not be based on false. They have to be based on fact. In people reputable of all ages and walks of life, there's always someone that has seen him or seen some part of him, his tail as he goes down under the water, what have, whatever it might happen to be. You know, um, it's the preponderance of evidence that gives it credence in my mind, although I have never seen him. I was scared because I swim in this water all the time and I'm like too scared to go in it now because I don't know what it is. No, I'm a kind of a skeptic. I thought maybe it was just a different type of fish or something we've never seen before in these waters. But um, I have a boat myself, and I'd never seen anything like it. It was like a head of an alligator. A fin had popped out with, with claws on the end of it. This is not just an average fish that could shake a whole sailboat that's actually docked. My friends swim in this water all the time, and I asked them if they've seen something like that, and they have said no. They didn't believe me at first when I said it, because they were like, nothing's that big in the lake. But I was like, I saw it. And we do have uh, pictures of it. For the past 10 years, witness testimonials like Mokal's have been collected on a website dedicated to Normie. But even the most detailed reports, such as those supported by pictures, have not shed light on the mystery. We have had users send in photographs of things they see in the lake, and um, it's hard to say. Again, it's hard to judge distances. You know, you do see a head or a body with a wake behind it. it. It could be a small animal swimming. It could be, you know, a deer crossing the lake. It could be something breaching the water from below to eat. So, you know, there are a few photos. A few stories that made me question if it was true or not. One of them was actually submitted by a school teacher that had taken her class on a cruise through one of the local cruise ships. And she submitted the siding, but the entire class of 25, 30 children saw something breach the water and go back down. So that was, you know, a, a, a mass group siding there. And that made me think, well, maybe there is something big out there. One of the things would argue in favor of there being a possibility of there being a large animal out here is the fact that the story's not isolated to, to, to Lake Norman. But you find it in this same river system. You see it up there. And Lake James has its story of a monster. You also see the one down along the Santee in Lake Murray. I've even ran across an account of a sea monster uh, being sighted off the mouth of the Santee River between uh, Georgetown and Charleston. So if there is, uh, 
any sort of large creature. There's a river where, where that is a candidate in this neck of the woods to, ha to, to be home to some sort of large aquatic creature that's been here for, for millennia, even since before the, the Native Americans came, that it would be the uh, Santee Catawba system. Witness reports of a strange creature lurking in Lake Norman have been accumulating on a website dedicated to Normie. Summer Cloninger is one of the most recent witnesses of a strange phenomenon. She has always lived by the lake and has been surprised many times by alligators, water snakes, and other amazing animals. We were out here at the park and we brought our son to play. It was a really still day. There wasn't much, there weren't any many wakes or anything. We noticed the water, it just kind of started to raise up all of a sudden, and it was this wake that came up. The weird thing about what we saw was that on each side, the wake was like 10 to 15 feet long, and it was pretty high, it was about like maybe like a foot high. Like it would come up a little bit, enough to where you could see the top of its skin. And it was about the color of a lake, like, um, like a greenish brown color. It was making its way down toward this cove right here on Ranger Island. After we lost sight of it, we heard geese over there that were hanging out in the cove. They just took off. You know, they were making a lot of noise and they just took off, so that was kind of weird too. I spend about 200 days a year on the water. I can only come to a conclusion based on my own experiences. I spend a lot of time on the water. There's a lot of things that you can see on Lake Norman that we would consider unusual. But if you take a hard look at them, most of them are explainable. I've seen upside down canoes floating in the water. Now, a canoe from a certain angle in a certain weather might look like something that it isn't. We have a lot of docks on the lake and a lot of things blow into the water off of people's docks. I picked up a 10-foot wakeboard last year in the middle of the lake. As far as coves in, on the lake and whether there's caves on the lake, yes, there's, first of all, there's thousands of coves on this lake. Uh, on the lower end of the lake, which is where I live, the, the lake is probably 95% developed. As you get further north on the river, there's less de on the lake, there's less development. And there are some small coves in there that are overgrown with trees and, uh, and things that would look like tunnels in the trees where one could define them as a cave where something could hide. Sure there is, there's, there's that on all lakes. I have learned in my 77 years never to say never and never to say impossible in terms of there being some uh, living thing in Lake Norman that uh, is oversized, let's put it that way. As for what I saw, I could just never really wrap my mind around what it could be, you know, given history of fish and their personalities and, you know, when they come to to the top and get air and just, yeah. It wasn't, it was, wasn't like um, any behavior that, you know, you would think from a fish, even like a giant catfish. They're bottom feeders, they stay toward the bottom, you know, like, and if it did come up and trail, like, I don't, I just don't see how it would leave a wake like that. It was just so weird. But I would like to know, um, what is in this lake that people keep reporting and that they're seeing, you know, it could be a new species that has never been discovered, you know, all around Lake uh, Norman and just North Carolina, just the Catawba River, there are so many sightings in lakes, that, you know, it's just really strange. There's something to it. An avid fisherman, Captain Gus regularly searches the waters of the lake with a well-equipped boat. From time to time, he even puts his boat at the disposal of visitors curious to learn more about this legendary beast. 
Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to look for Normie the Lake Norman Monster. It's a, it's a quest we've been on for 10 or 15 years now, and uh, some days we see some indication of them, a lot of days we don't, but we've got electronic equipment on the boat. We'll use our eyes, we'll use our ears. What we've got here is we've got some pretty sophisticated uh, electronics. Uh, we've got GPS, where we, we, we've actually got a topo map on here where we can see the bottom contours. We've got two, um, we got two imaging devices. This one shows off to either side of the boat. This one actually shows, you can see we're going over a little brush pile or something right down, down there now. It'll show objects below the boat. It'll show, it'll show brush piles, it'll show fish, it'll show uh, anything that just happens to pass under. Now see, a lot of people mistake what we're looking at there and they'll think that's the monster itself. Actually, that's a school of bait fish all bunched up. And they're just a school of fish swimming just in, together. They swim together for protection from the, the bigger fish. All right, here's our boat coming along this drop off right here. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go back in the back cove over here. Here's some fish images right here. See the fish down there? Those are fish, they're not big enough to be a monster. back in some of these back coves like this see it's real quiet you don't see a lot of people around and these 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 creatures can slither along they can either go under the water or they can come just below the surface and they'll slide up in and out of these places and and they'll never be seen because nobody really cares and nobody looks for them The captain assumes that the beast he's been looking for all these years in the depths of Lake Norman is probably the same one that terrified divers busy repairing the dam in the 1970s. Every lake has about the same story where the divers are down there working and doing whatever divers do at the dam. And if all of a sudden the sun's blocked out and they look up and there's a gigantic something swimming above them and they get scared and they get out of the water. And in the case of Lake Norman, when they reported their sighting to whoever their boss was, he, they were laughed at. And uh, they just, they didn't say they'd quit, but they never came back to work. And they just, they just refused to go back into Lake Norman because they know they had seen what we're looking for today. Rational and scientific explanations are obviously a strong counterweight to the many assumptions about Normie. Jake Bussolini, expert freshwater fisherman and author of several books, sides firmly on the side of the skeptics. Well, one thing, I'm a specialist in sonar, uh, underwater image detection. And uh, I have sonar units on both of my boats, and uh, they're always on from the time I leave the dock till the time I come back. And uh, anytime I see an image on my sonar that's unusual, I take a picture of that image with my digital camera, put it right in my computer, and I have thousands and thousands of photographs of underwater images. And I use those in my books and I use those in my lectures to show people what's going on under the water. Here's a photograph that I took of something that looks to be about 15 feet high. 
It could even be imagined to have a tail on it if you look down on the right-hand side. This is a very common photograph. This is a school of about 2,000 perch. Oh, I have seen on my sonar, I have seen abnormally large images underwater, but I was able to explain them all as, as, as very large schools of fish. We have the uh, snub-nosed gar in this lake. They are a very unusual looking fish. And uh, I have personally seen six foot long gar. Uh, in the water, and uh, a gar to someone who's not used to seeing gar is a very weird looking fish. People get frightened of them, but they really do no damage. They're really surface feeders, they keep the water clean, and they're actually a very good fish to have in the lake. If it's not a monster in Lake Norman, I would probably speculate that it's a large fish. It could be a gar, uh, it could be something along you know, that lines. We have had an alligator caught in the lake. That was uh, a pet that was released, though. They're not usually native to this area. So it you know, could have been anything like that. And then, you know, people get out. It's hard to judge distances on the lake, especially if it's you know, late in the day or early in the morning and you see something. It could be very small, close to you, or it could be very big and far away, you know, if you're not familiar with navigating the lake. Part of the problem that we have on, on these reported sightings and photographs is we, we never kind of hear the conditions that were surrounding at the time. Was it springtime? Was it winter? Was it windy? Was it not windy? For instance, out at the end of our cove here, there's a very long sandbar and it's very shallow. And in the springtime, the big carp, and these are three and four foot long carp, they go out onto that sandbar to spawn and they spawn in shallow water near the surface and they create a lot of waves. I've seen them, I've been there, I've, I've, uh, I've fished in those areas when they were spawning. And they will actually create, if, if you get enough of them spawning the same way, they'll create a little bit of a wave that may be six to eight inches high. With regard to the nuclear plant and, you know, the possibility of nuclear radiation, of course, that's always a question that people have. Uh, from my technical background and from my understanding of the technology of this particular nuclear plant, I would be very doubtful that there's any possibility of radiation exposure. Now, again, I can never say it's impossible because, you know, we don't always know what's going on inside that plant. The only thing I would see that would pose a threat because they pump so many gallons of this lake through the reactor coolant, you know, the whole systems cool it down. Um, they pull so much water in, you know, like one and a third times what the lake is, is what I've been told. But, you know, if anything had been compromised and some kind of material reached the lake, which is pretty rare, I would think, because um, there's so many safety standards they have to abide by. but. I think what would it would really do is maybe like um, just kind of like genetically alter their genes, maybe just um, kind of make it more sick. I don't think it could develop a huge creature like people would think it would morph and, you know, because like looking at what radiation can do to your genes and your cells, it doesn't really work that way. It's more just quick to kill you and just kind of give you deformities. I don't really think there's a link between the nuclear plant and whatever this is, especially given like other lakes around here, you know, they're seeing similar things, you know. Um, so I just think that maybe there's a species, you know, we have 95% of our waters are just unexplored, you know, so maybe we can't really say what it is. Until somebody can bring back some proof, like some actual verifiable scientific data, this means uh, not photographic proof, but, but the actual creature itself. Until somebody can do that, then, then it'll remain just a really good part of our folklore, which is a valuable part of our folklore, and it's a part of our traditions and our heritage. And so it's just, a, it's just the latest in a long series of tales that sort of try to explain 
maybe what they don't understand that's out here. Maybe they see out there, they see some animals. They, it's just the way they come to uh, come to deal with uh, uh, what what's living out there. Whether skeptical or not, all the residents of Lake Norman agree that the monster of Lake Norman is the true star of the region's folklore, a folklore otherwise dominated by incredible fishing stories. Like, uh, you could say they're just good fishing stories. A lot of times they'll come back and say, I, I caught a fish and he was this big. And, you know, each time you tell it, it get, gets bigger and bigger. So, you know, who, who knows? Maybe somebody saw a, a big gator or something out here one time, and, and then uh, next thing you know, they get to telling it, and it's the Loch Ness Monster swimming around out here. You never know. But uh, if there is anything out here, though, this would be a prime candidate for a large creature. Of course, this has got a lot of habitat out here, a big lake. When I was uh, when I was younger, I always you know had to open mind to possibilities of paranormal creatures and things like that. But uh, like I said, I'm still a child at heart and would like to believe that they're seeing something out there. You know, enough people have submitted sightings and said that they've seen something. You know, obviously there's something there. What it is, I don't know. I don't think it's a dinosaur-like creature that's been mutated, but I, I do think that they're seeing something large and something unexplained. And the uh, unexplained has already always fascinated me because I, I want to know the answer. You know, I want to I want to know what the answer is. I want to explain that unexplained so people can go, oh, that's what it is. You never know. Uh... You know, we might chuckle at them, but a hundred years from now, some scientist, anthropologist might sit there and say, this is interesting to see how these people develop this story and, and how they develop their own folklore to explain something they didn't know anything about. If you go back um, and look in, in through some of the history of the early history of this area out here, back in the, in the 1800s, you will see that the, the stories of a large creature living in the river were still prevalent, even uh, at, back in those days. And although you don't really, you know, haven't really found an account where they say, oh, you know, such and such caught a, you know, a big snake here, there, whatever. They, it was such common knowledge that a lot of the merchants would use it in their advertising. And so even back then, you know, they, they, they knew the value of uh, having some sort of uh, unusual creature, so to speak, and, and, and from a tourist standpoint. Hey, boys and girls, have any of you ever heard of Normie? Yes. Yeah. 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 Totally. Normie is a lake monster that lives right here in Lake Norman. My wife is a third grade teacher at a local private school. She uh, has always wanted to write a children's book. And when we started doing the Lake Norman monster sightseeing cruises, we needed something to entertain the children other than just, you know, telling them stories. And she said, I've always wanted to write a book. Now's my chance. And a few years ago, my husband and I were talking and came up with the idea of writing about a book about um, Normie the Lake Norman monster for children. Because we thought it'd be fun to put a friendly face to the monster that we've heard about. So I, I spent a few months writing in, you know, asking for help from friends of mine and what did they hear and what did they notice on the lake and um, came up with a story about Normie looking for friends, which I think a lot of kids can relate to. It's a fun morning cruise for kids to come out with their parents and they hear a story and they get to look on the lake and it's really great because as we're we're going along we can point out the things that we've talked about in the book like uh, like the osprey on the shoal marker and point out some of the local wildlife. When Normie resurfaced he was holding some mud from the lake bottom. Would this help? Normie asked. The osprey looked down at Normie's eager face. Down in the water! It's kind of cool and it's kind of neat because the kids are just they're really into it, and they just, and they know about Normie. They know a lot more about Normie than most people know. What? I think I've seen Normie. Yeah? Once, when, I, well, when we were driving to school. What did he look like? Um, it was just like this big hump in the water. I think that was his back or 
something. Could have been his back sticking out. What, what color was he? Sort of green, greenish yellowish. Did you see any eyes? No, because I think it was the back. You saw his back? Yeah. Now, who else has seen Normie? Me. And they get out here, and, and and if you get 50 kids on the boat, about half of them will see it or see something they think is it, and the other half probably don't care. But what they'll do, when you ask them, what did you see? Some people see a big, long object. Some see a fat, round object. See something with big eyes, big old dorsal fin coming out. Sometimes it's red, sometimes it's green. Some of them have binoculars. Some of them have their mom or daddy sunglasses on. They have these long-billed hats, binoculars, and, and they just, they have a lot of fun. One sign that Normie is firmly rooted in local folklore, it is said that children are already convinced that they have seen a giant and abnormal creature on the lake's surface. Here, it is the children who most benefit from the magical qualities of the legend of Lake Norman. But I still believe he is real. I think he's green. I think it's a type of underwater it doesn't have any claws, it has fins so that it can swim faster to catch the fish that it eats. Children in Army has a unique appeal because he seems to be a friendly fish and that kind of thing. And when we have our festival in springtime, it's called the Ray City Festival, there's always an art and coloring contest as to see who can draw the closest likeness to Army. And so that's one of those things. You stimulate their creativity, their artistic talent, that kind of thing. And um, uh, that's really what draws interest. And we get people come from across the country that want to come to this area for the, for the festival. And so looking to find likenesses of Normie are really uh, one of those attractions that bring people to Mooresville. To me, when I was a child, <laughs> I'll give an example of how it's changed. When I was a child, if I saw an automobile with a South Carolina license tag on it, to me, that was a foreigner. <laughs> And now, we see people from all over the world comes here. Lake Norman is a, like I say, a big draw for tourism. It is huge. And particularly when we do those summer trips with the children, we've had as many as 100, and 100 plus on the boats, uh, if you count the parents and everything. And I mean, they're just having a blast. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't have that many people come out for anything but something exciting like that, and it just, it, 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 it just uh, excites the imagination of these little guys, and they kind of keep us going and get us rejuvenated, too. Right here. Oh, no! Guess who that is right there? Yeah! <laughs> that's not Normie, that's Captain God. <laughs> Having raised small children here, oh, yes, the monster's very real, and we have gone on many trips looking for the monster. We never saw him, but we know he's there. We're trying to make fishing an outdoor activity that brings the family together. So from that point of view, I think Normie's very positive because if a family is going to hop in a boat or rent a boat and go out on a lake with their kids for the day and their purpose is to look for Normie, that's a good thing. I think it's good to get the kids off the computers, it gets them off the iPads, it gets them off the iPhone, and it puts them in the outdoors. The 
the mystery of the monster is a draw. And the thing about it is that we have young children that go out early in the morning to try and capture him at first sunlight. They have contests, art contests, to try and draw the likeness of the monster. And so I think that just adds to the, uh, to the lore and the enhancement of, of our lake. And, and um, so just the idea that there's, there's uh, something to go find that perhaps no one, has, no one else has ever seen. I think everybody wants that opportunity. What have the monster sightings done or all the talk and all the notoriety about the monster sightings done? Well, it's changed the way a lot of, sometimes when people just want to go out here and do sightseeing, one of the first questions they ask is, what's the story with the Lake Norman monster? What's the story? They don't even know his name. They don't know we call him Normie. And uh, so we get out here and it, it becomes a part of our, part of our tour. We'll look at the nice houses. We'll, we'll, we'll do a lot of wildlife, bird watching, different things as we're on the tour. And you know, every, you know everybody's looking for that monster too. They just want to get a glimpse of him. Nestled on the shores of Lake Pepin, Lake City is a small resort town in southeastern Minnesota. If you're a tourist in Lake City, the, the lake is a wonderful thing in itself to see. Lake Pepin witnessed the birth of one of the most popular water sports on the planet. This is the birthplace of water skiing. Since the early 1900s, we've had, during the 4th of July period, a uh, water ski day festival. Crossed by the Mississippi River, Lake Pepin has been an important shipping route since pre-Columbian times thanks to its strategic location. Straddling the border between Wisconsin and Minnesota and 100 miles south of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, the lake is the widest point on the Mississippi. Old legends have it that a terrifying creature haunted these seemingly peaceful waters. And even more terrifying, if we are to believe recent reports, that monster might still be alive to this day. The fishermen, actually, when they saw it, they turned their boat around and came back off the water. They saw some gigantic sonar, you know, reading on the, on the bottom of the lake. I know that they had a diver in the lake that ran into something that he didn't know what it was and he didn't want to go back in. And it was like I was being watched or something, like something out there was watching me. Many of the tribes were frightened of the area. They were talking about a creature between the size of an elephant and a rhinoceros. They were talking of a giant 40-foot snake-like serpent. My sister had fallen off, off of the water skis. She was afraid. Uh, we pulled her out of the water pretty quickly, and she has not been in the water since then. I've been out on that water many times. I've seen a whole lot of weird things. I've been out on the water when it's real rough. It's hard to see down into the water. So late at night, at dusk, um, at sunrise, you can see things poking out. Something surfaced that was maybe five or six feet out of, you know, lengthwise and maybe six or seven inches that came out of the water. And he saw a creature out of the water about four feet came out to grab a flying bird. He was so terrified he removed his children and they left. They quit fishing because they didn't want to be the next thing that monster came after. Right at that point, as I got thrown around, and I was freaked, scared to death. It's big. It's got to be it. I was screaming. I honestly don't remember exactly what I was screaming, to tell you the truth. Most of the people who saw it were terrified of it. But I was saying something like, it's big, it's big, it's dark, it get me out of the water. There's weird stuff out there. There's weird stuff in the lake. I could feel her fear. She wanted to get out of that water very quickly. Out of these disturbing testimonies, a name emerges, Peppy. Well, Peppy has a long history dating back 
to at least the 1600s with the first Native Americans here. People for over 100, 200 years have been seeing this monster, and by many accounts, it's a terrifying beast. Many of the tribes were frightened of the area, that if anyone went missing or anyone did not come back, they blamed it on the monster in Lake Pepin. If anyone died or any tribesmen you know, drowned, they blamed it on the creature. So it was looked at that you should avoid the lake at all possibilities, because if you didn't, you might encounter this creature. And many of the tribes only took their strongest and sturdiest canoes out on the lake because they were so frightened of what was underneath. Explorers would always bring a Jesuit priest with them because that was who could read and write back then in the 1600s, 1700s. The average person, even royalty, couldn't read or write, so they would send clergy along to document the trip. They were on Lake Pepin. At the time, Lake Pepin was already, already found and already named, uh, so they knew about Lake Pepin. And uh, the notation says, we were on Lake Pepin today, saw a large creature swimming on the lake. We don't know what it was. And back in the 1800s, they sometimes called it a sea monster, a sea serpent, a marine monster, a beast of the lake, even a snake beast. So you have to look at all these different terms of what these people were encountering. I came across the 1871 report, uh, just kind of researching around and came across the notation. A uh, pair of local gents say they saw something swimming on the lake, or lake monster they called it, larger than a rhinoceros, but smaller than an elephant. What's interesting about Lake Pepin and the Pepe Monster is that it wasn't unusual in the 1800s. There were dozens of lakes, rivers, and streams in Wisconsin and Minnesota that had legends of a beast, a monster in their lakes. But what's interesting about Pepe is that most of these other lakes and rivers, the creatures seem to have died out. The report just kind of stopped. Whereas Pepe, starting back in the 1970s, really resurfaced, that back in the 1970s, reports started to come back out more and more, whereas today we're getting just as many reports of Pepe as we did back in the 1800s. And I have talked to people who say or swear that they've seen something unexplainable in this lake. In fact, many of the old clamors back at the turn of the century referred to incidents that took place in the lake that were just unexplainable. Huge, huge body um, motions in the lake and water movement in the lake that was couldn't have happened by any normal means. We get a lot of questions about Pepe. Um, Pepe is um, quite a, a, a tale. Um, my husband actually saw Pepe and took a picture of Pepe. Since the first sighting of a strange creature in Lake Pepin in 1871, nearly 1,900 reports have been made. So many strange encounters that up to now have gone unexplained. <laughs> 200 years before the CU ceded their land to the U.S. government, Fur traders discovered the majestic beauty of the Lake City region. The name Pepin was given to the lake in memory of Jean and Pierre Pépin, two brothers who set up a trading post there in the late 17th century. The archives of this period mention mysterious apparitions. We are in Lake City, Minnesota. Canada's borders to our north. Our city is split by two counties, Wabasha County and Goodyear County, the state of Minnesota. We are on the Mississippi River, which happens to be 
at this particular point, the widest and the deepest part of the Mississippi River. Lake City is kind of unique. We have about seven miles of public shoreline on the lake where it's open to the public, where you can go and stand there, fish, wade, swim, uh, do whatever you want, and uh, or just sit and enjoy the scenery you know, at the water's edge. And uh, a lot of people do that, and, and that's where a lot of people see see Pepe. And uh, we have Pepe watch stations set up. You'll see signs every now and then along the beach. My friend for the that works for the Division of Natural Resources pulled up this really weird looking fish, and it was maybe a foot and a half long, and it had really big teeth, almost the head almost looked like a piranha. He knew what it was, that we, but he did say that it was a prehistoric fish. And uh, when he yeah. cutted it and cleaned it out, it still moved for a couple of hours after he had done the evisceration and everything. In fact, Lake Pepin is home to fish of incredible shapes and sizes, which has led some to speculate that Pepe could be a surviving member of a species long considered extinct. What I find interesting about Pepe, the description of Pepe, is it varies widely. That there are some accounts of it that make it seem more of a, uh, though it's an old dinosaur, the plesiosaur, the long neck, like you'd consider the Loch Ness Monster. Based on the descriptions people have called us with and, and provided us, um, we think Pepe is probably 15 to 20 feet long. Um, at least part of him is serpent-like. There are other reports of it being more of a giant serpent, snake-like beast, 30 to 40 feet in length. And then there are some where it's more of a several humps of whatever is unknown, some creature that's unknown. We think it probably has a thicker body uh, in, in a long neck uh, with the head. Um, but, you know, that's the mystery with aquatic creatures is you don't get to see the whole thing most of the time. You only see part of it. it you know, they're, they're like icebergs. Most of the sightings of its color seem to indicate that it's a dark type beast, that it's a, a brown or a black or a dark green. It's always seen as a dark type creature. The Shimbanos are longtime residents of Lake City. They operate a small cafe on the path along Lake Pepin. Adam Shimbano recalls as if it happened yesterday, an incident that traumatized his sister during an outing on the lake in the early 1980s. We were about 15 or 16 years old. We were out water skiing uh, just north of town and my sister had fallen off, off of the water skis. You know, you pull around and you swing around to pick her up. And we picked, as, as we did that, you know, I'm sure we were horsing around and stuff. And somehow, uh, Chris, the guy that we were with and I, you know, we weren't really paying attention to her. And she, hollered something I, you know i don't remember this was 30 years ago and she was and i looked at her and you know it's caught my attention and i i'm like what shelly and her eyes were like this big she's like there was something in the water right here and i said what are you talking about and she was adamant that she wanted to get out of the water she was afraid and she scrambled out of the water uh, we pulled her out of the water pretty quickly, and she has not been in the water since then here in Lake Pepin. And so she hasn't swam in the lake for 30 years. What we've learned is people that are in the water and they see, they have a, what's called a close encounter with Pepe. They, they, it, it, they kind of shakes them up for a while. And they certainly want to get out of the water right then. And they aren't too eager to go back in the water uh, in the near future. You know, eventually that changes. Uh, it, but, but
but they are a little bit nervous to start with, and I guess I can kind of understand that. If anytime you see something that scares you, I mean, I, I don't really like snakes too much myself, and if I all of a sudden see a snake a foot away from me, I usually jump back, and then I'm on the watch for <laughs> snakes after that. She said it was a black, and it, she could make out a fin of some kind, but it, she said she couldn't really see how big it was, but she could tell that it was quite large under the water. We've heard stories that there used to be big sturgeon that lived in this lake. Um, and I, you know, I said, it's just a fish. And she, no, it was not a fish. It was big and it was scary. And, you know, to this day, we've never really talked about it much. <laughs> Larry Nielsen is a businessman active in the Lake City community. A few years ago, he came across ancient manuscripts describing strange sightings on Lake Pepin and was so intrigued that he decided to investigate himself. He is now captain of the Pearl of the Lake, a replica of a 19th century paddle wheel boat that scours the lake in search of Pepe. Larry Nielsen really brought Pepe back it was nearly forgotten for many decades. People talked about it in the area, but outside of the community, it wasn't that well known. About five or six years ago, I was uh, actually watching a show on television about the Loch Ness area. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to get a bunch of people that come here and try and find out what Pepe is? And, uh, What's the best way to do that? What's the best way to get some interest in finding out what Pepe is? And that's, uh, I thought about it for a while, and that's when I came up with, I'll offer a reward for anybody that can prove the existence of Pepe. And I sent out about 100 emails to different news organizations and news media um, that we're offering a $50,000 reward for anybody that can provide proof of what Pepe, the Lake Pepin monster is. And then uh, from there, a few newspapers picked it up, uh, news stations, uh, and, and a lot of uh, national media started picking it up. We are on national public radio. Uh, uh, then it grew exponentially from there. We, we started getting uh, inquiries from around the world. Uh, I was actually on the largest radio station in Tokyo, Japan for 20 minutes talking about uh, Pepe, and uh, Chinese government had uh, uh, a website that talked about Pepe a little bit, and I've gotten phone calls from Australia and Sweden and, and uh, just about every country and every state around. People are really, really interested in what's going on here on Lake Pepin. Well, let's throw out the map, Larry, and you can show us, uh, we'll look at some of the most common areas for the sightings, and then we can pick where we want to sure. go today. Well, these orange uh, flags here uh, are sightings that you've documented, or, or is that right, Chad? Yes. Okay. Dating back to the 1860s up until you know current time. We are right here right now. Uh, matter of fact, where our dock is located is called Central Point because it is in the center of Lake Pepin. So, mm -hmm. so we're centrally located here. Um, and as we go downstream, uh, the water gets deeper, uh, 85 to 100 feet deep in places. Or we, uh, uh, one of the favorite spots seems to be up between Stockholm and Maiden Rock Bluff. And mm -hmm. uh, Maiden Rock Bluff is, is uh, for some reason, seems to have a lot of sightings right around that area. You can see that's Maiden Rock, Wisconsin yeah. in the background. Yeah, the creature. Yeah, and, and, uh, and several other ones that are in the same vicinity. So yeah. I, I think we definitely want to hit that area. Uh, and uh, I think we'll have some good successes. Yeah, you can see we'll be right in the hot spot. Yeah, yeah. All I'm right. excited. Let's get Let's going. Do it. Yeah. Our boat, uh, it's a 129 passenger paddle wheel boat. It's, a, it's an authentic paddle wheel boat. It doesn't have any propellers or thrusters. It's uh, just the paddles is what makes it go through the water. We do some uh, peppy tours on the boat. 
where we take them out, uh, specifically we call them Peppy Watch Tours. Uh, we show them the historic areas, the scenic areas, and we talk about Peppy and, and uh, we talk about the reward. So, and tell them, so everybody keep your cameras ready because uh, not only are you gonna uh, get shots of all this great scenery, but you might just make yourself 50,000 bucks. We're coming up right here to uh, Marina Point, which is uh, where Lake City Marina is. It's the largest marina on the Mississippi River. And uh, we'll go around that point, uh, go downstream a little bit, and then we're gonna cross the lake and head up uh, upstream along the Wisconsin shore towards Maiden Rock and uh, see if we can't find Pepe. So I think what's interesting is we always talk about it being a, a single creature, but in actuality, there may be several of these creatures, especially if there have been hundreds of years of sightings that there may be enough to reproduce. I've always felt like there has to be a pod or, or several creatures um, because I, I just don't see, you know, the, the sightings go back hundreds of years mm -hmm. and I don't see how any one creature could be alive that long. Yes. So uh, I think there's a small community of them uh, and probably they're, they're fairly large. So just the size of them probably keeps the number in the community down mm -hmm. uh, to a certain degree because, uh, you know, we aren't the ocean with unlimited depth and places to go. So. I, I think you're right. I think there's got to be more than one. Based on a lot of the reports I've received that whether the creature is harmless or cute or not, people were afraid of it. And of course, if you're swimming in the water, water skiing, boating, and a large beast 30 to 40 feet, by some accounts, even 10 feet, comes up next to you, that's going to be terrifying, whether it's a sturgeon, whether it's a giant catfish, a bull shark, or an unknown species. Um, we know that there is no reports of it ever hurting anybody, taking a bite out of somebody's leg or, or uh, other than we have a report that, that you found from some people down uh, by Alma where uh, a, a creature jumped out of the water about four feet and snatched a bird out of the air. And, and that's really the only sighting we have where it's actually feeding on anything. Yeah, I had traveled the world searching for these monsters and legends, and I'd never heard of a reward being offered for their capture. So that's really what intrigued me right away. Not necessarily the reward itself, but the mystery surrounding it. It gave it that, that strength to it, that not only were there reports of it, but somebody was putting up a reward to find the truth behind it. Well, you know, I hear from several different people that have had expeditions that, that they're interested in the reward, but I don't think that is their main impetus. I think they have a desire to solve mysteries. Yes. And, and uh, if they get a reward for doing it, that's just uh, icing on the cake. But yes. What they really want is, here's a mystery. It's documented for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, it's unsolved. Let's solve this mystery. Yes. Everybody, everybody wants to solve a mystery. In 2009, Heidi Fryer, a filmmaker from Wisconsin, led a self-funded expedition to document the existence of Pepe and perhaps win the $50,000 reward. On their very first outing, the team had a disturbing encounter. The detailed account of what happened that day has become a part of Lake Pepin lore. It was that summer, the um, summer of 2008, I believe, that I saw an article on the front page of the St. Paul Pioneer Press newspaper talking about Pepe and the $50,000 reward being offered for proof of Pepe's existence. Well, one of the people on the expedition was a scuba diver, and he was planning to go down and see what he could see underwater. Of 
Corey was a little reluctant to dive in Lake Pepin. And I had told myself a long time ago I would never do it. I ended up getting over the fear of going into the dark, murky water of the Mississippi, something that I had been scared to do since as a kid. We went out on the, on the river from the time we left the boat landing. We were only on the boat or on the water for about five minutes. Our sonar reader was seeing something unusual on the graph. I've never seen anything that big on a graph. Well, it's two feet. It's two feet every foot. So, so it was down 50. Feet. So we were seeing a 50-foot cone at that depth. It's still scary. That's 50 feet. I've never, I've never in what, 10, 15 years of using this graph, I've never seen anything close to that. Because it was about 25 feet. We were in 36 feet of water. It was 25 feet down. I'm thinking that, put, and it took up about two thirds of the screen. So that. It's got to be huge. Yeah. At that time, I put my scuba gear on and worked up the nerve, did a back flip over into the water. And it was like maybe 10, 15 minutes into it. I was kind of getting comfortable, you know, getting that fear gone. And, and uh, it, right at the end there, I. I Everything just kind of went quiet. I had a feeling come over me, like just a, 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 a tingly feeling in my head and in, in my ears or whatnot. And it was like I was being watched or something, like something out there was watching me. And right about that time, I seen something real close to me in black in color. Kind of looked smooth. I never touched it, nor did I, do, I don't believe it touched me. I didn't see any kind of fins or head or anything like that. But as quick as I seen it, all of a sudden it, it moved and I seen it like move and left. And it kind of threw me around like a whirlpool or, or a wave that was you know, up, straight up and down. And it, right at that point, as I got thrown around, and I was freaked. Oh, I, I see it. It's big. Took off to the surface, seen where the bolt was. My regulator flew out of my mouth. It's got to be it. It's booked. When Corey came out of the water, I was worried about him. Oh, get me out of this water. It's big. I bumped into it. He was obviously terrified, and we didn't know what had happened. And I was screaming to get my buddy to pull me out of the water, and it felt like forever. You know, I was just imagining this thing coming up and grabbing me or something, you know, and disappearing forever. And he finally got me up over into the boat. I was completely exhausted. You know, they had kind of asked me if I was all right. I, you know, I said I was all right, but that, it just kind of ended right there as far as my, my experience of, of that. The experience could not be filmed as severely reduced visibility prevented the underwater camera from taking pictures at a depth greater than one meter. But the filmmaker, who is still trying to understand what the sonar captured that day, intends to continue her documentary project. Despite high hopes, no observations recorded in the past 150 years have helped prove the existence of a monster or unexplained phenomenon in Lake Pepin. The many photos submitted by alleged witnesses have all been deemed inconclusive. None of this surprises Dr. J. Epping, a veterinarian. He believes that Corey, the diver who had a terrifying experience at the bottom of Lake Pepin while participating in a documentary film, was probably surprised by a very big fish. If I had to guess what Peppy the lake monster is, I'd have to say it's probably most likely something like a sturgeon, 
or some big fish. A lot of people are gonna be out on the water and see sturgeon, which you know, can get seven feet long, up to 200 pounds. They see one of the, you know, they see a big fish like that cresting over the water. They're gonna say, oh my God, what is that thing? Gonna, it's probably a fish. There's usually always an explanation and it's not a monster. Whether it be a log, whether it be waves rolling over something or an optical illusion, it could be that. But you know, the most likely thing it would be, my guess would be it would be a sturgeon. Lake Pepin probably has about 50 or 60 different species of actually fish in there, um, let alone all the you know, avian species that are flying through with ducks and geese, swans. Um, but it, for the main, for the majority of it, there's a huge abundance of, you know, aquatic wildlife in Lake Pepin. And, and to go back a little further, when we were first viewing that image on the sonar, the, our, our depth finder, you can, you can judge approximate size by the blips, we call them, on those sonar. Well, this particular uh, image that we've seen on there, we were guessing anywhere from six to eight feet wide in like, you know, 26, 27 or so feet to roughly 35 feet long. It's huge. And I, I honestly believe that I was, I had an encounter with the Pepe monster. We know that there's huge, huge fish in the lake. There's been reported to be fish in the lake over 100 pounds, catfish over 100 pounds. And this could be perhaps cause for some confusion, that perhaps the Pepe is, is, is just a huge fish. There have been sturgeon that have been taken out of the lake. There have been bull sharks that have been found in the lake. So we have all these species of animal and fish in the lake that maybe they're seeing that. Maybe people are misidentifying these creatures. And if you are swimming and a 10 foot, 120 pound sturgeon brushes by you, it's going to seem like a sea serpent to you. I guess it's a, the possibility exists that it could be a new fish species, but again, that would be highly unlikely given our Department of Natural Resources and the gill nets and the test nets that they do in all the river and lake systems in Minnesota. We're gonna notice that coming in, you know, because our DNR is constantly looking for invasive species that we have here, like the flying carp and zebra mussels and all that. So the amount of monitoring that we're doing, you know, of our waterways, if it's not gonna be a new fish, you know, and if there is, we're gonna know about it right away. Ancient legends, Disturbing encounters, blurry images, but still no physical evidence of a monster living in Lake Pepin. So why do some people continue to believe? You know, as far as how many people believe or don't believe, uh, I don't know what that number would be. I would say that it's, as far as believers go, it's probably a pretty small number of people who actually believe that there's something out there. My job involves traveling the world in search of folklore and legends, speaking with witnesses, digging through old historical archives, and then actually going to the places where these legends happen and trying to sort fact from fiction. The author of several books on unexplained phenomena, Chad led his own investigations on Lake Pepin in the summer of 2012. On both expeditions, we had a lot of equipment. We had sonar, underwater cameras, we had video, audio, we were fishing, we had nets, we used ourselves as bait in there swimming, and we came up with zero evidence of the monster. But what intrigued us is that when we were passing by people who were fishing, we would just call out and see if they had ever seen Pepe or if they had been on the lookout. And even though many of them did not have a sighting, what we were amazed at is many of these fishermen and women who we didn't even think would believe in a monster, said they kept a camera with them just in case. In the absence of tangible evidence, photographs are often the only tools available to help unravel the mystery. I've seen several photos of, of what people believe are peppy. And sure, it looks like it could be a Loch Ness monster sort of creature, but you look at those things and you also say, you know what, that could be a log. 
you know, that's floating down the river at the, at the right time, the undulation that's there. You could have waves going over the top of something. So, yeah, I mean, can it look, you can make anything look like anything. I mean, I could take two hot dogs and stick them in the water and potentially make it look like a lake monster if I wanted. Sometimes the, the pictures we see, well, there's this newfangled thing called Photoshop. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, it's amazing the things that they can do with Photoshop these days. Now, that didn't exist 30 years ago, and there are these old photos out there that, uh, I don't know how you fake something that looks long and skinny swimming through the water, so. And then we also have to look at, you know, look at society right now. We're all running around with cell phones. We're all running around, you know, attached at the hip to our, you know, camera phones. If something like that's out there, we're gonna have really good photographic, you know, evidence of that. Larry has developed a website for people to share their experiences and encounters with Pepe. The problem, according to some, is that the site also serves as a tool to promote tourism on Lake Pepin. Before the reward, um, there, wasn't, there wasn't a repository for people to, uh, to say, I have a sighting. You'd see something out on the lake, and, and you didn't, there wasn't anything that you could do with it. Um, so th that was part of why we created the website, and along with the reward, is we assume now people are going to say, we saw something. So now they have a place they can report it to, and we can start being a library of, of those sightings. Local citizens commented, of course, like everything else, uh, you've got your naysayers and whatnot. You know, some people say, hey, Larry's trying to make a name for himself, but uh, having worked with Larry, he wanted to create a tourism draw to bring people in the region, because we have once they're here, it's a very beautiful area. I, I doubt that Pepe was created just to attract tourists. Um, I, it's, it's, it's a possibility that, that, that Pepe was uh, remanufactured from, from, time, from some time back. But I think in, there was initially, there was, there was a mystique or a mysterious, mysterious creature or creatures in the lake. I think Larry uh, rejuvenated the monster, that these stories have been circulating for hundreds of years, but again, they were nearly forgotten. And Larry just simply dragged them out of the history books and made them relevant again. There is that segment of the population that says, oh, what are you doing? You just look like a bunch of goofballs. You know, but I have heard that there are people that come to Lake City because, hey, I heard this story about Pepe, so I wanted to come to Lake City and to see what it was all about, and to go out and look at the lake. And um, so, if it's if it drums up business in that regard, then then it's doing its job, I guess. But I think Larry not only uh, benefits from tourists, but also he always makes the claim that. There's no harm in promoting your history, that if you come here, whether or not you see Pepe in the lake, you're going to have a beautiful time and a wonderful area. So I think he's just promoting the town's unique history. a popular bar in a neighboring town of Lake City called Red Wing, also located on Lake Pepin. It's Pepe Porter, a dark beer with mysterious aromas, references the notorious legend of the lake monster. We have 13 varieties that we brew in our brew house. Our brew house is about uh, what we call a six barrel brew house, which means that we make about 186 gallons per week. We have several of our own styles that we serve, uh, ranging anywhere from a, a lighter ale to uh, a darker stout. All of our beers are meant to reflect something that's 
that makes Red Wing what it is and, and uh, the, the Lake Pepin area what it is. We try and, and promote stories that are unique to this region and Pepe's Porter is, uh, is one of those stories. Our Porter beer, which, is a, uh, which we brew as an American Porter, is a darker ale and we decided to name it after the local lake monster. And there has been lore about Pepe the lake monster as long as anyone can remember. So there are newspaper clippings that you'll find from across the years, uh, uh, tales that have been told and then passed down uh, about Pepe the lake monster. It, again, it all plays into the legend and uh, what is true and what isn't depends on the person that experienced it. As is the case for the vast majority of freshwater mythical monsters, the existence of Pepe has not been proven. But that hasn't stopped residents of Lake City from bringing Pepe to life outside of the lake. Yes, well, Lake City, you know, they promote it as a, a fun creature, the postcards and all the memorabilia. Pepe is a fun monster for most people in the community. The children in the community, um, look for Peppy and laugh and giggle and talk about Peppy. Today we portray him as a child-friendly monster. Uh, we tell children he's shy, that's why you never see him, because he's shy. And, uh, the t-shirts and sweatshirts that we carry are, are, are printed or embroidered by local businesses that do that kind of work. And then the little peppy uh, stuffed animals are made by a great grandmother that lives right here in Lake City. Evelyn is a great grandmother, and uh, she has the, the copyright uh, permission from Larry Nielsen to make these, and they're all made by hand. She buys the fabric and cuts it out and embroiders the eyes on and um, stuffs them. She said the stuffing is the hardest part. While the legend lives on in the streets of Lake City, Research continues under the surface of the water. For Heidi and Corey, despite the technical challenges facing their investigation and with no offense intended to the many skeptics, hope springs eternal. After the expedition, I filmed some follow-up interviews with some of the other crew members, and the project is still in the works. I had to put it on the back burner for a while due to some other projects that came up. I believe that, my belief is that that fish or mammal in particular is a solo uh, all by itself, my belief. Uh, and the reason I say that is, is if there were more of them, I think you would see more sightings, there'd be more more knowledge of them. With the advent of Pepe, it put Lake City on a map. Uh, we became, instead of a local attraction, we became a national and international attraction. Because according to Mr. Nielsen, he does get visitors uh, from well, various countries in Europe and from Asia that specifically come to this lake to find Pepe. Whenever there's a sighting of something like Pepe the lake monster, um, there's always a boom to you know any locality where that is. And, and that's great for the town. Um, you know, do I think it's likely that there actually is a monster out there that exists? I don't think it's likely, but you know what? No one can say for certain, because no one has found this thing washed up on shore, 
You know, no one has had it, you know, come up and take a breadcrumb out of your hand. And I'm certain there are people out there that truly believe they saw this, and if that's what they believe, great. And, and if other people want to come and take the chance, you know, in Lake City to try to see if they can find Pepe, great. Good for everyone involved. We know for a fact that people come to town just to see the, or hope for an opportunity or possibility to see the, the monster or Pepe. Uh, I believe, uh, overall, I'd say the community is embracing Pepe as, as our mascot. I think people, when we started talking about Pepe and offered, our tourism bureau offered the reward, it reminded people that Lake Pepin is a beautiful place to come and visit and that we were here. So it gave our town and our lake and our whole area some publicity. Well, I think the point of it being friendly today is it's more welcoming that it's more of a tourist draw. It's more fun, family friendly. You can go to Lake Pepin, you can do some water skiing, you can enjoy the beautiful surroundings and maybe catch this cute little animal as well. So we're in the process of working on something and knowing Mr. Nielsen will probably pick a, a peppy month or a peppy day. And, and if I was gonna pick a peppy day, I, it'll be that April day in 1871 when the two fishermen discovered him. A doorway into Argentina's Patagonia region, the city of San Carlos de Bariloche lies at the foot of the Andes, bordering Chile, some 1,640 kilometers or 1,020 miles southwest of Buenos Aires. Founded in 1890 by Swiss settlers as a holiday resort, Bariloche now prospers as a tourist town of roughly 130,000 inhabitants. Surrounded by breathtaking natural beauty, the city stretches out along Lake Nahuelhuapi, in the heart of the national park of the same name. But this scenic paradise hides a dark mystery. Nahuelhuapi Lake, fed by water from the Andean glaciers, houses a strange creature. Yo vi el Nahuelito eh, la última vez en el 2000. El cuerpo es como una ballena enorme. No tiene escamas, es como piel de elefante. Por arriba gris, oscuro, y a medida que iba llegando a la panza, más clarito. Y tienen eh, aletas. Y tienen una cola muy finita que hace de timón. Tienen el cuello muy alto y la cabeza chiquita. Y yo calculo más o menos de unos 12 metros. Enorme. Cuando lo vi, con el larga vista, bien, todo, Busqué la enciclopedia rápido a ver, ¿no es cierto?, los dibujos que yo tengo de las enciclopedias. Entonces dije, ¡ah, sos un pretosaurio! Todo el mundo decía, el monstruo del lago. ¿Por qué monstruo? Entonces yo digo, es un abuelo, un animal prehistórico. Y desde entonces se llama el abuelito. Nahuel, el lago, y, y agregado el abuelito. Carolina Zirn has lived in Bariloche since the 1950s. Originally from Buenos Aires, Carolina settled in this eccentric area before it was fully developed, attracted by her love of nature and the breathtaking scenery. Today, as every day for the last 65 years, this nonagenarian spends her leisure time contemplating the mystery of Lake Nahuelhuapi. Over the years, she says she has witnessed three apparitions. Esto ocurrió a cinco kilómetros de acá. Las medidas estimativamente eran aproximadamente 22, 25 metros de largo. En su lomo tenía dos semiesferas y esas semiesferas tenían un color muy particular que era verde. Al irse cometió mucho oleaje en la costa. Blas Sheik comes from one of Bariloche's founding families. The owner of a shipping company, he has a monopoly on the transit of vehicles, fuels, and heavy loads to the four communities of Lake Nahuelhuapi. 
He's been sailing the lake for over 30 years and also claims to have seen Nahuelito. Éramos aproximadamente un grupo de 20 personas que cuando vieron la magnitud se quedaron muy sorprendidas. Se mantuvo a la vista nuestra estimativamente 20 minutos, media hora. Fue casualidad que yo no haya estado con él, porque yo lo acompañaba bastante seguido a los viajes que él hacía. Yo tenía casi 9, 10 años y cuando él llegó a casa a comentar lo que había sucedido, yo decía, ¿cómo me lo pude perder? También me quedó el sentimiento de, de miedo. Las veces siguientes que lo acompañé a él eh, en la embarcación, bueno, eh, siempre estar atenta de los colores, de los movimientos que surgían a medida que uno va surcando el lago. Lake Nahualhuapi is of glacial origin. Its name, given to it by the Native American Mapuche peoples, means Lake of the Tiger. Se decía que en la isla que vemos acá atrás de fondo eh, había eh, pumas, eh, y por eso le ponían la isla de los tigres o la isla de los leones. Cuando hablamos del Nahuelito, Estamos hablando todavía de algo desconocido. Muchos creían que había un plesiosaurio en este, en este lugar y es eh, muy difícil. Los vecinos hablan de Nahualito, con mucho cariño hablan. Yo no he tenido la posibilidad de ver el Nahualito como algunas personas aseguran haberlo visto. He visto cosas que no puedo saber si realmente son hechos físicos que se producen por alguna causa de reacción química bajo superficie. Seguramente no, no ha sido ni un animal, ni mucho menos. Este es un lago que tiene sus misterios. Eh, yo que tengo la suerte de vivir sobre la costa del lago Nahuel Guapi, veo, sobre todo a la noche, eh, cosas interesantes, eh, luminiscencias en el lago. Eh, se ven cosas cosas extrañas, digamos. La Patagonia, a través de los años, se ha convertido en un lugar de mucha magia y mucho misterio. Los primeros relatos, digamos, conocidos, hablan de un lugar lleno de misterio, lleno de muerte, inclusive. En los mapas de la antigüedad figuraba como el país del diablo. San Carlos de Bariloche fue, en sus comienzos, eh, una región de asentamiento de pueblos nómades, de comunidades nómanes, de los tehuelches, hace miles de años. Y con el tiempo se fue transformando en un pequeño poblado que, que era una colonia agrícola ganadera. Con el tiempo, el turismo marcó el rumbo económico de la ciudad y llegó a lo que es, a lo que es hoy. En fin, es un lugar eh, como una aldea de montaña donde yo estoy orgulloso de, de vivir. ¿no? It is this wild and mysterious side to Patagonia that pushed Carolina Zern to change her life in the 1950s. Cuando yo llegué hace 50 y pico de años acá, Bariloche no existía. Era una aldea. Estaba todo sin explotar. No había cloaca, no había luz. Ni pensar en teléfono, ni cable, nada. After the first mention of a strange apparition in Lake Nahualhuapi over 100 years ago, Nahualito has been rather quiet. Por primera vez, eh, debo suponer que fue en 1910. La segunda vez, después fue en 1936. Y la cuarta vez, en 1957. Después, en 1986 y la última aparición es en el 2006. En la época en que estamos, hablar de un preciosaurio que se extinguió hace 65 millones de años eh, es un poco difícil. Lo van a tomar como una cosa muy alocada. Y no fui la única que lo vi, porque vi dos personas más que la vieron. Pero no querían decir nada, porque acá, cuando vos ves algo extraordinario, la gente dice, tomó de más. 
Vamos a decir que el preciosaurio del abuelito le dio a este lugar una resonancia. O sea, con el abuelito Bariloche creció. Antes se vivía de otra manera, se vivía de la pesca del lago, de las cosechas. En cambio, ahora Bariloche vive de un turismo. Una vez que el abuelito se fue instalando en la mente de las personas, muchas personas de Buenos Aires, muchos turistas, mucha gente de otras partes del mundo, querían venir a ver ese monstruo. The first peoples conceived of the tiger of the lake as mysterious and indestructible. The Mapuche talk of a mythical being that haunted all of Patagonia. They called him El Cuero. Los antiguos pobladores, los mapuches, que poblaron toda esta zona y todavía siguen poblando, tenían una leyenda muy particular que era la leyenda del cuero. Que ellos veían un cuero como un cuero flotando en el lago que se llevaba a los animales. A través de eso se fue popularizando. La relación entre monstruos se comenzó en el año 1910, donde la primera vez un señor llamado George Garrett, que fue el primero en realidad que avistó eh, al monstruo propiamente dicho, que él dijo haber visto unas jivas flotando en el lago eh, de 7 metros de largo, ¿no? Esta noticia cundió rápidamente. Y bueno, se empezó a hablar de los animales que podían encontrarse. De Estados Unidos, este, dijeron, sí, nosotros siempre dijimos que en la Patagonia eh, pueden haber animales antidiluvianos. Y, por supuesto, tuvo que aparecer quién. Dijera, yo lo vi. Martin Sheffield, norteamericano, típico buscador de oro y arreador. Un personaje de aquellos, ¿no es cierto? Martin Sheffield was an American from Texas, supposedly married to a Native American woman. Described at the time as a cunning jester, the alleged monster hunter sent a letter to the director of the Buenos Aires Zoo, asking him to finance an expedition to capture the animal. Clemente Onelli, que era en ese momento el director del zoológico de Buenos Aires, armó una expedición para venir hasta aquí y poder capturar el monstruo del lago. Por supuesto, no capturó ningún monstruo, no hubo nada. Clemente Onelli en ese momento le dio 2.000 pesos fuertes a Martín Schiffler en esa época, estoy hablando de 1922 más o menos, por haber hecho toda esta movida, por haberle dicho del monstruo y lo demás, y se quedó con esos 2.000 pesos. Although the expedition returned empty-handed, a local Bariloche newspaper printed a photo of a captured Nahuelito, forgetting to specify that the photo was taken at a carnival. Los corresponsales periodistas locales mandan la noticia a Buenos Aires. La captura del plesiosaurio, acorralado, capturado. Es carnaval. Es una mascarita de carnaval. Es el chiste más grande que se hizo en esta región en más de un siglo. Y fue para esos carnavales que la carroza con forma de plesiosaurio apareció por primera vez en el centro de la ciudad, recorriendo la calle Mitre. Y a partir de ahí, el, el, la leyenda o el mito del abuelito tuvo vigencia y tuvo presencia en, en el acervo tradicional o cultural de la ciudad de Bariloche. En los primeros carnavales de Bariloche, uno de los elementos que dominaron el escenario en la calle más éntica de Bariloche, la única de aquel momento, era la figura del preciosaurio de Clemente Onelli o de Martin Sheffield. Aparecía esa figura enorme desfilando por las calles y así se fue creando este mito, verdad o realidad, que es nuestro famoso y ya querido Nahuelito, porque empezás a querer a un personaje que no conoces. Pero se transformó en una rica historia para esta región y en un elemento de promoción turística como nadie había sospechado. La llegada del ferrocarril, más la leyenda del monstruo del lago Nahuel Guapí, más todo lo demás, hizo que un contingente de gente turística se acercara a la zona. Incluso, te digo más, para conocer la zona, porque llegar a Bariloche en esa época no era muy fácil. En aquel tiempo, las lapiceras para escribir eran de madera, con una chapita adelante, ¿no? Se hicieron unas que tenían la cabecita del plesiosaurio y todos los chicos de las escuelas querían tener una lapicera plesiosaurio. Hubieron cigarrillos marca plesiosaurio y hasta un tango y aquí te lo muestro, el plesiosauro.
The hoax about the capture of Nahuelito has not prevented newspapers from reviving the mystery of the lake monster. Y salen noticias. Más turistas avistaron el fenómeno del Nahuelhuapi. Nuevos testimonios sobre extraña visión. De esto hay eh, notas y notas. Nahuelito II, un vecino, un querido vecino, le puso el nombre Nahuelito, ¿no? Buscó qué, qué nombre ponemos. Nahuelito hizo su primera aparición en el verano del 94. <ríe> Así, notas y notas. Otro extraño avistamiento en el lago Nahuelhuapi. Hubo un auge de apariciones entre el 70 y el 80. Para mí, todo este tipo de, de animales existe. Eh, y no me baso en pruebas científicas, porque si me tengo que basar en pruebas científicas, tengo que decir que no, que no existen. For his part, Miguel Angelo Rossi is currently filming a documentary in order to debunk once and for all the phenomenon of Nahuelito. Estoy desarrollando un proyecto que se llama Bajo Superficie, que trata fundamentalmente sobre la cuestión del mito del Nahuelito en el lago Nahuel Huapi de Patagonia. Este proyecto pretende precisamente eso, meter al espectador debajo del agua que siempre vemos todos los días los que vivimos acá en San Carlos de Bariloche. Estamos filmando a muchísimos metros a profundidad y estamos encontrando cosas re interesantes. Este lago tiene una profundidad eh, que hace muchos años fue registrada de, los 500, de 500 metros, pero los estudios más recientes marcan que puede haber lugares de más de 800 o casi 1000 metros. Los avistamientos de Nahuelitos han tenido históricamente tres lugares donde se han visto más. Hay un lugar que se llama la zona de los 500 metros. Eh, allí nace un brazo que se llama el brazo Tristeza. Ese es uno de los lugares donde más veces se ha visto a Nahuelito. ¿no? Nahuelito es todo un fenómeno para los habitantes de esta región y mucho más aún para los visitantes. No tuve ninguna experiencia eh, respecto de un avistaje o algo que se parezca a algún movimiento extraño en el lago Nahuelguapi a pesar de haber nacido en Bariloche. Sí tuve por mi profesión y porque hice muchas notas el relato de, de vecinos que aseguran haber visto a lo que hoy definimos como un abuelito. Charlé con familiares de un importante empresario que falleció en el año 1987. Eran cuatro, tres empresarios y un gerente de banco. Familias conocidas aquí de Bariloche. Era un día como hoy. La famosa calma chicha, no había oleaje en el lago Nahuelhuapi. Iban en una embarcación muy segura y de buenas a primera la noticia fue que desaparecieron. La embarcación quedó vuelta a campana, quedó hacia abajo. De cuatro personas aparecieron tres cuerpos, el otro aún está desaparecido. Y fue una verdadera incógnita, porque estaban pescando, porque era gente mayor, porque no andaban a altas velocidades en la lancha, porque no había viento. Entonces... Todo esto es como que alimenta o retroalimenta la posibilidad de que efectivamente en el lago Nahuelhuapi algo exista, que haya algo que todavía nosotros lo desconocemos. Creo que Nahuelito es un mito. Para algunos es una realidad. Si está, ya pasa a ser nuestro. Si no está, felicitamos a aquellos que relataron una leyenda, un cuento, una ficción que llegó ya a los planos internacionales. La televisión de vez en cuando muestra algún relato de algún vecino, la radio hace lo propio. Y lo que han tomado fuertemente esto son eh, los caricaturistas o los dibujantes. Se imagina a este Nahuelito ya como figura central y como mascota de esta ciudad. Cada cinco años estamos hablando fuertemente de él. Eh, por ahí, en cinco años, puede tener una aparición. Relatos, relatos que dicen haber visto a, a Nahuelito. Después vuelve como un silencio profundo donde nadie habla hasta que resurge nuevamente, por otro relato popular, la figura de este animalito.
No he visto personalmente a Nahuelito. Eh, sí he visto dos o tres filmaciones realmente que me hicieron pensar bastante al respecto de su existencia. Eh, me encantaría verlo, si existe. Y sí presto atención a aquellas personas que dicen haberlo visto, porque generalmente los ojos no mienten. Y sumado eso a la tradición o un poco a la, a la historia de, de su presencia, de su existencia, hay que darle crédito a aquellos que sí dicen que existe en Abuelito. Los avistamientos del Abuelito siempre se han hecho en los días que el lago está muy calmo, que parece que estuviera, como se dice acá, planchado, como si fuera un aceite. En esos días eh, se puede ver eh, movimientos internos, eh, se puede ver movimientos de, de agua y se puede ver emerger eh, como lomos. Desde la costa se ha visto, se ha visto mucho, se han sacado fotos, se han filmado. Eh, pero que no sobresalen demasiado, por eso el lago tiene que estar muy calmo. Pienso que como no había olas, porque el oleaje renueva el oxígeno en el, en el agua, en cambio estaba el lago quieto, 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 como planchado, y seguramente salieron a la superficie para oxigenar, para eh, sentir eh, oxígeno. No aparecieron con frío o algo así. Era realmente un, un tiempo muy sofocante. Y salieron protegidos por la isla. No salieron en, abiertamente. De todos los avistamientos hay algunos puntos en común. Sobre todo cuando la gente dice que emerge como si fuera el lomo de una ballena con un ruido muy fuerte. En varios lugares eso es común, eh, incluso con diferencia de, de relato de muchos años. Y hay algunos relatos eh, muy fuertes también donde aseguran que ese lomo que emergió del lago ha tenido influencia en algunos accidentes que han ocurrido en el lago con lanchas y con pescadores, con familias que andaban navegando. ¿no? Eh, la mayoría de los videos parecen mostrar algo, pero no es nada. Eh, yo he visto muchas cosas que son troncos, eh, he visto incluso filmaciones de unos animales que se llaman huillines, que son como nutrias grandes, eh, he visto olas, lo que a veces se llama la famosa ola única, cuando el lago está muy planchado, hay corrientes internas que levantan una ola y después se termina. Hay algunos videos que realmente me han sorprendido y no puedo decir qué es, pero no es ni un tronco flotando, ni huillines nadando, ni la ola única. La, la Patagonia fue siempre muy dura, desde el principio hasta el final. Y mucho más dura es en el fin del mundo, donde le llaman el fin del mundo, ¿no? En Ushuaia, Tierra del Fuego. Las leyendas patagónicas, por ejemplo, que tenés la ciudad de los Césares, tenés la leyenda del cuero, tenés, eh, bueno, una infinidad de cosas que hacen a la Patagonia un lugar, si se quiere decir, un poco encantado. Hay distintas culturas de las cuales si uno aprende, eh, tenés una riqueza total. Sobre todo la cultura de la gente de la tierra, ¿no? Que fueron los primeros, los originarios, los que poblaron primero la Patagonia. En realidad hay registros de hace 17.000 años. Estos monstruos que se ven aquí vienen muchas veces de tradición en tradición. Se van pasando oralmente, digamos, ¿no? Patagonia es maravillosa. Ya lo había dicho Darwin cuando en su viaje aquí en 1833. Es un museo gigante. Eh, es un lugar donde los fósiles abundan por todos lados. Un plesiosaurio es un animal que tiene cuello largo, tiene eh, cuatro aletas, dos delanteras y dos traseras, y una cola. Eran animales netamente acuáticos. Ver un plesiosaurio hoy día en un lago es como ver un hombre de un millón de años caminando por la calle. Técnicamente es imposible. Hace 65 millones de años los plesiosaurios desaparecen y es imposible que hoy día existan. Eh, eso no quiere decir que la naturaleza no nos tenga reservado algún, alguna sorpresa. Puede ser que todavía hayan sobrevivido algunos animales, como el celacanto, por ejemplo, que es un pez que se encontró en la India. 
hace más o menos 60 años, que se creía extinguido hace 65 millones de años. Y ese pez fue formando híbridos, 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 hasta llegar a la fecha de hoy. Yo supongo que si ese, ese pez que se tendría que haber extinguido hace 65 millones de años y no lo hizo, ¿por qué no pudo haber sobrevivido y haber hecho híbridos un preciosaurio? Hay un trabajo realizado por científicos de la Universidad del Sur, de aquí de Argentina, donde ellos descubrieron que los famosos lomos que se ven navegando eh, sobre el agua son burbujas de gas que eh, salen de una falla que hay en el lago Nahuel Huapi que van formando eh, como si fuera el lomo de un eh, plesiosaurio que va navegando. Esas burbujas de gas son producidas porque nosotros estamos en una cuenca petrolífera. Nosotros tenemos una cultura muy, muy tecnológica, eh, tecnología por todos lados, que no está mal, por, por supuesto que está muy bien, eh, pero nos olvidamos nosotros muchos eh, de lo que es la Tierra, de lo que la Tierra nos da, de lo que la Tierra nos enseña. Entonces no podemos eh, nosotros aceptar, ¿cómo te puedo decir?, la creencia de que puede existir un monstruo en un lago. ¿Cómo puede existir una cosa semejante? Algunos dicen que el lago Nahuel Huapi tiene conexiones con el Océano Pacífico. Por eso dicen que entraría el Nahuelito del Océano Pacífico para aquí. Pero eso es imposible también. Los chilenos dicen de que ese animal se ve en el Pacífico. Ahora, ¿cómo llega acá? Yo pienso que la cordillera no es una mole, sino que hay subterráneos. Porque si no, ¿cómo puede ser que el lago esté siempre a la misma altura? Porque con la lluvia no crece. Si el Océano Pacífico estuviera aquí y el Nahuel Guapi aquí, el Nahuel Guapi tendría agua salada. ¿Sí? Y si fuera al revés, que el Nahuel Huapi está más alto que el Pacífico, eh, las aguas del Nahuel Huapi desembocarían en el Pacífico y no en el Atlántico. Y si estuvieran los dos al mismo nivel, eh, habría, tendría que tener un, una caverna muy grande. La sensación que tengo de vivir acá es de libertad, de aire puro, sobre todo el silencio. Y a la mañana temprano escucho los pájaros. Y tengo un carancho, que es un eh, es una, un ave más, más bien grande, gris, que se para arriba del poste y tenemos una conversación. Yo tengo una conexión muy fuerte con la naturaleza, en general. Tanto, tanto sea eh, árboles, plantas y animales. Las culturas indígenas son muy distintas a nuestras culturas. Ellos respetan la tierra, respetan sus tradiciones, respetan sus, entre comillas, sus monstruos, sus seres mitológicos. Ellos los respetan eh, porque es parte de su vida. La tierra es parte de ellos. Le llaman monstruo. ¿Qué derecho tenemos nosotros? Porque encontremos animales que no son lo mismo que lo que nosotros sabemos. Que no se parecen a un caballo, ni a una oveja, ni a un perro. ¿Por qué tenemos que llamarlos monstruos? Cuando apareció ahí en, en, en la isla, eran un grande, que yo pensé, tendría que ser la hembra, y dos más chiquitos estaban jugando ahí. Por eso los eh, chapoteando, como quien dice, ¿no? Que está la mamá con los chicos en la playa. Y, este, y por eso pude verles todo el cuerpo, que no, 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 no son terrestres, que tienen aletas, cuatro aletas. Me encantó verlos, no es cierto que estuvieran libres. Y en eso, la que yo suponía que era la hembra, se paró de golpe y miró para el lado del lago y venían lanchas del club náutico. Entonces yo empecé a gritar acá. ¡Vayan sin! ¡Vayan sin! Como una loca. 
No sé si me escucharon o no me escucharon. La cuestión que hicieron y desaparecieron debajo del agua. Nosotros depredamos, no vamos a ir a estudiar una, a un, una criatura, como decís vos, que está nadando en el... No vamos a investigar a ver qué es esto, por qué está acá. Nos vamos directamente o con un arpón o con una bomba, tenemos que destruir. En cambio, la gente anterior, nuestros antepasados, no hacían eso. Las pruebas que hay son circunstanciales de un avistaje o de una fotografía que supuestamente se puede tomar ocasionalmente. Pero pruebas científicas, científicas, no, porque eh, para los científicos eh, es muy difícil creer que un animal de esas características o una bestia de esas características pueda haber sobrevivido a demasiados este, cambios climáticos y demás. Toda leyenda viene de una realidad. Eh, primero está la realidad, después se convierte en una leyenda y después se convierte ya en un mito. Una de las versiones eh, que afirman que el Nahuelito no existe, eh, yo la tomo de las experiencias de un viejo capitán de barco, hoy fallecido, que se llamó don Fernando Galeani. Desde la década de 1930, cuando empezó a navegar al lago Nahuel Huapi, eh, sostenía que la presencia del Nahuelito era nada más y nada, nada menos que lo que él llamaba la ola muerta. According to Captain Galliani, a dead wave is created by the passage of a boat. This ripple can travel for great distances along the surface of a lake, and together with an optical effect caused by the sun, may seem strange. Esa teoría que, que yo la tenía como válida me hizo eh, pensar en, en la posibilidad de que realmente el animal existiese. Eh, porque un día bajando, eh, un amigo mío bajando desde el Cerro Campanario, vio un movimiento raro en el lago, más o menos entre el movimiento y la silla, unos dos kilómetros, eh, y él apuntó con su cámara y lo trajo con el zoom, y era un cuerpo eh, que se estaba moviendo, eh, que ascendía hacia la superficie formando un círculo, una curva, en realidad, muy cerca de la costa del brazo campanario, casi en superficie, porque el color del cuerpo era de más o menos grisáceo, un gris claro, en mi memoria, y volvía siempre en curva a hundirse en el agua y desaparecía. Realmente estas imágenes eh, nos dieron a pensar de que posiblemente algún animal vivo estuviese en las profundidades del Nahuel Huapi, porque, vuelvo a decir, un tronco no sube en curva, a la superficie y vuelve a hundirse en una trayectoria pensada, sino que eso realmente tenía vida y debía ser bastante grande. Los que éramos más escépticos en, en pensar en la, en la vida, en la presencia de un abuelito, eh, la verdad que en ese momento le dimos la duda de por lo menos que algo había abajo del lago, pero no sabía muy bien qué. These images captured the attention of the media and were published on national television for all the country to see. Yo creo que existe, eh, que es parecido, parecida a una mantarraya. Yo creo que hay una pareja o, o un individuo que está este, y que puede vivir tranquilamente. O sea, sustentarse del lago, tranquilamente. Me sorprendió ver una cosa eh, flotando en el lago. Era como si fuera un globo negro que venía a toda velocidad desde la, desde la península de San Pedro, del fondo de la cordillera. Fui a buscar el larga vista para enfocarlo mejor y cuando enfoco el larga vista veo que esa cosa negra que, que flotaba no era un globo común ni tampoco un submarino, como pensé, porque había sacado un cuello muy largo con la cabeza arriba. Creí, creí que era el periscopio. Y cuando vi todo el cuerpo, busqué rápido una hoja para dibujarlo. Y llamé a la radio para decir que si, por favor, miren, porque yo no quería ser la única de que haya visto semejante animal. Tengo que fotografía, pero no tenía rollo. ¿No es cierto? Y este pletosaurio no me, no me avisaba por teléfono cuando venía. <risa> A lo mejor vino muchas más veces que yo no lo pude ver, ¿no? 
de la fecha que vino, las dos veces, las tres veces que lo vi, hacía, estaba el lago planchado, no había, era, era muy agobiante el tiempo. Para mí, se alimenta de algas. No le da tampoco la boca para comer a una persona. Si alguna vez se le hubiera ocurrido comer a un ser humano, se hubiera muerto envenenado. Porque nosotros somos tan malos, destilamos tanta maldad, que se hubiera muerto envenenado el pobre abuelito. cuenta un detalle interesante los lagos estos no son lagos muy viejos su antigüedad son eh, ronda entre un millón y medio de años aproximadamente por lo que eh, entre el espacio de 65 millones de años a hace un millón y medio dónde vivió el abuelito si el lago no existía el abuelito no podía existir estos animales eran de aguas técnicamente cálidas, porque los, el sistema jurásico y cretácico tenía mares con aguas un poco más cálidas. Pero eh, puede ser que porque se observa más en verano que en invierno. En invierno aquí hace mucho frío y, y, y no da mucho para pararse al lado del lago a mirar a ver qué es lo que está pasando. Y hay mucho viento, el agua está más en movimiento, eh, contrariamente que el verano que el agua está más más este, quieta y a lo mejor se ven algunas cosas, pero eso no es ningún indicativo para decir que en verano se ven más que en invierno. Te podría decir que en verano las, 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 las burbujas de gas eh, son más solubles y, y suben con mucha más facilidad que en invierno. Aparentemente existirían animales raros en diferentes lugares del mundo. Eh, en realidad nadie los vio. Tampoco vimos a Dios y creemos en Dios, ¿no es cierto? Yo tengo una teoría. Para mí hay tortugas gigantes en este lago. Los científicos dicen que no hay. Yo he tenido tortugas junto con mi hijo en la mano, tortugas grandes, eh, tortugas acuáticas en este lago. Entonces, eh, digamos, eh, creo que puede haber habido una deformación de alguna especie de tortuga. Esta es una, una zona de, de tortugas de hace muchísimo tiempo. Eh, Ojalá la investigación a través de este trabajo audiovisual me dé la razón. Si no, veremos qué es, pero algo es. Algunos dicen que hay una tortuga gigante, pero eh, la tortuga es un animal, es un reptil. Y en las aguas frías no creo que pudiese andar mucho tiempo porque en pleno invierno se congelaría. Eh, los reptiles necesitan calor para vivir, no agua fría. En esta era, en este tiempo que estamos viviendo, todo te oculta. En la investigación OVNI todo está sellado, top secret. En la investigación criptozoológica lo mismo. Entonces la gente no tiene medios como para poder buscar. Sabemos más del espacio que de lo que tenemos acá. Hay zonas en el Congo, en el Congo belga, en África, que son inexplorables todavía. En la selva brasilera se siguen descubriendo tribus indígenas. Estamos viviendo en un mundo en donde nos están poniendo otro tipo de cosas en la cabeza. Si alguien se arriesgara a investigar bien, bien lo que existe en este lago, yo pienso que se llevaría una sorpresa. No digo que va a encontrar un preciosaurio, ¿no? Pero sí puede encontrar algún ser lacustre que pueda dimitificar eh, en algún momento el mito del abuelito. No, yo no he visto al abuelito. Mi creencia está en la lectura, mi creencia está en la investigación, eh, en el contacto con la gente, de haber visto, de haber salido y de leer, de buscar información. Desde siempre me interesó todo este tipo de misterios y enigmas. No es desde ahora. Yo hace más o menos 42 años que estoy en la investigación de todo este tipo de cosas. De ovnis, de parapsicología, de ocultismo, de criptozoología. Todo lo que tenga palabra misterio a mí me gusta. Entonces voy e investigo. Trato de buscar el sí y el no. El por qué y el por qué no, digamos, ¿no? ¿no? No soy fanático, digamos. O sea, soy una persona que tengo un criterio. No digo a todo que sí. Todo es una posibilidad espectacular de que pueda estar. Ahora, de que yo te lo aseguro de que pueda estar, no sé. Pero la posibilidad está. 
But all arguments to discredit the testimony in favor of the existence of Nahuelito have little value in the eyes of Roberto Polola. After many years conducting his own investigation, his findings invalidate all these dissenting theories. No, en realidad no pierdo tiempo con, con teorías que no tienen nada que ver con la investigación. Eh, las tengo como referencia, eh, como para decir, bueno, si alguien me pregunta qué pasa con lo escéptico, bueno, lo escéptico es esto, esto, esto y esto. ¿Y qué pasa con lo real? Bueno, lo real es lo que ve el testigo, lo real es lo que te cuentan, lo real son las fotografías. También se pueden trucar las fotografías porque eso es muy, muy común hoy. Pero hay fotografías y fotografías. Ahora hay técnicas que te dicen, bueno, esta fotografía es trucada y esta no. Y muchas de las fotografías que han tomado no son trucadas, porque las han hecho todos los análisis. Entonces han resultado verídicas. Y con las teorías estas ya de, de lo que son las burbujas, de lo que son... Las tomo como una referencia, pero no lo tomo como una cosa, como una cosa muy real. Tenemos un pequeño bichito que es así chiquitito, que es la cucaracha, hace 400 millones de años que está sobre la Tierra. Y esos animales fueron mutando en sí. Fueron mutando, mutando hasta llegar al día de hoy. ¿Por qué no pudo haber mutado un plesiosaurio para llegar a esta altura, a esta vida, a esta época? Bien pudo haberlo hecho. No te puedo asegurar que lo haya hecho, pero si nos basamos en esas pruebas contundentes que están, no puedes decir que no porque sí. Los turistas que llegan a San Carlos de Bariloche básicamente vienen buscando disfrutar de la naturaleza. Esta región tiene múltiples posibilidades de aprovechar la naturaleza, ya sea en, eh, en verano con la, en la montaña, eh, con, con sus lagos. Eh, algún poeta alguna vez la llamó la región de los cuatro cielos porque están bien diferenciadas las cuatro estaciones del año. Eh, ahora, en primavera, la posibilidad es de disfrutar los primeros días de sol con 20, 22, 24 grados de temperatura. Eh, habilitan a las actividades al aire libre, eh, sea tanto en la montaña como en los lagos o en los ríos o en la estepa, que es esa zona donde el bosque no está. Yo siempre digo que esta película va a cambiar eh, un poco la historia de, de la ciudad. La parte científica pueda fundamentar todos sus dichos y la parte de los vecinos y la gente que ha tenido avistamiento también pueda fundamentar y nosotros podamos conocer en profundidad y revivir a partir de, la, de las recreaciones esos avistamientos y encontrar quizás eh, una respuesta que hasta ahora no ha dado ningún trabajo. A principios del siglo XXI, la presencia de Nahuelito en, en todas las excursiones era prácticamente cotidiana. Se lo veía, sobre todo en los días de primavera y verano, los días que el lago está calmo, está planchado. Este, ahí dice la gente que, que es cuando se lo puede ver mejor. Los empresarios del turismo, en general las instituciones, eh, distintos dirigentes, no hablan de Nahuelito. Sí habla la sociedad, el vecino común. Entonces, esa cosa es muy interesante para rescatar. En realidad, entre las pocas manifestaciones de Nahuelito en el lago surface, el monstruo vuelve a su lugar en el folclore. In other words, we hear more about it than we see it. But this doesn't mean that we stop believing. La última referencia que yo tenía era en el 2006. Pero supuestamente desde el 2006 al 2013 han pasado unos años y avistajes habrá visto muchos. No digo que no. Hasta ahora han aparecido 6500 especies diferentes de animales totalmente desconocidos. E incluso hoy hay animales que no se sabe cómo clasificarlos. Vos viste que cada animalito tiene su nombre científico, ¿no? Los científicos se lo ponen para determinar qué tipo de animal es. Bueno, hoy hay una cantidad enorme de estas especies nuevas que todavía en los grandes centros no se puede clasificar. Estamos habitando un planeta casi desconocido. El mensaje que para mí tiene todo esto, ese relato milenario, es cuidemos la naturaleza. Es decir, 
tenés cuidado con el lago, que es muy lindo, pero te podés ahogar. Eh, trata de, de acariciar y de respetar mucho el lago, los arroyos. Eh, un poco más al sur están los hielos continentales. Esa es la interpretación que yo hago. Estos animales, como Nessie, Ogopogo, Mukelembembe, Mipma, Pinguarí, Yeti, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, son animales que vienen ya de una tradición. Porque si hablamos del Bigfoot o hablamos del Sasquatch, por ejemplo, Pie Grande, eh, los indios de Norteamérica, los Cheyenne, los Navajos, los, todos esos, los Anasazi, ya hablaban de todo este tipo de seres que habitaban en ese lugar. Entonces viene de una tradición. Y vos lees, y no puede ser, para mí no puede ser, que todas las culturas de esta gente hayan visto todas estas cosas y no existan. El ser humano necesita creer en algo. El ser humano tiene que creer en algo. Eh, cree en Dios, cree en los, en los este, extraterrestres, que ahí podríamos, tendríamos otra conversación, eh, es más factible. Y tenemos que creer en algo. Y bueno, creemos en un abuelito. ¿Y por qué no? En New Jersey, there lurks a strange monster that terrorizes anyone who ventures deep enough into the forests of the Pine Barrens. I've driven through the pines a few times, but not with the top down. <laughs> no way. Anything can get you. Beware of the Jersey Devil. God almighty, did you, is that, was that running? Something just ran across the road. <laughs> To most people, New Jersey is Atlantic City casinos, the beaches of Cape May, lush national parks, and the backdrop for the legendary television series, The Sopranos. But this beautiful state and its rich history hide a secret, one that terrorizes some and amuses others, the Jersey Devil. Jerry Plameri is among those who fear the Jersey Devil. It was like 1964 and everybody went down the shore, Everyone, everybody went to Seaside. And um, we were on our way home from the shore, going through the pines, and we had a convertible with the top down. And all of a sudden, I heard this blood-curdling scream. This isn't normal, this wasn't human. I looked over in the trees and there was these lights, like two red lights like this, and it seemed to be something like swinging from tree to tree. I guess maybe about two minutes later, all of a sudden, this thing flies in front of us. It was like six feet in front of us. And thank God, because we would have hit it. If he'd have came closer, we would, we would have ran right into him. But he, and he just stood there looking at us. I mean, we just, we sat like this. He stared at us looking mean. And I'm thinking, he's gonna, he's gonna kill us. And we couldn't move. We couldn't even back the car up. We were too scared to do anything. We just, three of us just stared at each other. It was weird, it was really weird. Most people laugh or give me a look like, yeah, right. And three of my girlfriends last night, I told about it. And they all just looked at me. One said, oh, I've heard about it. But, and I says, no, it's real. She didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I don't care if you don't believe me. I believe my mother. Leeds Point in Galloway County is considered the birthplace of the Jersey Devil. It's here that the legend of the monster is taken most seriously, and the mayor, Don Purdy, is particularly proud of their most famous resident. Now, I own a, a towing company with six tow trucks, and I own a body shop, and I own an auto repair center, and then I am the mayor of the town. I don't think that we've ever put a number on the amount of people that travel to Galloway Township or Leeds Point to find the, uh, or search of the Jersey Devil. But I'm sure there's a lot that we don't know. You know from going around the state of New Jersey and different stories that you've heard, but it all comes back to here. 
you know, it all this is it. Galloway Township is the home of the Jersey Devil. Well, Galloway's pretty unique. Galloway Township is uh, the largest municipality in the state of New Jersey. Depends on who's measuring it. Uh, it's uh, 114 square miles. Uh, a lot of people measure some of the wetlands and so forth. Um, it's a large community. It's very really close to um, Atlantic City. Ken Suey is one of our great historians of uh, Galloway Township. And Ken is a great guy in knowing the history of um, not only Galloway Township, but Leeds Point, because that's where Ken lives. Um, and, and I think that uh, there's history there. And I think as long as there's history, it will live. I believe that. Uh, you are in uh, Galloway Township uh, Historical Society Library. We collect uh, anything and everything to do with primarily Galloway Township, but we also have an Atlantic City room, and anything in the area of historical value we assemble and uh, record, keep records on it, and keep it for posterity. This small village of a few hundred souls was named after its founder, Daniel Leeds, a name as famous as it is common among locals. There is but one Leeds family that was established in South Jersey. There was uh, some other ones in New England, but the Leeds family that established in New Jersey went ahead, proceeded. The first mayor of Atlantic City was uh, Leeds. Ch Chalky Leeds. Chalky Leeds. Yeah. Mayor of uh, Galloway Township has been a Leeds at one point in time. Yeah, Harry. Yeah, Harry Leeds. Harry Leeds, and I'm married to a Leeds. <laughs> but the most famous of the Leeds is Jean, or as she's known here, Mother Leeds. This mother of 13 children influenced New Jersey for centuries, beginning in 1735. It seems that Jane Leeds and her husband Daniel lived in a cabin at the edge of a great swamp along the Mullica River. Now, folks in these parts say that it was a strange family, an unusual family. Some people even said that Jane Leeds was a witch. One night, she learned that she was pregnant with her 13th child. And in a moment of understandable weakness, she said, as she was saying her prayers, Lord, let this one not be a child. Let this one be a devil. He was about eight feet tall and the, like the head of a horse. And he looked angry and he had horns. And long, his long arms had claws on the ends of it. You know, like it could really scratch you. The body was like all decrepit, sort of like body of a horse, but, but not beautiful and smooth like a horse would be. And then like when, you know when a horse is up on, on two legs and they're, they're, they're going with their paws like this? The legs in the back are all crooked. Well, this is what he, do, he was. And he was walking on them like that, with hooves. And I'm telling you, I thought I was crazy. I didn't think I really saw this. And um, no sooner did he just stare at us like that for about two minutes, but two minutes is long when you're scared. Um, he just sprouted his wings like this, which were humongous, they were really big, and just took off into the forest. Thank you for not killing me, seriously because I could have been dead. People who claim to have seen the Jersey Devil describe it as having a dog or horse's head, horns, a body like a kangaroo's, broad wings, a reptile's tail, hooves, and razor-sharp claws. Someday in the late fall, listen carefully when you hear the wind coming off the ocean through the pines. It almost seems like someone is trying to tell us something, possibly someone's name. Oh, Mother Leeds. Oh, Mother Leeds. But how does a woman from America's colonial era give birth to the devil? 
Well, we do know that it was an unusual family. It was a very large family. They had 12 children. And Jane Leeds, her problem was not really with her husband. Daniel, he was a good hunter, an excellent fisherman, a decent gardener. There was always food on the table. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that Daniel Leeds didn't take very much interest in the children. And so Jane Leeds was left with the cleaning, the cooking, the laundry, chopping wood, picking things up, putting things away. To tell the truth, she was at her wit's end. She was frustrated. On that frightful night in February of 1735, when Mother Leeds' 13th child was born, it started out a perfectly healthy, normal little baby boy with blonde hair and blue eyes. But then something went terribly wrong. My name is Rochelle Christopher. I am an independent historian with Victorian Vanities. My organization teaches people about American history. And one of the things we look at generally in the show that I do on Weird New Jersey is the New Jersey Devil. And I did see it once. I'd been driving for a couple of hours. I was between Cape May and Stone Harbor. And it jumped out in the road. And of course, it then flew away. Mother Leeds gave birth. The devil apparently was a beautiful baby boy. Soon after he was born, he grew talons and horns and wings unfurled from his back and very long legs. He went into the next room where the midwives were and his father killed his father and mother killed other children cowering in the corner, um, killed his mother, and then flew up the chimney, leaving all of this rubble behind. The tranquility of Leeds Point residents is sometimes disturbed by curious travelers looking for the very source of the Jersey Devil legend. The first stop on their macabre pilgrimage, a house built on the ruins of the legendary residence of Jane Leeds. There were cults who believe in the New Jersey Devil, and some people believe this is the neighborhood, this is the house. They're going to threaten, they're going to, they want what they want, which is to burn down the house if they can't take pictures, to do seances, to conjure it up. But they're looking for a connection to the devil, which this lady who owns the house claims is not. There is nearby a cemetery. It's called Leeds Point Community Cemetery. And it has maybe about 40 or 50 stones in it. And there were kids from Stockton, students from Stockton University, and they did a seance up there, hoping to conjure up something. History and folklore mingle in the legendary stories of the Jersey Devil. One of the most famous of them features none other than Napoleon's brother, Joseph Bonaparte. There's a wonderful story about Joseph Bonaparte, the, um, the older brother of Napoleon, who lived in Philadelphia while he was waiting for his house to be built in Mount Holly. And um, he had an encounter with the New Jersey Devil. And apparently he looked at it with his gun and the New Jersey Devil looked at him and they both looked at each other and finally the devil flew away. Well, Joseph Bonaparte swore that he was going to find the devil and bring it home as a trophy. Of course, he never saw it again. But it was in 1909, during the week of January 16th to 22nd, that the Jersey Devil made its most famous appearance, throwing the entire country into panic. Monster sightings occurred in Atlantic City, Philadelphia, and outside New York City. The newspapers picked up the story, and the Philadelphia Zoo even offered $10,000 for his capture. 1909, the week when everybody said they saw it. That was the week when the New Jersey Devil was seen all over southern New Jersey, but it flew away. It was seen in Bridgeton, and it flew away. It was seen by a group of, of people on a trolley car, in Camden and it flew away. And that seems to be the story. They saw it 
and it flew away. And everyone on the trolley car said they saw it. It made an appearance on a rooftop. Adults in Philadelphia and Camden were afraid to send their children to school because they were afraid the New Jersey Devil was going to make its appearance. Paul Evans Peterson Jr. is one of those who believes in the legend of the Jersey Devil. He devotes his free time to organizing monster hunts and writing songs about New Jersey and its history. He even wrote a book, The Legendary Pine Barrens, New Tales from Old Haunts. Hey, my name is Paul Evans Peterson Jr. I am a singer, songwriter, author, and jewelry maker. And I live here in the Pine Barrens of South Jersey, and I've seen the Jersey Devil. When Jerry Plumeri saw an ad in the local newspaper announcing a conference hosted by Paul Evans Peterson, she jumped at the opportunity to share her terrifying encounter in the summer of 64. I kind of like put it in the, in the back of my mind because everybody thought I was nuts. So I ignored it. Now, mind you, years and years are gone by. This was 1964. When I saw in the newspaper, uh, they're having this, this talk at the, at the library. Paul Peterson is going to, um, he writes books about the Jersey Devil. And I said, you know what, I got to go see this. I really, there's something telling me to go. And I sat there in the second row, because I knew I was going to talk to him. And I'm in the second row and he's talking. I was mesmerized by his talking because he, was, he saw the Jersey Devil five times. And, I, and he said, has anybody seen the Jersey Devil? So I got, I went like this real meek because I'm thinking, these people are going to think I'm nuts. But they, you could hear a pin drop in the room. You made this your life. Thing. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. I never saw his face. I saw it hopping away from me. Ooh. And I heard it coming up my cellar steps and banging on the door. But never came face to face. Never came face to face with it. Nope. Let me ask him I'll write a book called I Shook Hands with the Jersey Devil. That'd be great. I'd love that. Me too. Oh, I God. shook claws with the Jersey <laughs> Devil. <laughs> If the Jersey Devil was born in Leeds Point, he hides in the forests of Pine Barrens. Today, Jerry Plumeri and Paul Evans Peterson meet at the visitor center of the Pine Barrens Preservation Alliance, on the edge of the forest where the monster last appeared. Does it, he, no, do you want me to tell the truth? He doesn't look anything like what I saw. What I saw was about this tall, but these are like real hands. He didn't have real hands, they were claws. And the legs didn't know nothing like this. It was like a horse when it was standing up on, on, on its hind legs, where the, the back legs are bent, and he had hooves, which he has hooves, and a long tail. But um, a head of a horse, but this, this looks too gentle. He didn't look gentle, he had red lights for his eyes and horns. So a lot of people down through the years have seen it and, uh, and, and have shot at it. I have a friend of mine that shot at it three times. See, you don't, you don't hear about it for a long, long time. Right. Well, they say that any time you see a lot, of, a lot of sightings of the Jersey Devil, yeah. it means a war is coming. One of the best ways to protect yourself from the Jersey Devil is you got to find these tracks. And this is a story that goes back to me and my grandkids, or my kids when my kids were little. And I would tell them, you got to get a little shovel and dig the track real carefully and put it into a glass jar and screw the lid on it and keep that jar under your bed. <laughs> and as long as you keep that track in a jar under your bed, the Jersey Devil will never hurt you. Wow. They all think we're all nuts in Jersey Devil. Yeah, no, seriously, they do. Between the Jersey Devil and all the people in the malls, we are crazy. Right, really, when you come down to it, the Jersey Devil. Now, where do you hear that? Any, any other state? Yeah. All the stories that have ever been told about the Jersey Devil 
are born right there. Yep. That's it. That's where it all comes from. The Pine Barrens is 4,500 square kilometers or 1,700 square miles of dense forest bordering the Atlantic coast south of the state of New Jersey. In 1978, it became the first nature reserve protected by the U.S. government. People come here to get lost in nature. Some come to chase monsters. It is said that come nightfall, campers often find themselves more than a little unnerved. All right, what we're going to do right now is we're going to go through the... Uh like the heart of the Pine Barrens. And we're gonna be looking for uh, Jersey Devil tracks. And uh, if we can, you know, we never know, we might see something. Uh, the correct behavior is just to pay a close attention to what's going on in the woods, uh, not disturbing anything, because there's like 30 different kinds of plants that grow there and nowhere else that are on the endangered uh, species lists. Uh, there's a lot of animals on the same list, endangered species. And we're just gonna watch the woods and see what comes out of it. And if we see the Jersey Devil, this has a really good reverse gear. And we'll be putting it in reverse and getting away from it. Welcome to New Jersey. <laughs> when I go hunting for the Jersey Devil, I like to go either right in this area, back along the Mullica River, or down in Cumberland County, which is closer to the Delaware Bay than it is to the Atlantic Ocean. That's number one, that's why I keep a compass in the car. But as long as I know where the sun is, I'm usually pretty good about not getting lost. But I've been back here before, and it, it gets very frustrating if you don't know where you are. And you can get yourself really lost back here. And I mean for a whole day. Maybe, and if it gets dark, forget about it. If you don't know what the hell phase the moon's in, <laughs> you're gonna stay out there. I love it out here. This place is my heart, man, it really is. And ever since, ever since I've been a little kid, I just keep coming back out here and I've you know, tried to learn everything I can about all the different species of plants and animals and, and about the people. It's just, it's just a really special place. The earth in the Pine Barrens is sandy, which caused many European settlers to leave the area in search of more fertile land. Since then, this vast territory, which occupies nearly a quarter of the state of New Jersey, has been considered an inhospitable land. But this is a mistake, according to historian Kenneth Suey. This would have been a paradise for people that were establishing uh, housing first coming down. I have fuel, I have fire, I have water, I have fish in the water, I have food. I have cranberries that can grow here. They, they had the necessities of life. I, I don't consider us barren at all. Uh, just look around you. Do you see anything barren about, about where we're at? I mean, water lilies, uh, holly, magnolias, we have it all. Yeah, we're only going to go a little further. It is here that the Jersey Devil has made his home. The monster has been known to take long drinks from the deserted swamps of the Pine Barrens. Another favorite haunt of the Jersey Devil, the ghost town of Batstow. This uninhabited village dates from 1766, almost 30 years after the birth of the monster. The Jersey Devil was, has been seen here through the years. Um, this village was started in the 1700s, and it was started as a uh, iron works. And they made stuff, iron stuff, for the colonists. And during the Revolutionary War, they made munitions and stuff for the uh, for the Revolutionary War fighters. And uh, after that, in the 1800s, it was turned into a glass works. And they made window glass, what they call window light. And uh, the state of New Jersey has preserved it. And it looks pretty much like it did 
uh, back in that time. Over the years, the Jersey Devil's been seen here several times, re reported seen here several times by, you know, residents, workers, and this is the area where the sightings are very prevalent. It's right around here, because we're not that far from the Back Bays, the Batstow River's right through here, uh, Batstow Lake is right over there, and it seems that the Jersey Devil prefers areas where there's water. So in areas like this, this is, you know, where you're gonna see it. Yeah, he's quiet until he starts screaming at people. And that's, that's mainly what you hear about, is people hear it. They hear this ungodly scream that they can't you know, put their finger on what kind of animal they've ever heard in their life made that scream. And a lot of your quote unquote sightings are actually hearings, you know, people that have heard whatever this thing is. And uh, now we're gonna go back into uh, Bulltown Road, which is another kind of like a village back here where it's been seen a lot. So. If you fish where there ain't no fish, you ain't gonna catch them. If you go looking for the Jersey Devil where he ain't gonna be that day, you ain't gonna see it. <laughs> How did the Pine Barrens become synonymous with fear and danger in the minds of the residents of New Jersey? Over the centuries, some people have had a personal interest in cultivating the mystery of the forest. The Pine Barrens, because it's so uh, sparsely populated, um, is a good place if you want to uh, carry on illegal activities, because who's going to see you? Uh, so, for example, in the early days of the Republic, um, Alexander Hamilton had the idea to collect duties at the ports. So ships coming from Europe might go to New York or Philadelphia, and when they pull in, the tax collector was there to collect the customs duty. But let's say you don't want to pay the taxes. Well, maybe you could take your ship to Barnegat Bay or to Tuckerton and come ashore with the goods loaded onto Conestoga wagons, which could take the goods to New York and Philadelphia, you would increase your profits because you didn't have to pay the taxes. Now, naturally, you don't want revenue officers coming around. And so you tell people the story of the Jersey Devil. You know, when outsiders come around into the woods, they often don't come out. And it was a, it was a mode of intimidation. Small, sandy roads crisscross the Pine Barrens. In New Jersey, they are called sugar sand roads. And of course, to venture on them increases your chance of coming face to face with the Jersey Devil. Did you, is that, was that running? Oh, oh man, something just ran across the road. This is, this is where, if you're gonna see something, this is where you're gonna see it. The Jersey Devil has been seen, or reported, reportedly seen, and this is one of the main roads that they have the Jersey Devil hunts on. Because this is pretty much in the middle of the Pine Barrens right here. This is smack dab in the middle of it. I've driven through the pines a few times, but not with the top down. <laughs> no way, no. <sighs> Anything can get you. Anything can drop out from the trees. Even today, many people, sane, trustworthy people, 
say they believe in the existence of the Jersey Devil. There have been over 2,000 reported sightings. But what did these people really see? A lot of people have said they've seen it. Could be anything. Could be drunk. Could be tired. Could be they want attention. Could be they saw something. I can tell you that I don't believe in it, but when I drive through the Pine Barrens at night, there is something, it is creepy, and I don't know what it is. There are um, explanations, uh, and uh, many times um, my colleagues, fellow scholars, have come up with hypotheses to explain away uh, what people uh, saw but they think they saw the Jersey Devil, but it was really something else. One is um, like the fruit bat, because bat-like wings, okay, we're, we're halfway there, and it's night, and it's in the woods, and you're not familiar with wildlife, and you're scared, and you, you know the story already. Well, the Jersey Devil pops into your mind as an explanation for what you saw. So bat would be one possibility. Uh, far more uh, plausible is the great horned owl. The, the great horned owl has quite a wingspan and makes clicking noises and coming at you at night in the woods could be frightening enough and again if you already know the story of the Jersey Devil you might mistake the great horned owl for the Jersey Devil. I have uh, fished, uh, trapped, and uh, hunted for most of my life. I've been out in the bays, in the woods, in the swamps, and every hour of the day and night, I've heard some really strange noises, which I have to attribute to being animal noises of one type or another. Uh, but I do not believe that there's a Jersey Devil. I believe it is a legend. It's really kind of a lousy feeling when you're trying to tell somebody something and they're laughing at you. It's supernatural. And people, a lot of people are interested in that. I know I am. I mean, I watch some crazy shows, you know, thriller and all that. I watch some crazy shows, but this wasn't, this wasn't a show. This was true. So I don't see how they can't believe when there's people like me, and I know there's other people that's seen them. And I'm telling you word for word, and I never changed my story when I told it to Paul. I've never swayed from the story. It's a truth. I'm not making it up. But, like, a, like I said, a couple of my friends think I'm off, off my rocker. They think I'm making it up for attention. No way. The last stop on the trail of the Jersey Devil, the Washington Tavern, the only remnant of a village long gone. This is as far as we'll go. The ruins are right over there. This is the site of the Washington Tavern. And this is one of the best places, if you listen real close, you will see how absolutely dead quiet it is. You can see how old this, this growth in here is. This has been here a long, long time. And it's amazing, any time of year you come here, it's always this quiet. It's like everything else is afraid to live around here. And that's, that's part of the legend, that uh, at the birthplace of the Jersey Devil, no animal, birds, anything. It's very strange. Very strange. Gives you a chill every time you come down here, and I've been coming down here for a long while. There's basically <clears throat> a clearing over here The Jersey Devil has been sighted a lot here. And it was one of the hangouts of Joe Moliner 
one of the pine robbers. And like I said, this is all that's left. But this was a tavern uh, built out here in the middle of nowhere now. But back in the day, this was quite the place to be. And now it's just a ghost town. In the time when these ruins were a village, legends about monsters had significant resonance in the community. Ever since the 20th century, um, there have been forces working against these traditional stories. I mean, in, in my romantic imagination, I can see, say, in the 19th century, uh, the village storyteller uh, sitting around the potbelly stove in the general store, regaling people with stories and people with fiddles and banjos having a Saturday night dance. In the old days, people made their own entertainment. They made their own music, they told their own stories. Our culture doesn't really support leisurely storytelling anymore. And that's kind of like the the foundation and the floor would have went across, and that was the that was the basement of it. This all used to be brick, and it's disappearing. See, even just even just standing here, you got to wonder. It really feels like you're being watched. The story of the Jersey Devil has been passed down for three centuries, and along the way it has undergone some changes. The commercialization of the Jersey Devil was inevitable, but it had some positive and some negative consequences according to folklorist Angus Gillespie. The traditional stories of the Jersey Devil, and I think this is something that's very hard for contemporary audiences to understand, in the original versions, in the, among the old families of South Jersey, this is an awesome, fearsome, nasty, dangerous creature who's said to have slit the throats of babies in their cribs. Uh, this is a creature that's monstrous and evil. Since we have, for the last several years, this hockey team called the New Jersey Devils, there's a lot of name recognition. I mean, people almost worldwide, uh, certainly in North America, uh, recognize the name. But they don't really know the story. Uh, and the other problem is, over time, and particularly in places like Smithville, which is very close to Leeds Point, you have like souvenir shops selling uh, t-shirts, uh, shot glasses, uh, pennants, uh, postcards, and, and the usual representation is of the uh, Jersey Devil as a kind of a cartoon character who's kind of cute. Uh, and um, from my point of view, I mean, that's, that's all wrong. I mean, this is not clever or cute or cartoon-like. This is awesome and scary and frightful. Once feared, today the Jersey Devil is celebrated. Even New Jersey native Bruce Springsteen has sung about the devil. Everyone embraces the maiden New Jersey legend, and everyone has their story to tell. And I was a kid riding a bike down there one time. My dogs were with me the dirt road back there in King's Highway. Something came out of the woods, made a noise. My dogs, like, chased it through the woods. They were barking and all this stuff. I don't know, I don't, I don't know what it was this day. But I've hunted all around here all my life. And you just hear all the Jersey Devil stories, and then I'd be in the woods, you'd hear some screaming, people said, ah, it's just a fox. But I don't know what it was. I'm 49, and I've been told this stuff all my, since I was little. 
Who knows if it's true? I mean, I, I sort of believe it. It's like Bigfoot. I believe in Bigfoot. As a kid, I saw it as real. As a kid, I certainly saw it as real, especially going to, you go to the local library and they have all the, uh, the old Jersey Devil documentaries like, you know, oh, we saw something rustling in the woods, you know. It's, <laughs> yeah, I, I loved it, I, I loved it. You know, just having that, that bit of imagination to what might be lurking in the woods. And there's, there's plenty of woods for it to lurk in, too. I talk about it all the time. I talk about it anybody that'll listen, pretty much. <laughs> so, well, I have plenty of relatives that, that have claimed that they've heard mostly heard the Jersey Devil, something rustling in the bushes. I think it's usually probably just a deer screaming, but I like to believe them when they say they heard it. But even those who believe in the monster don't necessarily think it's dangerous or means to harm anyone. I just think he's scared and I think he's lost yeah. and doesn't know where he belongs. Yeah. And maybe he's he just wants to reach out, but everybody's so scared of him because he looks like what people would call a freak, not to be mean, but he, he doesn't look normal and people get scared of that. And he's become the devil. If he was the devil, he would have killed people. Yeah. He would have attacked people. So he's, I wouldn't, I think devil's the wrong word for him. I think he's just one of our many wonderful people to add to Jersey. I asked Paul how in the world this thing is still alive if it was born in the 1700s. Because let's face it, come on, that's a long time ago. And he says it reinvents itself. The first thing I said, well, who does he mate with? I mean, there's no other monsters. Who does he mate with? But the thing is, it's there. It's really there. But he doesn't hurt anybody. That's, that's the main thing. I think that, that's pretty cool. He's, he's, he's sort of like in limbo. He's, he's ro roaming around and has no place to go. As a professional folklorist, it's my job to be a professional agnostic. Uh, I don't want to be too skeptical, and I don't want to be too gullible. Uh, besides, when I'm interviewing people, I have to show respect. And um, if somebody believes in the Jersey Devil, I'm not going to disabuse them of that. Uh, I want to draw them out. Um, and I think um, it's easy enough to find skeptics. It's harder to find true believers, and it's harder yet to find a true believer who will go public with her story. Uh, we didn't see him, and it's, it's, you know, there's been a lot of people down through the years that go on Jersey Devil hunts, and with all kinds of equipment, with all kinds of detectors and electronic stuff and this, that, and the other thing. And that's not usually when it happens. You know, hopefully we could have had it happen, but uh, it didn't. Of course, the day's not over yet. You never know. It's a long ride back to Hamilton. But um, usually it's, it's somebody down here fishing or hunting or just going for a walk, and the thing will come out and stand in front of them or, or you know, jump in front of its car. And that's, that's, when, you, that's when it's seen. It's at, it's at the strangest times, or the most unexpected times. And, and any time you come to this part of South Jersey, could be the time you see it. And every time I come down here fishing, or just taking a ride with a wife and taking some pictures, that could be the time that you look right into its eyes, and it's Jersey Devil. Backwater marshes where the cranberries grow. The water takes on the color of wine as it flows. And every evening the sun's fire drowns in the bay. And all the creatures that live here, they have their own special way. And I swear it's true, these pine barren blue. The folks that live in the barren, they have a story they tell. They say the 
old Leeds woman She bore a child from hell The night he's born he took wings off And flew out into the night They say you still hear him screaming When the conditions are right and I swear it's true, he's pine barren blue. Every time I go down there, I may not say anything to anybody else, but in my head, I'm thinking, I'm You're looking, looking in the trees. I'm looking in the trees. I'm, uh, you know, even when I'm driving, I'm looking just to make sure, because you, you just never know. You don't know. I think it has to do with the weirdness that is New Jersey. If you're at all interested in the weird, New Jersey is probably the home of the weird. The next time you go into the woods late at night, take care. And when you hear the sudden crack of a twig behind you, beware. Beware of the Jersey Devil. In the heart of Pennsylvania, a strange creature has been seen over the countryside and forests. We may be dealing with maybe a possible flying creature. We don't know. Around here, they call it the Thunderbird. I wouldn't want to be in his food chain. We just keep going out there and we keep trying to you know, find those pieces of the puzzle that are missing. And they are somewhere, and they will be found. Pennsylvania, USA, a state rich in history. The Philadelphia metropolitan area is considered the birthplace of American democracy. It's also famous for its beautiful natural surroundings and for once being the center of America's steel industry. Today, its rural areas seem frozen in time, small enclaves forgotten to history. But this state has a well-kept secret. Here, locals are passionate about all things paranormal. And it is said that sometimes, at dusk, strange creatures take to the skies. I'm Joe Mayer and from South Greensburg. I'm a stonemason. It was just about dark. The sky still had light in it, but it was real close to turning dark, late dusk. And uh, it just came out of nowhere. I mean, it made no noise except the swish of the wings I heard. And I was, when I looked up, it was just like this. I mean, it just never looked at us or anything. It just was on a mission, I guess, heading somewhere to feed. We were out here. My wife, Ryan, and our neighbor were sitting right there. I was over to fire here, flipping the ribs. And I heard a flapping behind me. It sounded like a whoosh sound of a wing. And I turned around and looked, and up in the sky behind me was a huge bird. It was right there. It was right there. I watched this wing. I heard the wing coming down as I turned around, and it went straight down that road, right where the ditches and the tree up there is. It probably cleared that tree uh, 20 feet. Its second wing flap was about where that telephone pole was. The next one was about halfway down that road, and then it was gone. It was that fast. It was like 10 seconds, maybe 12 seconds, and it was gone. What was that? I don't know. And I jumped in on the internet after that, and we were looking up birds, and we seen nothing that looked like it. Yeah, nothing. Closest thing to that was, in, in color-wise, was like, like a golden eagle, which is a darker brown. But it was, I've seen eagles. That wasn't an eagle. I was just a huge bird. Mary is passionate about anything paranormal. She knows all of the Thunderbird stories. I've talked to many people who have actually had encounters of various kinds. People who have seen it flying, people who have seen it, people who have complained that the fish in their pond have all disappeared because the Thunderbird has eaten them. Um, friends that have had little dogs taken from a fenced-in yard at night. So, yeah, I, I know some Thunderbird stuff. 
for Mary, monsters aren't just a passion, they're a job. This is my store. It's a gift shop, it's got all kinds of fun stuff in it. We like monsters. Well, right now we're studying Thunderbirds because the Thunderbird is well known around here for doing some very strange things. Okay, Thunderbirds, dream catchers, cars with Thunderbird feathers on them. Come on, Bigfoot. You can actually have your picture taken with Bigfoot. This is a picture of an Indian teepee with a Thunderbird. You can see what they were seeing. And it wasn't a heron, and it wasn't an eagle, and it wasn't an owl. It was something else. I think it's a small segment of the population that really finds them interesting, wants to know more, wants to follow up on them, wants to look for themselves to see, you know, looking around to see if they can see something. So I'd, I'd say a small part of our population, but a serious one, are keeping track of what goes on. South Greensburg, a small town of 2,000 inhabitants, has experienced the most Thunderbird reports. In this small, tightly knit community, news of the paranormal spreads like wildfire. I'm Betty Dobies, mayor of South Greensburg. It's just a friendly town. Everybody is, they look out for each other. You know what I mean? It's like a, a knitted community where everybody looks out for each other. We don't bother each other, but if there's a problem, everybody comes in and helps solve that problem or help you out in any way they can. It's just that kind of communities that we have here. It would have a big wig band that people have seen as far as, oh, Acme and all around the area. Somebody's seen it up on 819. A friend of mine's seen it up in Acme where they have a pond. But as far as being a Thunderbird or not, I can't answer that. But there are sightings of a big bird, and that's what it is. Mike is one of those who saw the disturbing, elusive creature. It was uh, September 2001, and I was uh, standing on the porch right of my old house, watching the traffic go by. It was on a major highway, 119, in Greensburg. And um, caught my uh, attention was a noise uh, of it sounded like a uh, flags flapping in a thunderstorm. And uh, I looked up and I thought I saw a plane. I did a double take, like a small plane. And here it was a bird. Its wingspan was stretched out. It might have been 50 feet up in the air, but I could tell that the wings would stretch almost three lanes of a four lane highway and uh, it inspired me to paint this. This is Beyond the Edge Radio. Nervous? Scared? Don't be afraid. The wait will be over soon. Sit down, strap in, and hold on tight. Go live about to be five, taken. four, three. Hey, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Beyond the Edge Radio. We are live here on the Para-X Radio Network and Planet Paranormal, 803 here on the East Coast, and it is Sunday. Eric Altman spends all his free time chasing monsters. He would love to add the Thunderbird to his trophy case. People describe the Thunderbird as a large bird, usually black in color from the beak to the, uh, the talons. Um, sometimes it's covered in feathers, sometimes not, but usually when it's covered in feathers, as I said, it's black. Um, sometimes they describe a white ring around its neck, other times no. Um, when it's not f covered with feathers, they usually describe it having like a membrane, or like a reptilian membrane or like a, a leathery type of skin to it. Um, and the wingspan, it ranges in size from eight foot, and I've heard reports as much as 20 foot in length. A very large, large bird. We looked on the internet to find out what it could be, and uh, we kept running Stan Gordon's name, so 
I called him up and put a report in, and he came down and interviewed me over and asked me to draw a picture of it. In Pennsylvania, when the supernatural is spotted, Stan Gordon is called to the rescue. He has carefully documented all the evidence on the Thunderbird. My name is Stan Gordon. I'm from Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I've been researching, investigating strange and unusual happenings here in Pennsylvania since, actually, I started in 1959 when I was 10 years old. The main thing I do is gather information. Witnesses call me on sightings, either by way of email or my hotline, which has been available to the public since 1969. And I interview people, try to figure out what they saw. Uh, cases are warranted. We try to go out and do first-hand investigations. Many of the phenomena I investigate, whether it be strange creatures or UFOs, many of these things, as we track them down, we can go to the, we can find an explanation for them. Many of these things are misidentifications. We can figure out what the people see. But year after year, people continue to report these encounters with something that, as of yet, we don't have the answers for. Pennsylvania is fertile ground for Eric Altman and Stan Gordon. It is said that monster sightings are more common here than in any other state in the country. Historically, Pennsylvania has always been active with a history of strange phenomena, from accounts from the Native Americans to articles in newspapers of the 1800s to the present. People see things year after year throughout the state of Pennsylvania. I'm not sure why this area has such a history of strange phenomenon. I, I really don't know, but it, it just does. Reports back from the 50s onward. Um, some of the more recent ones have taken place in the 90s through the 2000s. Most of the recent was in 2013, but um, they go back as, as far back as the 50s. Um, and we're aware of across the, the nation, there have been reports dating back to the 1800s. Many of the reports initially appear to be strange and unusual, but when you go out and do the investigation, the majority are found to be either natural or man-made in origin. It's very hard, for example, when you see an aircraft in the sky or a bird to get a, an idea of the actual altitude and size. We've had instances of these huge birds, these Thunderbird reports, where they are also at very, very close range, and there was a way that they were able to measure and get a pretty good idea of the wingspan of those very large flying creatures. Over the years, I've gathered a lot of information, interviewed hundreds and hundreds of witnesses, gathered various type of physical evidence, saw different patterns to various phenomena. So I'm convinced that there's phenomena out there that we don't have an explanation for. But where could this giant bird come from? According to witnesses, the creature could be millions of years old. Some of the reports describe something as very large, but with leathery skin, they look like a giant bat. And then other witnesses that come forward who have seen some of these huge flying creatures at pretty close range, and reluctantly they tell me that they looked like something that was prehistoric. We may be dealing with maybe a, a pterodon or a pterosaur, uh, an, an extinct you know, possible flying creature. We don't know. And this is one of those mysteries with so many of these strange creature reports, whether we're dealing with Thunderbirds or Bigfoot, or we get Black Panther sightings in the area, other types of strange tree creatures. And it's not only in Pennsylvania, but the question always comes up, where do they come from and where do they go? Really uh, startling to see something that large. But I also heard that they're uh, harbingers of doom. Lou De Rose is a lawyer and amateur historian. For this citizen of South Greensburg, it's not surprising that monster stories have a strong resonance here. I'm originally from the area. I was born just north of Greensburg, and I've been here 45 years. Uh, I'm involved in the Westmoreland County Historical Society. I'm the past chair of that group. I've written a, a book about the history of Greensburg. I've written some other chapters about local history and things like that. Well, we, we're good, uh, adventurous stock. You know, the Scotch-Irish were adventurous and hardworking and eager to take on new challenges. And I think their descendants and all of us just sort of adopted that philosophy. You know, oh, this is interesting. You know, what happened here? What, a Bigfoot sighting? Let's go find that guy. 
uh, UFO sighting. Let's go out and sit out in the woods for, you know, 40 years and see if there's another one. I'm, I think it's terrific. The belief in this mythical bird is nothing new for the First Nations of Pennsylvania. My name is Christian Allen. Uh, my native name is Kalista Ndokwa. I'm of mixed heritage, but I'm a descendant of the Sewickley Sept of the Shawnee. Uh, for my people, the Thunderbird is the gatekeeper of heaven. Um, it is something that watches over us. When it's here, it's flesh and blood. It's a solid, an animal, uh, but it has the capability to disappear. I think what they saw would be what it would look like. Um, for us, it would resemble a falcon in shape, would be very, very large. Uh, it would be following the same paths, which you, both of the eyewitnesses, it was following the same path. So I, I think as far as their eyewitness report, it doesn't differ from what my people would believe that you would see. The sightings all seem to converge on the same place, the forest of Chestnut Ridge, a stone's throw from South Greensburg. One of the most interesting areas in the country is the Chestnut Ridge. The Chestnut Ridge is a 100-mile-long mountain range that runs from Preston County, West Virginia, to Westmore and Fifth, Indiana County in southwest Pennsylvania. It is one of the most active areas year after year for Thunderbird reports. And for whatever reason, that area over around Derry in Westmoreland County, along the base of the ridge, is very, very active. In this immediate area, uh, again, locally over the years, I've heard people talk about describing me this loud whoosh or swooshing sound. They gave an impression of something big and flying close by, but they didn't see what was causing the sound. What's interesting is it's all within a couple of miles, maybe not even that far. Yeah, I was standing right here on the porch, and the bird flew out from these woods over here, right over the hillside, and it lingered above the traffic, its wings out, and it flew up over into these trees here, and there used to be a big dead tree on that hillside, and that's where it landed. It, it happened. You know, you ain't gonna tell me I didn't see it. So I know what I saw, and I know what my buddy saw, and I know what my wife saw. And uh, that's just how it is. It's a big bird, and not from Sesame Street either. It has a great area for any kind of animal to live and, um, you know, breed and, and have no problem staying hidden from, from man because it's, it's such a wild area. Um, a lot of forest recovery, water area, a lot of uh, good food source. So uh, it's a great area for any kind of animal to really hide out and, and stay in and not really be bothered by. But that bird, I wouldn't want to corner that bird. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to be in his food chain. Return to the scene, observe the skies, and study the creature's habitat. These are the standard methods of Eric Altman. What we try to do as researchers, if, if an eyewitness has a sighting at a specific location, we try to go to that location and we try to search the area to see if there might be physical evidence, feathers or, or maybe droppings or something that can show us that there was an animal in that area. I followed in, up on these reports over the years um, and uh, I believe that the eyewitnesses are seeing something. I don't know what they're seeing. Uh, of course, I wasn't there to validate what they saw, but they're seeing something that they can't identify. And that's what I'm trying to find out. It's a challenge, but it's, it's what makes it interesting is, is you know, just having that, that thrill of the chase to get out there and, and try to find out. Eric Altman can count on followers to accompany him in his research. I met Eric at a, a conference, actually. Um, he was speaking about Bigfoot. Um, I sat to listen to it because I really wasn't aware at that time of all the different sightings right in my own backyard. Um, we quickly became good friends because he's open-minded and he likes adventures and 
I'm the same way. So, and now we co you know, I co host on BTE Radio with him. Um, so, and we're at a lot of events together. Just a great guy. You know, stories about the Thunderbirds um, for the, over the past decade, 2001 to I believe in May 2014, there's been sightings off and on. Everyone keeps describing the same type of creature, a bird with about a 20-foot wingspan, black and brown in color. It always seems to be the same kind of a story. Someone's out alone walking or riding a motorcycle. There's no other witnesses but the one account. I am a skeptic. I've never personally had somebody tell me an account of seeing the Thunderbirds, but I've, I've read a lot of different stories. And I came down here to Greensburg to see for myself what the area is all about. I want to have the proof before I make a decision on what's being seen and told about. I believe some they're seeing something, but without me being there and just getting bits and pieces, I can't say for sure what it is. Before entering Chestnut Ridge, Altman motivates his troops and organizes the hunt for the Thunderbird. Basically what we're going to do is, is try to come up with an area where there have been a lot of sightings at and uh, check that area out, see if we can find anything. And it seems like the best area to go to would be what makes sense, South Greensburg, because that's where Joe's had his sighting at. And what Christian was explaining is where a lot of the burial mounds seem to be, and, and there have been sightings in the last decade. So that might be our best bet. People think that this is all populated area. They think uh, that, you know, it's all are you gonna, urban area, suburban area, and, and there's no way big animals could hide out. Oh, you go down to Slickville, it's all mines. Yeah. Uh, Slickville, there's mines everywhere down there, open mm -hmm. mines everywhere down there. But uh, for today's um, outing, we're taking some very basic, simple equipment with us. A no. pair of binoculars, so we can keep an eye on the, the trees and the, the sky in case we do see something. Um, a GPS, so we can map our, uh, our coordinates. If we want to return to that area, we'll know where, if we did find anything. And of course, the 16-foot tape measure, so if we do find anything, we can document what we do find as far as evidence. And if we do need to return to the area, we can return with uh, a DNA kit and uh, collect whatever physical evidence we can collect. Well, of course, we want to document it on video camera and, and uh, hopefully get some pictures of it. And Probably get a picture of me running and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> we get the gear packed up and we'll be ready to roll. I am scared, but it still drives me out in the forest to look for things. Sneaking along the ridges, looking for sign, basically. Look for feeding area, bones, anything like that. There's a couple of different ways to go in down here. If you cut straight down this road and swing to the left, that'd take you right to the wetlands. You can cut up the trail to the ridge and go out that way and down too. For Christian Allen, there is no doubt that they are on the very edge of the Thunderbird's habitat. As far as what we look for today, we were basically hunting a flesh and blood creature. And this is a place where a lot of people don't even know it's here. And it has a lot of food and cover for such a creature to exist. But Eric Altman and his friends are not the only ones interested in the winged creature. My name is Brian Shema. I'm the conservation director for the Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania. The organization was founded in 1916. Uh, the mission of the Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania is to um, educate and connect people to the natural world. I oversee uh, much, of our, much of our operations, daily operations. I oversee all of our conservation work, and I am the resident bird expert. Pennsylvania is, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of diverse habitats in Pennsylvania. Uh, we actually have um, a, a lot of flowing water, actually uh, more miles of stream than any other state um, in the lower 48 states. Um, a lot of individual um, interesting habitats exist within Pennsylvania. Largest bird in Pennsylvania is bald eagle. Uh, their wing spread is right, right around between six and six and a half feet. Um, you know, they have the iconic white head and white tail um, when they're mature. When they're immature, the bird's all brown. 
So bald eagles are actually confused with a lot of other species, um, but uh, it is the largest bird that we have in Pennsylvania. We're actually also a mixing zone for uh, when speaking specifically of birds. We have a number of northerly breeding birds that exist in Pennsylvania, as well as a number of southerly breeding birds in Pennsylvania. So we're kind of a mixing zone for uh, two, different, you know, two different groups of birds that, that prefer different latitudes. We try to um, piece together the puzzle, so to speak. We want to see if there's more information out there than just that eyewitness story. And we want to try to find out what they saw, too. If something like that's still around, it'd be the find of a century. No person has been injured or killed by a Thunderbird in Pennsylvania. And despite its intimidating size, we shouldn't fear it. So says Christian Allen, at least. Like I said, it's, an omen, it's a good omen. It means they're being taken care of. It's not something to be frightened of. Um, they also come with storms. If there's a storm coming, like a really bad storm, you'll see them. They're warning you. Bat in the hatches, it's coming. Um, they come out of water, which is another good thing because they can always come out of clean water, and we all need that. So it could be something to lead you to water. As you can see, it's clean. Uh, this water's, all you need is a few drops of bleach and to boil it and you can drink it. Yeah, you can see there's some fish there. Yeah. Creek chubs. Actually, it would help to, if we were being noisy, to flush something out. Maybe startle something that it would take off. You never know. Just looking. You would think in one of the higher up trees, like the tree out there, it would find a larger, flatter tree and put a nest up in that area there, but it's anybody's guess. We don't even know if they nest in trees. But according to Brian Shima, the searches conducted by Eric Altman are likely to be unsuccessful. If that bird existed in a populated area, I think everyone would agree that someone like me would know about it overnight. Um, the, the sightings would come to our organization. We are the bird experts in Western Pennsylvania. We are the bird conservation organization for Western Pennsylvania. And uh, where we saw it, it was kind of in line, flying in line with the trail, but about 100 yards to the left, right down the road. And that was pretty neat. But I mean, the fact that you saw one right up the road and there was another one seen right up the road there, that's kind of too much of a coincidence in the same area for not to be something to it. People that, that, that see uh, what they think might be a, might be a Thunderbird um, could very well be the perspective that they're, that they're viewing from. Uh, it could be a very large bird. You know, it could be a, it could be a, a, a red-tailed hawk. It could be a bald eagle. It could be a golden eagle. Um, each of these being large birds. But when um, looking at, at it from a certain perspective, they might not have a way of judging how large that bird actually is. I mean, any any kind of raptor, its diet's protein. And yeah. That's here. Yeah. You see anything? No. Uh, that's all. That's all. Such heavy swamp in there. I mean, you can't get yeah. through there. I'm telling you, I feel a little e uneasy back here. I just I don't know. It's pretty. I love nature, but there's just I don't know. Spooky. Something. Yeah. Something here. I feel spooky. Let's see what we got here. It's a myth. Uh, you know, it's, it's scientifically speaking, there have been no records, um, any, no documentation whatsoever um, of a bird such as that. There's a, there is really a lot of evidence that shows that it would be basically impossible uh, for a bird like that to exist. 
if the Thunderbird were to exist, there would need to be a large enough population to, to sustain genetic diversity, which means many of us would be seeing Thunderbirds on a daily basis. Without that genetic diversity, that species would quickly, um, the, the, the diversity would deteriorate and the species would simply not exist. Christian Allen doesn't have any elaborate theories. For him, the Thunderbird is an ancestral belief. This is a recreation of, I hate to say this, but it's similar to like a rosary so that you can remember your prayers. And these are things that you're thankful for, like this means family. And these symbols here, they look like keyholes or thunderbirds, the thunderers that are the guardians of heaven. It's very important to our culture and it's something that we today keep alive, but we believe it exists. Whether it's flesh and blood or from the other realm, as these sticks would suggest, we believe it's possible that you can see it and you're gonna continue to see it. And like I said, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. know where he is? That's he, he went in there. Oh, man. Heavy back here. Doe, fawn. Oh, are you okay? Oh, yeah, see, that's why I quit following you. Right there. <laughs> oh, <are> you? <laughs> <laughs> I looked for hair, I looked for feathers, everything back. I didn't see anything like that. You know, so I figured if there's gonna be anything, it'd be around the, the green bar, the jag bushes. You know, I'd grab hair, I'd grab feather, or whatever. Anything like that. There's really no area that they could build a nest off the ground back there either. There's some buffalo grass growing back there in some of the openings. It was all laid flat, laid flat in a swirl like this. And I showed her one right up here. But as I got in further, I found three different spots like that in there. Where either it, it's you would think a herd of deer, four or five deer, maybe bedding together, but usually you'll see the individual pockets where the deer lay you know, in the grass, but I didn't see that. I just saw a whole area. So that's strange. The ultimate goal of cryptozoologists is to confound science, to discover the unexplainable. And every little clue that brings them closer to that goal is worth evaluating. This is an owl. Looks like an owl. I find feathers every time I walk, and sometimes, like, they'll be laying on my car seat, like, that shouldn't be, what, it, oh. Some tribes see the owl as an omen that somewhere in your family's getting to pass. My tribe's a little different. To us, it was a war bird. Okay. And by this, they actually kept owls as pets. Naturally, if you're going to go to war against someone who's definitely afraid of owls, you're going to have an owl with you. OK. <laughs> so a mile and a half long, I'd say. Yeah. Comes all the way out to four quarters. Larger. This little swamp here. Today, we got unlucky. Inconclusive. Um, we got to look at some great terrain, great area, a great water source and food source. And sure, it could probably hide a large bird of that size without anybody being around to see it. Um, are we going to find it from just a walk out in the woods? No. It probably is going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of manpower, and it's just the right place at the right time. And we might get lucky, but it's just the luck of the draw, getting out there and doing it. You can hunt turkeys because they're usually on the ground, but to hunt a large falcon-shaped bird, you have to follow that animal, know its habits. It would take forever, I think, just to come out and see one. I'm not going to bet that you are. So what did Joe and the dozens of other witnesses see? Did they just make the whole thing up? I think that there are rational explanations to what people are seeing. Um, and I think that, you know, through some education and through some awareness, um, we might be able to get to the bottom of what it is these people are seeing and how they're confusing uh, the, the size of these birds um, with something that we see on a daily basis, like large hawks or large eagles. I think that, pe that humans are curious. 
And I think that, you know, with technology, uh, certainly the internet, if, if someone were to Google uh, extremely large bird, there is a lot of information out there about various myths or, or real facts. I think that the human curiosity is oftentimes something that, that may lead people um, down the road of myths. For his part, Stan Gordon believes that the abundance of evidence confirms that this is not just a myth. The Thunderbird really does haunt the skies of Pennsylvania. I mean, I've been taking calls from the public on these sightings since 1969. So a lot of people know that there's a place they can report sightings to. I had founded and directed three volunteer research groups that started in 1970 and continued to 1993 that were very, very active throughout the state of Pennsylvania. We had a lot of scientists and engineers and research people, uh, former military intelligence people, law enforcement officers who were part of our volunteer group. So we had trained people who were going out there to look into these mysteries. And it was our goal to try to investigate these cases, to try to find an explanation, which in many cases we did. But year after year, these incidents continue to occur and not every case can be so easily dismissed. Although sightings of the Thunderbird are concentrated in the South Greensburg area, there are still many skeptics here. I mean, I've seen some large birds in, in the area, but nothing super large to where it's a supernatural bird. Yeah, it's almost as bad as the Mothman. That's ridiculous to me, the Mothman, really. And the absence of any hard evidence doesn't help Eric Altman's cause. No photographs, no video, there's no evidence. And, and that's what, I can see the skeptic's argument, you know, where's the proof? Where's the, where's the, where's the photographs? Where's the video? Where's, where's the, the, we don't have any. And, and I, have to, I have to agree with the skeptics. And why aren't people whipping out their cell phone cameras? Everybody has one. You know, everybody has you know, the access to a camera on the cell phone or video. Why aren't people taking pictures? But, I mean, we all had cameras. My camera was sitting right here, our phone cameras. They, both, they all had their phone in their hands right there, and, and there it was, and we didn't take a picture. Stupidity. We were kind of like just watching it, yeah? Didn't think of it. People seeing something, yeah, I believe maybe they're seeing a bird of some sort. It definitely is not a thunderbird. There's no such thing. It just, just doesn't sound right, just doesn't make sense. I'd have to see it. You'd have to catch one or kill one or something for me to believe it. You have to have physical evidence to prove the animal exists. Eyewitness testimony just doesn't cut it. So Doug's right, you have to have physical evidence. I've told Eric over the year, we've argued, I said if I'm out in the woods and I'm hunting, I see Bigfoot or I see something that resembles it, I'm gonna shoot it. It's either I wanna be a hero or people are gonna hate me, so. And they'll probably hate him. And with the Thunderbird, um, he's right. Uh, people are seeing something, what it is, who knows. But what they're describing doesn't fit any of the known animals or any known birds that are around this area. It's much too large. I do believe in UFOs, yes, I believe that there's creatures from other planets, because I think it would be absurd to believe that we're the only life in the universe. And you know, with the way it is today, they're discovering planet after planet, so there has to be life somewhere else. Like Area 51, do I think? Or okay, well, let me ask you this question then. If you believe in Area 51 has UFOs and aliens there, but you've never seen them, why don't you believe in Bigfoot or Thunderbird? You've never seen those. Well, because I, for one, Bigfoot, you're always out there. People have cameras. The thing cannot be that elusive. You don't typically see a Bigfoot walking down the street or a Thunderbird flying through the air. It's not something that happens every day. So it, it's not accepted by science. It's not accepted by the general public. So you must be crazy. So people don't want to talk about stuff like that. So they're very reluctant to report or share their, their experiences. So many of these people were people who didn't believe that such creatures could exist until they had their own experience. And so many of these people have a difficult time dealing with it. Sometimes they don't want to talk about it. They're afraid to share the experience, afraid of being ridiculed. But some of them, it's a life-changing experience. And I run into this quite often. Only 
a few people today believe in the existence of the Thunderbird. But all the same, this mythical bird has found its way into American popular culture. From fighter jets to car brands, the Thunderbird has left its mark. It is a Thunderbird. <laughs> I got it because it's a protector and it's gonna keep my soul safe. That was why I liked this tattoo. Ananemki, which means thunderer. And of course, it's, as the folklore goes, the thunder and lightning that you hear, the rolling, the Papa Panawata, the rolling thunder you hear through the hills is caused by this bird flapping its wings. They believe that some of the valleys in the primordial days were shaped by this bird flying too close to the land and its wings swooped up the valleys. But today, it's seen as a positive thing. It's a very important representation of the spiritual world to us and that we don't need to be predominated with the negative or the fear of it, that it's, it's something that should enliven in you, edify you, let you know that life is good and good is in control and that you can relax and live your life. And that is, that is what the Thunderbird means to us. Well, I'm sure they've seen a bird, and it is a big bird when it flies. It does have a big wingspan, but I don't know what to believe. I've asked people around, and that's what they all tell me it is. There seems to be a really good way of telling the huge wingspan of these creatures, something that you can eliminate some of the big birds around here, some of the hawks and blue herons and other birds. And, and a lot of the witnesses I've talked to, by the way, are people who have hunted, people who are familiar with the native birds of Pennsylvania, and they realize that what they saw was something completely different than what they had observed. They saw the shape, the figure of what we saw and what's in our tradition, so it's the same. For most of the residents in South Greensburg, the Thunderbird is an amusing legend. If the Thunderbird is flying around here, he better watch out because we have a big Boeing uh, 700 plane coming into Latrobe four or five times a day and it might get in the way. I believe in a lot of things I haven't seen though, you know, uh, on various levels. Uh, so who am I to say? I do believe in Bigfoot and all those other things out there. I believe in UFOs and things like that. I believe those things are happening. But as far as the bird, I've never seen it other than the blue heron, so I can't really. And I've never seen either one of the others, but for some reason, I believe in them. People should keep an open mind. I mean, we are not going to move forward in time if we don't keep experiencing new things. I think you have to keep looking, you have to keep listening, and you have to keep paying attention until we find out, and we have over time, science has proven a lot of things that people thought were bogus, you know? Science proved them wrong. So science eventually will catch up with everything. Hoping I live long enough to see some of it. There's a whole lot that science can't account for or explain. And there's so much around us that we don't see, that we use every day, radio waves, television waves, and we don't see them, but we know that they're here. So what makes other entities, maybe if they're from another dimension, why would that be difficult to understand? I think everybody wants their story to be heard. Um, and I would be in awe. Who am I to say that they didn't see what they saw? I, I wasn't there, so I would let them tell their story to me. I'm a safe place to tell a story to. These things apparently go on all the time but a lot of people don't know where to call or are reluctant to report things, and some people wait for weeks or months or years later, or they never report in. So there may be a lot more of this going on on there than we have any idea of. For his part, Eric Altman isn't discouraged by the lack of tangible evidence. You would think if there was such a thing out there that people, a lot more people would see it, We'd have physical evidence of it. We'd have video. Science would know about it. We would we know for sure they're out there, like the Bigfoot. They're eight foot, 10 foot, 12 foot tall. They're supposed to be a giant primate that runs around in the forest. People, thousands of people claim they see it. Why don't we have proof of it? The Loch Ness Monster is supposed to be this huge aquatic creature lives in Loch Ness. And hundreds of people claim they've seen it, but we have no physical proof of it except for maybe some grainy video footage, but people still claim they see it. You know, how are these large cryptids surviving and still being seen without any proof? We, we don't know. 
and that's what makes our job even harder and challenging. We just keep going out there and we keep trying to you know, find those pieces of the puzzle that are missing. And maybe one day we'll have the proof. It's just, it baffles the mind to think how such large creatures like the Thunderbird can fly around in our skies and only be witnessed from time to time and not leave any physical trace evidence. There has to be some kind of population of them. And they are somewhere, and they will be found. Because they wouldn't be cruising through here unless they were within the area. It could be here. I believe it definitely could be here. Joe Meyer continues to look to the sky in the hopes of catching a glimpse of this giant mythical bird. Since I've been hunting, since I saw that bird, I spend a lot of time looking up here and there too, especially when we're hunting up the mountains. Actually, anywhere, I look up quite a bit. Just, it's in my head now, you know, and I got a gun. <laughs> I'm sure I would probably freeze in fright. <laughs> I would hope that I have my camera. I have my camera for everything else to take pictures of, but I don't know, I'd be thankful too. I'd be thankful that I finally get the proof that I'm looking for. Yeah, I would like to see one. It, I think it would be a good experience, yeah. I'd love to see it again, like I said, but what are the chances, you know?